maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here's tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. Call this meeting of the James City Service Authority Board of Directors to order. Good evening. Mr. Powell, how are you? Good evening. Mr. Powell, if you could please call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Hippel? Here. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. I need a motion, please, to allow Ms. Sadler to come in remotely. So sure. Move. Thank you. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Yes, ma'am. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, no presentations this evening? No, ma'am. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? No, ma'am. Thank you. That brings us to tonight's consent calendar. It includes three uh -huh. items, um, minutes adoption, memorandum, memorandum of agreement, excuse me, Regional Groundwater Mitigation Program Administration, and resolutions of appreciation for Stuart Bircham and Dion Walsh. And Mr. Pa Powell will formally present those resolutions of appreciation to the two retirees in just one moment. Is there a motion? Motion for approval. Thanks. You all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Powell, if you'd like to do the presentations. Thank you. We wanted to recognize two long-term JCSA employees, uh, one who has just recently retired and one who's about to retire. Um, one of them, Mr. Stuart Bircham, um, unfortunately at the last minute cannot be here tonight, um, but Ms. Dion Walsh is here, so I'll read her resolution first and then um, Mr. Bircham's afterwards. Um, so this is a resolution of appreciation for Dion Walsh. Whereas Dion Walsh has been employed by the James City Service Authority for 23 years, beginning August 10th, 1998. And whereas Ms. Walsh is retiring from the JCSA effective March 1st, 2022. Whereas Ms. Walsh began her career building JCSA's geographic information system by loading all of JCSA's infrastructure and as-built plans into the system. And whereas Ms. Walsh's efforts building the GIS system revolutionized the way JCSA operated. And whereas Ms. Walsh has also been responsible for plan review and has reviewed thousands of plans during her tenure, and whereas Ms. Walsh developed the Conservation Water Agreement, and whereas Ms. Walsh was JCSA Employee of the Year in 2004, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the James City Service Authority, James City, Virginia, does hereby recognize Ms. Dion Walsh and present this resolution as a token of appreciation for her dedicated service to the James City Service Authority. Be it further resolved that the Board of Directors offers its best wishes to Ms. Walsh in her retirement. So, Dion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dion. Okay. I hope you enjoy your retirement. I would, um, I would add that legend has it that uh, uh, Ms. Walsh, in all the years that she did plan review, never missed a deadline. And uh, I think that speaks to uh, her commitment to her job and to the service authority. And uh, her, her, uh, her values were, you know, do it right and do it on time. And um, she's been a, a wonderful uh, team member to work with over the years. 
uh, her uh, institutional knowledge will be missed. And you know, there's a there's a word in that resolution that she revolutionized the way we did business. And I really I think that um, to me that captured um, her contributions to the service authority as much as anything. The work she did in building the GIS system really did change the way the service authority operated, uh, much for the better. Uh, so Dion, uh, thank you very much for all of your efforts. We will miss you very much. Uh, best wishes for a, a happy retirement. Well, thank you very much. So, thank you. Yeah, do you want to say anything? Yeah. When I first uh, came to JCSA, <laughs> when I first came to JCSA, the, the guys out in the field would have to run into our building, look up the the sheet, big sheets of plans, try to find what they needed, try to Xerox it on an eight and a half by 11, <laughs> and then run out to go fix the broken water line or sewer main. And when I got there, there was no JCSA GIS, and it was my job to figure out how to do the program. And by the time I was uh, there in uh, 2004, I got the award, I had linked 4,000 plans so the guys could just link on GIS up pops a PDF of the problem and they could take their laptops out in the field. They never had to go run searching for a big plan again. So yeah, it was quite a change. And I have thoroughly enjoyed my time at JCSA. It's, it's the best place to work, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I'm, I, I would probably still want to work, but I'm turning 68 and I think it's time to take a break. <laughs> And she failed to mention that she's got a very nice place where she's going to spend some time. Yeah. That she's been working at for a long time down on the lake. So, but thank you again thank you. for your service. But we want to try to grab a picture if we can. Oh, great. So, yeah. you guys Without this, I hope. <laughs> Hey, do you want to? <laughs> Uh-oh. Did you want to read Mr. Burcham's? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so this is a resolution of appreciation for Stuart Burcham. Whereas Stuart Burcham has been employed by the James City Service Authority for 42 years, beginning April 15, 1980, and whereas Mr. Burcham retired from the JCSA effective January 31, 2022, Whereas Mr. Burcham began his career in the underground utility department and was later promoted to crew leader, and whereas Mr. Burcham moved into the construction inspection position over 20 years ago, and whereas Mr. Burcham was the inspector for numerous large development projects, including Stonehouse, Whitehall, Wellington, and Colonial Heritage, and whereas Mr. Burcham was the primary inspector for private well installations, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the James City Service Authority, James City County, Virginia, does hereby recognize Mr. Stuart Burcham and present this resolution as a token of appreciation for his dedicated service to the James City Service Authority. Be it further resolved that the Board of Directors offers its best wishes to Mr. Burcham in his retirement. And I will ensure that Mr. Burcham receives that. I would just add to the resolution that, you know, it goes without saying 42 years in one place is pretty rare. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Burcham's uh, teamwork um, is, uh, was really his hallmark. And uh, he is already very much missed by his colleagues. Um, and, and again, the amount of institutional knowledge that he took with him is significant. We're hoping that the transition will be smooth as his younger brother has been hired to replace him. So hopefully, uh, hopefully if he has any questions, uh, his younger brother has any questions, Mr. Burcham will help him out. But, uh, um, I, and, and thank you to the board for uh, taking the time to, uh, to recognize these longtime employees. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell. We have no public hearings this evening. No, ma'am. We have two board considerations. Uh, first is setting a public hearing, fiscal year 2023 utility rates. Mr. Powell. Uh, this resolution establishes the date of the public hearing for the budget and the setting of the FY23 utility rates for April 12th. Staff's recommended budget will follow the plan established by the 2020 rate study to increase water service rate and fixed charge by 3.5%. Uh, with no increase in the sewer service rate or fixed charge. If these rates are approved, the total monthly water and sewer bill for the typical 5,000 gallons per month residential user would increase by 94 cents per month.
from $44.77 to $45.71. The combined bill would remain the third lowest among the 18 Hampton Roads localities and the water bill would remain the lowest. The only other proposed change in rates would be to increase the grinder pump maintenance fee from $375 per year to $400 a year to better align with the expenses for that program. Uh, staff recommends approval of the resolution. Thank you. Is there any questions? Is there a motion? So leave it. Thank you. Mr. Powell, if you could call the roll. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Next, we have contract award and budget amendment, VACCON combination, jet vacuum rotting machine replacement, 434,776. Mr. Powell? Thank you. JCSA's existing 2009 VACCON truck, which is our primary tool for cleaning uh, sewer mains and removing blockages in our system, is nearing the, end, uh, nearing the end of its useful life. It is scheduled for replacement in fiscal year 23. However, staff recommends purchasing it now. Accelerating the purchase now to now will save JCSA $23,159 before an expected price increase goes into effect and will also minimize, minimize lead time for delivery. Uh, this resolution awards the contract in the amount of $434,776 to Atlantic Machinery and amends the FY22 sewer fund budget to appropriate funds from unrestricted net position and a transfer from the Mirror Lake Dam mitigation budget. Staff recommends approval of the resolution. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Ms. Sadler? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? Motion for approval. Thank you. Mr. Powell? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Are there any board requests and directives? Okay. Uh, general manager's update, Mr. Powell? I don't have anything in addition to the dashboard that I uh, emailed out today. Thank you. With that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn until 5 p.m. on March 8th, 2022 for the regular meeting. Motion for adjournment. Thank you. All in favor, signify aye. by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We call this meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you call the roll, please. Uh, Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Eisenhower represents the Jamestown District. Mr. Hippel? Here. Mr. Hippel represents the Powhatan District. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Larson represents the Berkeley District. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. McGlennon represents the Roberts District and is chair of the board. To my far left is Adam Kinsman, County Attorney, and I'm Scott Stevens, County Administrator, and it's my pleasure to be clerk to the board. Ms. Sadler is not able to be with us tonight due to an ongoing medical issue that uh, prevents her from attending in person, uh, and uh, so we need a motion to allow her to participate electronically. So moved. We have a motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Motion carries. Ms. Sadler, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now move on to a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, this evening, the pledge will be led by Gabby Cook, and uh, she is a resident of the Berkeley District, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Thank uh, Larson. Thank you. Thanks so much. Welcome, Gabby. Gabby is a fifth grader at Clara Bird Baker Elementary. She is very much into writing and enjoys that. She is accompanied this evening by her mom, Megan Logan, and her sister, Leah Cook, who is a seventh grader at Berkeley Middle School. And I also would like to welcome her principal and thank him for coming. Um, and he is here with his wife, Mike and Pam Hurley. Gabby, thank you. And after a moment of silence, if you'd lead us in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Gabby. We have a certi certificate for you and a pen. We'll want to come get a picture?
Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, we're moving on to public comment now. Let me just suggest that uh, uh, we we are not we do not require the public to wear masks uh, tonight, but we do have a fairly large crowd. So if you uh, brought a mask with you, you might want to consider wearing it. Uh, during any comments that you make uh, at the dais, uh, uh, feel free to uh, either keep your mask on or take it off uh, as you prefer. Uh, if you would like, there is a, there are wipes at the uh, podium as well. Uh, so we'll begin with uh, the uh, public comment, and I have one speaker card from Joseph Swanenberg. Mr. Swanenberg. Good evening, board members. Joseph Swanenberg, 3026 The Point Drive. Um, I wanted to bring up a, 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 an issue that I've noticed on some public safety as far as our roadways. In the last five to eight years, it's happening on a lot more of our roads that whenever we have a rain event, and it doesn't have to be a big rain event, that we're having a lot of puddling on the sides of the roads. And it's coming from grass that's overgrowing onto the roads, whether it's Forge Road, Little Creek Dam Road, uh, Monticello, Richmond Road, and I didn't know if we can get VDOT to help us out with that and with that, whatever they can do and whatever they can't do if perhaps we can help with the problem. Uh, it was very nasty last night when I was driving home in, in multiple places on Richmond Road and on Forge Road with the, the dark night and, and the rain and it wasn't that heavy of a rain but just major puddling and, and watching people having to hydroplane or, or pull out and around the, the, the puddle. So just something I hope that we can uh, keep up with on our public safety there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Swanenberg, for your comments. Uh, we have no items on the consent calendar this evening, so we'll move on to public hearings. And the first public hearing is uh, Z210015, uh, 6940 and 6950 Richmond Road proffer amendment. Uh, Mr. Leininger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. <clears throat> Mr. Doug Harbin has applied to amend the existing <coughs> proffers for two parcels located at 6940 and 6950 Richmond Road. The proffer amendment is to revise the timing of the required signal warrant an analysis. The properties are zoned B1, general business with proffers, located within the primary service area and are designated mixed use on the 2045 comprehensive plan. The current proffers were adopted on August 31st, 2006 and are required the traffic signal to be bonded prior to the first building permit of the, of the two properties. Currently, the signal warrant study would be required within six months of full build out of both properties or at a sooner time requested by VDOT. Harbin Properties LLC has maintained a letter of credit in accordance with the 2006 proffer since the Colonial Car Wash was developed at 6950 Richmond Road in 2009. The second property remains vacant. The proposed proffer would eliminate the need to renew the surety every year and it would require a traffic signal warrant analysis to be conducted prior to the final, any final site plan, uh, site plan approval for 6940 Richmond Road. If the signal is warranted at that time, a traffic signal would be required to be installed prior to any certificate of occupancy for the site. As January 5th, 2022 regular meeting, the Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of six to zero to the Board of Supervisors. Staff finds the proper amendment to be a compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the 2045 comprehensive plan and zone ordinance. Staff recommends the Board of Supervisors to approve the application and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leininger. And representing the Planning Commission this evening is Mr. Frank Polster. Mr. Polster, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Chairman, board members, uh, as the staff reported, the application is to eliminate the need to renew the uh, surety each year, uh, but a traffic signal warrant uh, would be required before the final site plan approval. On this point, a commissioner asked if there were any proposed uses, and there are not. Uh, we had no speaker cards from the public during and no discussions amongst the commissioners. Planning Commission recommended to the board that they approve the 6940-6950 Road, Richmond Road proffer amendment with a vote of six to zero. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Polster. Does anybody have any questions for staff or for Mr. Polster? I've got a question. Sure. Um, so the, and I understand not having to renew it every year and having that hanging over your head, and, and especially when nothing's potentially gonna be built there right away. 
but will that be part of tied to the land itself that the the traffic light study would be done on this would that go if like if go-kart plus bought that piece and wanted to enlarge theirs would it still be a traffic study needed and i know it'd be you know how much use would be in and out of there but how would we later make sure that that gets taken care of and it doesn't get lost in the as shuffle. I understand it, the SUP is on the parcel, but I defer to staff <laughs> for that. Correct. So if whoever buys it, whether it's Go Karts Plus or another user, this proper amendment would run with the land. So okay. once they submit a site plan, we would then, that would trigger this proper for a traffic signal analysis. Okay. If that's and, your question. and is that a combination of both pieces since it was split? Yeah, or is it just connected to the one new piece? I see what you're asking. Yeah, so it would take into account the so that all that red highlighted area. So the, the current colonial I think it's a new owner now, but the car wash and whatever is developed on that vacant parcel. So if if we have two different owners there and the car wash owner says, Well, because y'all are building this, y'all have to do a traffic light study. I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to do it. How do we deal with that? When it, we are, we were here, we've been here, mm -hmm. we've been operating, and now this group over here has come in, and they're saying we have to do pay for half of the traffic study. So in terms of paying for the traffic study, that would be a private discussion between the two property owners. Um, staff would look at the amount of traffic proposed of the new development and the amount of traffic of the current existing car wash as part of that analysis. So staff wouldn't get into the, the payment of who would pay for the traffic signal itself, if it's warranted. Uh, we don't know what that other vacant parcel is to uh, have an idea of if it's even warranted at this point. Right, so. and it may not be, but I'm just, I was just wondering, I could see a potential <laughs> issue between the two neighbors if they're not the same owner. And there is a main entrance to the site that tees off once to the car wash them the master plan shows that coming over to the vacant parcel as well. So we'd right. be using a shared entrance. And then it goes on through into go-karts plus possibly for future. Pretend, yeah, depending yep. on the use of. So y'all don't see an issue of a problem with, and I, I have no problem with this, I'm, and I, I would agree it'd be easier than keeping that um, money out there and the bond and all that, which is a strain on the, the owner. Um, so I'm not against it. I just see there might be a potential problem between the two owners. I've been here. I'm not paying for it. If you want to put it up, you can put it up. I'm not paying for it. Not and I would, if I was on the car wash side, unless it was something signed and written between the two properties, I wouldn't pay for it. I can defer to Mr. Harbin if he's, you haven't been able to look around to see if he was here, but if he may have more insight on how the actual contract between those two parcels could be developed. Right. So. And if, and, if, and if you're fine with the way it's set up, then then I, I have no problem with it. I just want to make sure there was no conflict that came before us or staff in future years. Correct. Yep. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Thank you, Thomas. You're welcome. All right. If not, thank you very much for the presentations, and we'll open the public hearing uh, and ask if the applicant wishes to address this question. The case. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Vernon Getty of 1177 Jamestown Road. It's my pleasure to be here representing the Harbins tonight. And I'll simply say I think this is a good solution to ensure that the warrant analysis is done and the lights installed if warranted, but it does relieve the Harbins of the burden of keeping this letter of credit outstanding indefinitely. So um, be glad to answer any questions and um, would urge you to approve. Thank you, Mr. Getty. Uh, anybody have any questions for the applicant? I'll, I'll go back to the, my original question. Do you, do you see there be any conflict that may affect the county? I know it's a personal I, I more. don't think there is that could affect the county. Okay. Um, you know, developing the undeveloped piece, they will have to be sure the study's done and lights improved, and then it will be a private matter on who pays. Who pays. And okay. 
and we don't get in private matters. The county shouldn't be impacted at all. Okay. Just affect us. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Gabbard. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, uh, I have no speaker cards, um, so I will close the public hearing and ask for the board's will. Motion for approval. Motion for approval of the resolution from Mr. Hipple. Uh, Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. McGlennan? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, great. Now move on to the second public hearing, uh, and that is SUP 210017, 4007 Ironbound Road, convenience store with fuel. Mr. Leininger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mr. Mark Rinaldi of Bush Construction Corporation has applied for a special use permit for a convenience store with fuel sales at a property located at 4007 Ironbound Road. The property is zoned B1, general business with proffers, designated mixed use on the 2045 comprehensive plan land use map, and is located inside the primary service area. A convenience store which sells and dispenses fuel is a specially permitted right specially permitted use in the B1 zoning district. Additionally, any convenience store and uses that generate over 100 peak hour trips are required a com commercial special use permit. In 2018, the property, along with adjacent VDOT cul-de-sac and a portion of 4002 Ironbound Road, were rezoned to B1 with proffers. The rezoning also included design guidelines adopted by the Board of Supervisors. Traffic impact analysis was completed for this proposal, which recommends the installation of a second exclusive left turn lane on northbound Ironbound Road at the intersection of Montreal Avenue and Ironbound. Additionally, a right turn taper and a right turn lane are recommended on southbound Ironbound Road at the intersection of Ironbound Road and Old Ironbound Road. The TIA also recommends pavement markings and modifications to the traffic signal at Monticello Avenue intersection. All recommended improvements shall be installed before the first certificate of occupancy for the convenience store per the proposed SCP conditions. On October 28, 2021, the Newtown Design Review Board reviewed the master plan and bu uh, building elevations and approved the site design based on its conceptual form. Prior to the site plan approval, the Newtown DRB would review the design elements again for consistency with the adopted design guidelines. As January 5th, 2022, regular meeting, the Planning Commission voted six to zero to recommend approval of the SUP subject to the proposed conditions. Staff finds the proposal to be compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the 2045 comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Staff recommends the Board of Supervisors approve of, the applic of this application subject to the proposed conditions. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicants are here as well. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Leininger. And we'll ask Mr. Polster to come forward to uh, report on the Planning Commission action. The central issue uh, discussed by the commissioners was the impact of increased traffic on Monticello and the SUP request to approve more than 99 peak hour trips generated by the Wawa. In the first part, the traffic analysis examined the volume of, uh, on Monticello uh, from News Road through the 199 interchange uh, to the KC Boulevard intersection. Uh, there was a thorough explanation of existing traffic volume on the Monticello and trips generated on Monticello with the addition of a Wawa. The analysis indicated that almost all of the traffic that would use the Wawa was already on Monticello. On the last issue, uh, of projected trips uh, above the by right 99 uh, trips. The peak AM was projected at 128 and the PM peak at 118. The additional turn lanes on old ironbound and a separate right hand turn lane into the Wawa also mitigated the peak AM PM trips from and to the Wawa. One of the commissioners thought this was something needed in the area and appreciated the applicant coordinating with its neighbors. The storage facility owner who spoke in favor of the project at the public hearing, the JCS, which provided us a letter, and the Mount Pleasant uh, Baptist Church who sent a letter to the planning commissioners supporting the project. And they also would get a planned new overflow parking lot for the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. 
The Planning Commission recommended to the board that they approve SUP 21-0017-4007 Ironbound Road Convenience Store with fuel with a vote of six to zero. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Polster. Does anybody on the board have questions for the staff or for Mr. Polster? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so I will open the public hearing and we'll begin by asking the applicant. Mr. Getty, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to, Absolutely. to the public Mr. record. Chairman, members of the board, Vernon Getty, 1177 Jamestown Road. It's uh, my pleasure to be here representing the applicant. Mark Rinaldi is here. Uh, also here are Jason Grimes with AES and Dexter Williams, the traffic consultant, if there are questions for, for them. We'll call this property. It's originally zoned for a five-story office building way back when. Um, when that project proved not to be feasible and the parcel has sat vacant. Um, through the efforts of the applicant, G-Square, the actual landowner, the relationships here, the land is owned by G-Square, Bush Construction, um, has a long-term land lease of the property, which would in turn lease it to Wawa. Um, but it has acquired that cul-de-sac you see labeled prior VDOT land and, and made this a really a developable site. Property was rezoned in 2019 to permit various commercial uses, restricted other uses, and to provide overflow parking for Mount Pleasant Church. Um, it, there were proffers of binding master plan and binding design guidelines done in 2019 as well. This is the master plan from 2019. Applicant has now applied for a special use permit for the Wawa, the convenience store with sale of food. It's about a 6,050 square foot building, 360 degree architecture, a number of enhanced architectural features given its location, and six fueling islands. And as you know, there currently isn't a convenience store or fuel sales east of Route 199 in the Newtown area. This is the master plan itself, and perhaps an easier iteration to see. Um, you'll see the water tanks, obviously. Um, the buffers along Route 190, uh, Monticello, excuse me, new sidewalks into the site, both on Old Ironbound and directly from the intersection right along here. The building sits here, canopy and fuel pumps. These are the underground fuel tanks and the dumpster enclosures here. Um, staff made clear right out of the gates that traffic was the um, most significant consideration with the application and um, staff, VDOT, the county's traffic consultant, Kimley Horn and Dexter Williams um, started back in March of 2021 um, to work on the traffic on this, to define the scope of the study and do the necessary um, analysis and work. Um, it is as comprehensive a traffic study as I have seen in my career, 286 pages, any number of revisions and requests for additional information and the like. Um, and one thing I do want to point out for the first time, I think, in, in this area certainly, um, the trip generation rate used for this use is a, is a new one. It's very conservative, projects worst case, I think, higher trip generation rates than any have been used previously. So I just wanted to point that out. And you'll see the levels of service at the surrounding intersections all remain um, acceptable. Um, as you know, level of service is a, at intersections is a measure of delay. And you'll see these two columns there show the actual delay at those intersections versus both the no build and then development in the buy right scenario and you'll see it's a matter of a couple seconds. Uh, in terms of improvements as uh, Tom mentioned on the west side of Ironbound there'll be a new right turn lane and taper circled in green here for people coming off Monticello into the site. There'll be a new lane of pavement built on the east side that will become a through right turn lane and the two existing lanes will become dedicated left turn lanes. 
and with that, of course, the necessary striping and signal adjustments would take place. Um, staff, VDOT, and Kimley Horn all agree with those improvements that level of service is maintained at an acceptable level across the road network. Um, and the delays, as we saw, are just a couple seconds, virtually imperceptible. Two things I do want to mention, too, that and it was alluded to earlier. This type of use, most of the traffic coming in is captured, if you will. It's vehicles that are already on the road for other reasons that come to this site as well while they're out. Um, and that's different from most uses along this site, which are destinations in and of themselves. Um, and this site also allows residents, customers, um, people in Newtown to access it by simply crossing Monticello Casey Boulevard um, rather than having to traverse Monticello, particularly going on the west side of Route 199 where the road's more congested to get to the gas station over there, the only gas in this area. These are the renderings of the building, said so it's four-sided architecture. This side would face Monticello, these two on either side, and this faces Old Ironbound Road. See the canopy with the brick pillars and attractive design and the dumpster enclosure actually made to match the uh, architecture of the building. SUP conditions here mitigate any potential impact from this proposal. Uh, the master plan and design guidelines call for architectural review. Staff and the Newtown DRB have approved the conceptual plan and elevations you saw. And as was mentioned, the final plans are subject to further review to be sure they're consistent with what you've seen. There are limits on lighting, signage, speaker noise, requirements for enhanced landscaping and screening, the road improvements I describe, requirement of a water conservation plan. And with respect to stormwater management, the conditions require measures significantly in excess of what could be required with a by right development. Um, that was another sensitive issue. They've worked with Mr. Freeman at the uh, mini storage, and this will actually retain the 100 year storm on site. And, um, it's just a much better stormwater situation than you would otherwise get. Um, you have, I think you've seen letters, Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, the representatives of the church are here. Um, owner of the mini storage, Mr. Freeman, and Newtown Associates all support the application and have written letters. Uh, and JCSA noted it's long-term cooperation with the applicant and they won't be adversely impacted at all. So we would agree with the staff report and the unanimous planning commission recommendation of approval. The proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan surrounding development, the proffered master plan and design guidelines. Uh, traffic has been studied ex exhaustively and improvements required mitigate any traffic impacts. And it's, this does provide a needed use in this location on the east side of Route 199 um, to serve the residents and customers in Newtown. Uh, it will generate significant tax dollars for the county. Uh, and finally, and as important as any of them, it'll provide the overflow of parking for the church that uh, it desperately needs. So for, for all those reasons, we would ask you to approve it. I'm glad to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Getty. Um, we'll go ahead with the public hearing. If there are questions, we'll come back Great. to you. Thank you. No speaker cards? We have no speaker cards, so I'll close the public hearing and ask if the board has any questions, concerns, issues you'd like to discuss before a motion, or does somebody want to make a motion? Motion for approval. Motion to approve the resolution. Uh, Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Eisenhower. <laughs> Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Now move to our third public hearing, which is uh, SUP 21-0024-158 Saddletown Road, uh, Partlow Family Subdivision. Uh, Mr. Leininger, back again. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Working and you members hard. Of <laughs> 
Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mr. Corey Partlow has applied for a special use permit for a family subdivision to create a 2.33 acre parcel on a property located at 158 Saddletown Road and zoned A1 General Agriculture and designated rural lands on the 2045 comprehensive plan. The property is located outside the primary service area. An SCP is required because the new parcel is between one and three acres in the A1 zoning district. Staff has reviewed the preliminary plat and found that the proposal can meet the family subdivision ordinance and the subdivision ordinance uh, requirements. The, the property is located outside the, the primary service area and will require private well and septic systems. The Virginia Department of Health has confirmed that the soils can adequately accommodate these systems. Staff finds the proposed family subdivision is compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the 2045 comprehensive plan. Staff recommends the Board of Supervisors to approve this application subject to the conditions. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is here as well. Thank you, Ms. Planiger. And there, uh, this did not go through the Planning Commission, so we have no report from Mr. Polster on this. Anybody have any questions about the application? None? Great. Then I will open the public hearing. No cards. Sure. So I'll close the public hearing and ask for the Board's uh, preferences. I'll move the motion. Motion to approve has been made by Ms. Sa uh, Ms. Larson. Uh, Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Motion carries. Great. Usually by this time in the meeting, the room is half empty. Um, for some reason, it seems not to be the case this evening. <laughs> Uh, we now move to our fourth uh, and final public hearing of the evening, which is uh, Z19006 and SUP19005, 0005, uh, Hazelwood uh, Farm uh, Enterprise Center. Uh, Mr. Wysong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to the board. Mr. Tim Trant of Kaufman & Knowles has applied on behalf of the Hazelwood Farm property owners to rezone approximately 328 acres from its current zoning of B1 General Business and A1 General Agricultural to the EO Economic Opportunity Zoning District to allow for up to 3,220,000 square feet of warehouse, industrial, and office use and up to 75,000 square feet of commercial. Accompanying, uh, going along with this rezoning is a sp request for a special use permit to allow for the following uses. A fast food restaurant, the manufacture and processing of textile and textile products in structures more than 10,000 feet. Heavy equipment sales and service with major repair undercover or screened with landscaping and fencing from adjacent property. Machinery sales and service with major repair undercover. A convenience store pursuant to section 2411A1. Any commercial building or group of buildings that exceeds 10,000 square feet of floor area pursuant to section 2411A2 of the county code. Any commercial building or group of buildings, not including office uses, which generates or would be expected to generate a total of 100 or more additional trips to and from the site during the peak hour of operation pursuant to section 2411A3 of the county code and buildings, additions, and expansions requiring an SUP pursuant to section 2411B of the county code and extension of public water and sewer facilities up Route 30 and along Route 746 to serve this property. The site is located inside the primary service area and is designated for economic opportunity, Barmsville interchange area, and the comprehensive plan. The recommended primary uses for this area include industrial, light industrial, office, medical research, and or tourist attraction uses with secondary uses such as retail commercial being limited in amount and type to support the primary uses. Staff finds multiple favorable factors for this application. The proposed uses for the site align with the comprehensive plan. The applicant is proposing proffers to mitigate the impacts associated with this rezoning, which include transportation improvements to the surrounding road network, design guidelines for the development of the property, use limitation for certain commercial uses, and the submittal of a water and sewer master plan prior to site development. Furthermore, the county is proposing conditions to mitigate impacts associated with these special uses. These conditions include enhanced landscape buffering along the Barnes Road, Route 30, Leisure Road, Route 746, and Interstate 64 right-of-way, enhanced site design and architectural design, and specific, restriction, specific restrictions regarding location and site features 
for certain specially permitted commercial uses. Overall, staff finds the proposed rezoning and special use permit will not negatively impact surrounding development and that the proffers and proposed conditions will help mitigate the impacts generated by this proposal. Staff also finds that the development of the property is consistent with the recommended land use in the comprehensive plan. At its January 5th regular meeting, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this application by a vote of four to two, subject to the proposed proffers and SCP conditions. Staff recommends that the board approve this application subject to said proffers and conditions. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have for staff, and the applicant team is with us tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weisson. Anybody have any questions for staff? Do you, I'll hold my um, that's right. we'll, let's, uh, let's ask for the Planning Commission to go ahead first, and then we'll come back. Mr. Pulser. The majority of the citizens' comments we heard were on the impact of future traffic on Barnesville Road, Old Stage Road, and Leisure Road. We heard them at the public hearings of the Hazelwood Village Center and both hearings from the Hazelwood Enterprise hearings and the community outreach piece. The applicant laid out all the different traffic proffers, a total trip cap from the Enterprise Center at 944 trips, the addition of turn lanes, through lanes, and four signalized intersections that would maintain a level of service of C, which is the board's policy. With all these proffers in place and with signal signalization, we could expect a rate of speed through Route 30 at 23 miles an hour as opposed to the high rate we now see, and in addition, a level of service of C. Two commissioners were concerned with buffering along Leisure Road that would screen the adjoining properties with the removal of the residential components from the Enterprise Center. We were told that the current treed 100-foot area would have to remain undisturbed. For the area on Leisure Road where there is currently no vegetation, staff indicated that there would be an increase of approximately 10% in the mixed evergreen trees and shrubs, that 45% of the evergreens would have to reach a minimum height of 40 feet, and lower growing evergreens to provide full coverage. One commissioner was concerned with the open-ended SUP uses and the far-reaching impacts on the upper James City County. One commissioner further stated that placing the development in the location could potentially limit development in other locations such as Anderson Corner because the need of services would be lower. Uh, th this is a, a personal comment on the traffic impact issue. Uh, both Hazelwood projects were not viewed in isolation by the commissioners. The area surrounding the Barnesville to Hanna I-64 interchange also includes Stonehouse. In recent months, four conceptual design reviews were conducted that will add 951 residential units to the Stonehouse in the near future. A signal justification report for the intersection of Route 30 and Fieldstone was recently submitted by the Stonehouse Land Bay 5 developer. It confirmed that a signal is in fact necessary for the intersection which the developer was required to bond prior to the site plan approval and install before any building permits can be used per the approved proffers. One of the other three pending developments will also trigger, trigger a signal justification report to Route 30 westbound 64 on and off ramps. I mention all of this to say that the near term we will see some improvements at the rate of speed on Route 30 and when the Hazelwood proffers are triggered, we may see the rate of speed under the 25 miles an hour, mitigating a lot of our citizens' concerns. Given the context of the removal of 250 residential units from the Enterprise Center was significant consideration for commissioners. The Planning Commission recommended to the board that they approve Z19006 and SUP19005 Hazelwood Farms, the Enterprise Center, with a vote of 4-2 and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Polster. Uh, so, yes, have, can I ask a quick question, please, Mr. Polster? Um, I remember the comments during the Planning Commission regarding the foreign trade zone. Would you mind um, covering that, if you could, please, what, what that is and what it would mean in terms of this um, application? Uh, uh, James City County is rather fortunate to be included in the foreign uh, track zone. Uh, tax zone, which is a federal uh, program, which extends from this intersection all the way down to the harbor. And, and what that allows uh, folks to do is to bring in raw material, process it, so that when the material comes in, it's not taxed. 
but the finished product and any of the manufacturing machine and tool tax associated with would be taxed. So let me give you a couple examples uh, of, of what this looks like. Um, believe it or not, uh, the Norfolk port is the third largest coffee manufacturer on the eastern board uh, for. Um, I think most of you may be familiar with the Latende folks on Jamestown Road that have a retail and store as well as a restaurant. Uh, they have a coal storage facility in Stonehouse. And of course, that raw product comes in, they process it, and then ship it right out. And of course, the beauty of that is it's right on the interstate for both stuff coming up from the port and out and, uh, across there. Um, so there's, there's a real benefit to that. Uh, I'll give you one last, uh, two more examples uh, that could happen with this property that are in these SUPs. One of them you've seen is textile manufacturing. Well, what we're talking about uh, is actual case of a veteran who's bringing in raw material and then putting clothes together uh, for that. So th the manufacturing, the raw material, and out it goes. Uh, the last one could be a uh, manufacturer comes in here and wants to uh, take carburetor parts. So he gets all the carburetor parts in there, assembles it, ships it out, boom. And so the product comes in, the raw material is tax-free, but what does James City County get out of it? Okay, it gets that machine and tool tax, and it gets the type of light industry, I think, that we're looking for. So there's a lot of benefits to the program. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, within the county, I think there's about four or five other locations that run into this thing. Um, the go-kart property for that uh, uh, mall for next to Colonial Heritage that's all run down, had a fire, that's in the zone, okay, and listed with the program. So there are several ones. The Haskett property on uh, Croker is in that. Uh, and we have some of them down in the uh, Jamestown, or the Green, Green Springs uh, place. So it, it's a great program, uh, and this would be a great benefit uh, if we got something developed of that nature. Does that, does that answer your question, Ms. Sadler? Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, any other questions? Any questions for staff or for Mr. Polster? Not this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, begin the public hearing in just a second. Let me just say a word. Uh, we have a, a lot of folks here tonight. I appreciate uh, your interest in this case very much. Uh, uh, and uh, we have a tradition here of trying to keep our discussions very civil and uh, uh, not to engage in any kind of personal uh, discussion. I, I feel confident that will be the case as well tonight. Uh, we'll start with a presentation by the applicant uh, that's uh, limited to 15 minutes, and then we will go to uh, group presentations uh, um, that uh, will also be aw awarded 15 minutes and we'll move on to individual comments uh, that are limited to five. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing and call on the applicant. Ms. Trank, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Tim Trant, attorney with Kaufman and Canolas, 4801 Courthouse Street here in James City County. It's my privilege to be here tonight on behalf of the Hazelwood family, introduce to you the project team real quick. Uh, Larry and Debbie Hazelwood are here uh, representing the Hazelwood family. Their brother, R.M., could not be with us. Uh, Arch Marston and Jason Grimes with AES Consulting Engineers, the project civil engineers. John Hopke with Hopke & Associates is the architectural consultant on the project. And then last but certainly not least is Dexter Williams, who's our traffic consultant. Um, get, I'm sure you all are quite familiar with where the project is located, but I just have this here if we need to refer to it in the questions. Um, one thing that I know I'm guilty of in making these types of presentations is to jump right to what we're proposing. And, and tell you all about what we want to do and, and don't probably spend enough time talking about um, what, you know, what the current process, you know, current zoning and entitlement for the property is. And so I'll, I'll speak briefly to that. Um, this is what we are proposing to change from. The current zoning of the property is split, as uh, Mr. Wysong indicated, between B1 in pink, and, and the property is outlined here, as you can see it, uh, south of the interstate. Um, B1 in pink and uh, A1 in green. 
The B1 zone portion and the total site area is about 328 acres. And this has been a source of some uh, consternation for folks. I just want to clear it up. Um, the B1 zoned area is 100, this pink area is 197.58 acres, which is about 60% of the site, of the overall site. The A1 zone piece here is about 130 acres. It's about 40% of the site. Some of the confusion, I think, is this parcel in green is also the same tax map parcel as the property north of the interstate. So when you look at the acreage on the GIS mapping, it can be misleading about what is uh, what the acreage of the A1 piece is. So whatever that's worth, 60, 40 between B1 and A1. Um, what that means, uh, you know, by right development in the B1 zone is, uh, is fairly permissive. It is one of the county's more permissive zoning districts, but the county does have a fairly conservative um, zoning ordinance with some safety mechanisms built in to sort of capture and draw in what might otherwise be by right uses if they have uh, significant impacts like traffic or environmental concerns. So uh, while you may have a convenience store, for example, may be by right in B1, uh, not that it is, but assume that it is, it, it would potentially generate enough traffic to tr trigger a, uh, a special use permit or it would be named as a, as a commercial SUP, a type of use that would specifically need to come in and get board approval. So what, th those are not uses that we consider by right because they would trigger some sort of uh, board action or board approval. So just to give you a flavor of what might be by right in, in some of the uses that are already existing in this corridor, the character of the corridor, both in James City County and in New Kent, that would likely be able to uh, come to the site, that would likely be interested in the site, that have expressed interest in the site to the Hazelwoods in the past uh, for, for development. Those warehousing would be one that would not uh, trigger a special use permit. A kennel building supply company boat storage, boat repair, automobile repair, automobile and trailer sales, both new and used. Those are uses that are generally uh, generate less than those vehicle trip generation triggers that would pull them into a SUP. They are often smaller than 10,000 square feet in, in building area, so they wouldn't be drawn in and, and, uh, and require board scrutiny. But that's some of the, the development that would likely happen on the B1 portion by right. On the A1 portion, much more limited. There are a few business uses that are permitted in A1, most of them sort of agricultural oriented. The, the highest and best use for development of the A1 portion of the site by right would be a residential subdivision. Um, so that's sort of what the, the current status and zoning of the property is. And, um, and it's just another picture of the zoning map. Um, the negatives of that approach, which, which we recognize, are that it would offer piecemeal, uh, it would present piecemeal development of the property. There would be no master plan, no design guidelines, no comprehensive plan for how the property gets developed at what is no less than a, than a gateway to the county. Uh, access to Leisure Road well, would be permitted in that, as well as access to Barnes Road, both things that are prohibited in the, uh, in the proposed zoning. Uh, no traffic improvements on Route 30. The access for the property by right would be off of um, Old Stage Road and Barnes Road. Uh, so it would not be uh, subject to requiring traffic improvements on uh, off-site on Route 30. Uh, minimal buffering, and it would be also be on private well and septic. Um, so what does the comprehensive plan say should happen? If that's the by-right scenario, what does the comprehensive plan say, which is the guide post for whenever you are trying to change the current state of affairs, the current zoning, to some future zoning, what does the comp plan say? The comp plan has, since 2015, designated the entire property as economic opportunity. It was designated that uh, that way in, in the 2015 comp plan and, uh, and the A1 portion here was brought into the primary service area in connection with that action and that uh, decision and land use designation was recently affirmed unanimously by this board in uh, October with the uh, comp plan update. And uh, in more detail of what our objectives were in trying to propose this zoning change was to come up with an orderly plan of development for the property. Hayeswood family, as you probably have heard before, and we've certainly shared with the community, with the Planning Commission, and uh, hopefully Debbie and, and Larry won't smack me for saying that, but they are getting older, and, and they are no longer in a position to carry the property in, it, in its current condition, you know, just having it uh, farmed and maintained as they grew up on it. 
um, they're not excited about that. That's not something that they're uh, jumping up and down and, and celebrating. Uh, they have come to that position sort of begrudgingly, but they're there, and they are no longer in a position to, to carry the cost of the property. The farm rent that they get doesn't support the taxes, the insurance, and the upkeep, and it's, it's time to make a decision before something happens to one or more of them. And so they, they are in a position where they must, in the very near future, position the property for sale and development. And their idea for doing that, which they've been working on since before the first, the last comp plan update in 2015, so as early as 2014, they have been working on putting a plan in place for development of the property consistent with their values, which is not by right. It is consistent with the county's expectations of the property, which is one of our objectives. Um, to impose design guidelines on the property to ensure an attractive and a consistent architectural vision at a gateway to the county's um, uh, gateway to the county to impose a traffic mitigation plan to address the traffic concerns that we hear from citizens today. One of as Mr. Polster indicated, you know, speed and trouble making turning movements, the unsignalized intersections, uh, the improvements that we would propose, some of which, uh, as we indicated, are are warranted today, would be have the effect of slowing traffic down, calming traffic in that uh, corridor, uh, and making those turning movements safe by signalizing them, adding additional through lanes, turn lanes, additional pavement and striping. So it would be to improve traffic conditions and, uh, and maintain that level of service of, of C, which is the county's threshold expectation. And last but certainly not least is it's our desire to attract desirable business uh, businesses, tax revenue, and employment to the county, you know, research and development, light industrial, manufacturing offices. Um, as uh, was briefly touched on, there have been a couple of changes over the course of the application, which I think are worth noting. Um, we heard this application was filed, some people may forget, uh, in March of 2019. So it has been under roof for almost three years. Um, and that, I think, was appropriate. I mean, COVID certainly played a, a role in that. But a lot of it was just deliberative uh, back and forth working with consultants on the traffic um, and, the, and the, the conditions and the concept and the design guidelines to get to a place where we felt like we were it was ready for your review. In any event, um, it w first went to public hearing in October of this year before the Planning Commission, and we heard from a number of citizens at that meeting that they had some concerns. Um, one of the most significant concerns is at that time we were proposing an apartment community within the, the, con the, the, the business park near the front at the corner of Barnes of Old Stage and Leisure Road. Um, we heard loud and clear that that was not acceptable. That really, that just that was more than the community was willing to, to bear. They really were not interested in seeing more rooftops. They still had concerns with the project and its impacts, but residential was really inflammatory. And the Hazelwoods that night pulled me aside and said, Tim, pull it out. You know, that, that, we, we're set out to develop a business park. And if that's going to be an inflammatory item to our neighbors, pull it out. And we did. Um, the other was also a truck terminal uh, was originally proposed. That was more confusion than intention, but it, it was too closely uh, uh, associated with a truck stop, which we have never proposed. And it also has a more intense uh, truck traffic impact, which is not consistent with our vision for the business park. So we pulled that out. Um, we also engaged in a series of community meetings throughout uh, the early part of December, which were well attended and, uh, and, and had good dialogue. I felt like with the community, we were able to understand more about their concerns and, and, and they more about the, uh, the true nature of the project and its impacts. This is the concept plan. As you can see, there is a small commercial node in red here at the corner of Route 30 and Old Stage Road. The remaining uh, land bays, of which there are six, I guess technically seven with the, the buffer parcel here next to the Upper County Park, but six that would be proposed for business uses, for, for true uh, um, economic development type uses. Um, and as you can see there, sorry, I'm trigger happy here, I apologize. As you can see, um, the topography of the property uh, presents some very large flat areas uh, separated by some ravine and, um, and, and buffer areas. It, it actually serves the project well because it separates the, these land areas and will create a much more uh, attractive and, and well-buffered uh, development. The design guidelines presents uh, the, the vision, the, the 
aesthetic vision for the project. This is, these are pictures from the design guidelines of, of what we believe is attractive architecture and that should define the character of that uh, commercial component at the front. And these are pictures of what we think should define the business and industrial components, and pictures that you might find uh, familiar. These are pictures from the Commerce Park, as you can see, a boulevard, multi-use path, buffering, similar uh, to what we're proposing office building that would be similar and consistent with our design guidelines and then uh, an industrial manufacturing and warehousing use similar as you can see main entrance road out here the uh, median boulevard entering the property curvilinear street um, well buffered buffered on all sides this is the type of, uh, this is the vision for for the development um, I will quickly get to uh, the end of my presentation Speak briefly about the SUP uses. I think there's been some misconception about the, the SUPs. We've, we've heard some, some concerns about them, certainly at the Planning Commission. And um, as Mr. McGlennon has, uh, has reminded me on uh, at least one occasion, maybe more, uh, zoning decisions are limited to the land use, not the end user. Um, so in reality, there is seldom greater certainty um, than that offered by this application. Uh, you are never approving you know, the actual user, the, that, that customer that's in tow to occupy that site. You're approving the land use because that customer could change. That's our free market economy at work. You can't pick, you know, I like Wegmans, not Whole Foods or whatever. You, know, you have to, you're approving a grocery store and that could change. It could be any number of grocery stores. So what you have is design guidelines, master plans, proffers, and conditions. These are time-tested tools that regulate the SUP uses. Um, and they're all being utilized here, I, I would say, more intensely than in uh, many other instances. And last but not least, I think there is less uncertainty and less potential for negative impacts with the proposed SUP conditions than with by right development of the property. Um, last but not least, I'll quickly run through what I believe the project benefits are. Ensures an orderly and attractive development of the property and a mitigation of all of its impacts. Extensive traffic improvements, buffers, landscaping, multi-use paths, design guidelines, environmental protection, water conservation. Yes, I'm talking about an industrial park. That doesn't sound like a list for an industrial park. That's a in list of improvements that go with an industrial park. 100% consistent with the county's newly minted comp plan. Uh, Hazelwood family is proposing a business park, which most localities, to include James City County, uh, have to fund with taxpayer dollars. Uh, diversification of the local economy. We have relied for a long, long time, uh, much to all of our benefits, on the tourist and retail economy. This, uh, you know, gives us an opportunity to, to further diversify when those uh, those elements of our economy take take dips. Um, it's an ideal location for the foreign trade zone, as we've heard, um, but adjacent to the interstate and proximity to the port for truck and manufacturing traffic to be close to the interstate as opposed to having to pull those vehicles and those heavy truck that trips through our, um, our core our arterial corridors, through our neighborhoods and schools as, as other business parks uh, in the county do. This is right on the interstate interchange. And last but not least is the gatekeeper for most of the types of uses that we'd all like to see locate here is the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, the state's economic development agency. And this would position the property to, to get a look from those that gatekeeper. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks just in time. I had not rehearsed that that well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trant. Uh, is there anybody who uh, has a question that can't wait until after we hear from the rest of the public? Thank you, Mr. Trant. Uh, we'll now uh, uh, call on those who, who are representing uh, groups. Uh, Eric Joss. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Eric Joss, and I live at 3006 Forge Road. I'm here on behalf of Friends of Forge Road in Tuano, a nonprofit community organization. We thank you for your time and your dedicated service to our county. On behalf of concerned citizens, we ask for your help in striking a balance between the development and preservation of our irrepla irreplaceable community character. Regrettably, this proposed project in its present form does not strike this balance, and we respectfully ask that you deny approval of it. At the very least, we request that the board defer a decision on this application and submit it for further planning review. 
The application seeks to rezone 328 acres of beautiful forest and farmland located at the northern gateway to our county. Um, we have provided a map as well based on a review of the JCC property records, conversation with the planning staff, and a review of the planning staff report. So we have a little quibble here on the uh, acreage. Uh, Mr. Trance says it's 40% is uh, A1. We say, based on everything that we have researched, it's 50%. And the, uh, the quibble has to do with the 275 old stage piece at the bottom, 35 acres. But what's 35 acres between friends? Um, as shown in green on the map, provided to you just over one half of this land or 165.94 acres by our calculation is zoned A1. As shown in red on the map, the other half is zoned B1. The current zoning has been in place per the planning staff report since the 1980s. In 1998, the Board of Supervisors recognized the Hazelwood family for its, quote, dedication and commitment in continuing the heritage of Stage Road Farm of Virginia Century Farm. We very much appreciate and respect that dedication and commitment. Why do we need to so completely abandon this heritage as this project in its present form would do? The applicant has argued that this project is 100% in alignment with the comprehensive plan. Regrettably, this is simply not true. As expressed in extensive surveys and repeated, repeatedly memorialized in the comp plan, the citizens of our county have stated overwhelmingly that preserving our rural landscape is an extremely high priority. This project, as proposed, does not align with that priority. Recognizing the expressed will of the citizens, the comp plan specifically declares that the county will be a, quote, good steward of the land. We respectfully submit that citizens have every right to expect that their priority for preservation will be taken seriously into account. If this is not the case, why bother doing costly surveys? It is most unfortunate that our citizens, those most affected by this proposed project, have been given the least opportunity for input on it. However well-intentioned, it seems that from the start there was a strong predisposition predisposition here in favor of the applicant. Thus, as recorded in the minutes of the December 8, 2014 Planning Commission Working Group meeting, planning staff stated that it would like to avoid any future unintended conflict that could interfere with applicant's vision for this property. This was four years before the master plan was even presented for review. The initial master plan was submitted to planning staff in or about February 2019. Over the next two and a half years, the applicant and its team of professionals worked with staff on this project. This all culminated in the production of the final planning staff report and a recommendation of approval. The public was not part of this process. This over 300 page planning staff report was first made publicly available online only a few days before the October 6, 2021 Planning Commission hearing. How on earth could citizens be reasonably expected to find, digest, and meaningfully comment on a report of this magnitude? Beginning as early as 2014, the applicant and its team began lobbying to have the rural property designated as an economic opportunity area on the comp plan land use map. They finally succeeded in June 2015. Today, the applicant seeks to rely on this earlier EO land use designation as the basis for its rezoning application. This simply does not work. As made clear in the comp plan, again I quote, Land use designations and zoning districts are both important, but both each serve a different function. The land use designation in conjunction with the county development guidelines is a guide for a property's desired use in the future. Zoning is a separate regulatory process and layer and legally determines current development such as building and structure dimensions, design, placement, and use on the property. 
A land use designation is a guide, not a rezoning mandate. In order to change zoning, there must be a compelling current need to do so. This application presents no such need. Rezoning is not a real estate marketing tool. Similarly, the fact that this land is in, at the urging of the applicant was moved into the PSA does not mean that this land must be developed or developed exactly how the applicant has proposed. The comp plan recognizes the undeniable fact that, quote, rural areas include lands inside and outside of the PSA, both of which continue to see development pressure. Given the scope of this project, it is no solace to the citizens of this county that this acreage happens to be within the PSA. The applicant has repeatedly claimed that we must accept the applicant's plan as proposed or we will face uncontrolled by right de development. This is just not the case and is seemingly being used as a, a scare tactic. If approval is denied, this land would remain as it has for decades, half A1, half B1. As to the B1 portion, the county zoning ordinance makes it clear that there are more than 65 permitted uses for B1 property. Virtually all of these uses would be less destructive to the character of this area than the massive project the applicant is currently proposing. And importantly, in our county's robust zoning ordinance, there are all manner of restrictions ensuring that such development is far from uncontrolled. These include, for example, requirements and restrictions regarding setbacks, yards, heights, and structures, building coverage limits, sign regulations, and par parking regulations, site plan review, pedestrian accommodations, and landscaping. This application seems to be an example of throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks. Everything does not have to stick. The SUP requests go far beyond the permitted uses of even the EO zoning the applicant is, is seeking. In short, this application seeks to expand by right development by a huge margin. Undefined SUPs, such as those that uh, Mr. Trant described, are an unnecessary overreach and are directly contrary to good stewardship of our land as promised in the comp plan. The Enterprise Center seeks approval for unspecified commercial square footage of 75,000 square feet, or 7.5 times the threshold in the zoning ordinance. The applicant has withdrawn the residential component from this project, and this is certainly appreciated. However, at the same time, the applicant has actually added 300,000 square feet to the warehouse, industrial, and office space component. Pushing the limits on size and use undermines the essential balance between development and preservation. The application is in many respects a request for a blank check. The special use permit legislative process is designed to enable the board to give special scrutiny to requests for identified uses which are above and beyond those permitted by by right in the, zone, by right in the zoning ordinance. Here, the applicant cannot tell the board who or what the actual users and uses will be. Why shouldn't these special use requests be brought to the board as they normally are when actual users and uses are identified? Granting blanket, open-ended rezoning and SUP approvals sets a dangerous precedent. Some of the other inadequately addressed unknown, uh, unknowns here include traffic congestion and safety, impact on our finite water supply and private residential wells, noise pollution, air quality, view shed, storm water management. And as to natural resources, the applicant's community impact statement broadly asserts that its environmental study found no endangered wildlife or plant species on this property. However, a review of the actual environmental study reveals that it was in fact limited to one type of rare orchid and did not include searches for other rare, threatened, or endangered species. Further, this study, which was completed over six years ago, makes clear that its findings were only valid for the time in which the study was performed. In light of all this, would it not be prudent at least to take a closer look 
before signing a blank check. Another significant concern here is that residential property in the area of this proposed development will suffer a decline in value. What consideration has been given to these property owners? Financial benefit, if any, to the county and the citizens is yet another huge unknown. Given the poor performance of other developments in this area, the financial success of this project is anything but assured. Unbuilt or poor performing projects yield little or little tax or other revenue. The citizens of this county are being asked to sacrifice a great deal based on pure speculation. As early as 2014, the county published detailed strategies and recommendations to provide viable economic options for rural landowners. The 2045 comp plan specifically refers to and supports implementation of these recommendations. Were any of these strategies at least considered here? After all, half this land is zoned A1. Why form committees and do costly studies if they are to be ignored? Experience has taught us that once projects like this are approved, all too often the developer comes back to the board and requests post-approval changes to the original plan. Given this history, how confident are we that purported protections such as the vaunted 944 peak hour vehicle limit will not be changed? And what about the domino effect? Whatever is approved for the Hazelwood Farm will likely be relied, relied upon by other applicants in support of their development aspirations. Where does this all end? Ladies and gentlemen, you are being asked to adopt an ordinance stating that this rezoning is, quote, required by public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and good zoning practice. We respectfully submit that this project, as proposed, does not meet that high standard. Thank you again for your time and your careful attention to this matter. Thank you, Mr. Joe. Can I uh, call uh, Darlene Previsch, uh, who is also speaking for a group? I thought I was speaking last, so. <laughs> My name is Darlene Previsch of 211 Old Stage Road, Toano. I'm here to represent Save Rural James City County, a group of 992 concerned citizens who have joined us since December the 8th, 2021. By profession, I am a registered nurse and have none of the experience you all have in the ins and outs of zoning practices. But I am a trained professional who has to use all of my senses when assessing my patients in order to have the best outcomes. I use my sight to visualize my patient's physical limitations, my ears to listen, as well as my intuition, smell, touch, and data to collect all the facts. I am taught to have a questioning attitude because we should not accept anything at face value. I took my oath to do no harm very seriously, and people's lives depend on that. We are here asking you to not take anything at face value here because our way of life depends on that. I respectfully, um, no, I'm sorry. I look at the SUPs that are proposed and so many questions emerge in my mind. I wonder what would happen if this 3.3 million square foot facility was not built linearly, but was built vertically. What could not the developers add many other uh, buildings to this property as long as they were not more than 75,000 square feet each? Our current zoning SUP uh, regulations only allow square footage of 10,000 square feet. Why is this submission asking for buildings almost eight times larger than the norm, and why are we even considering it when we have no known user in place at this time? James City County will give up any control in this project by allowing these broad and open-ended SUPs. Newtown had to come back and ask for permission to add each phase, and that was a reasonable ask. 
the Candle Factory, Stonehouse, and Colonial Heritage have had multiple requests added to their master plans, and this should be the norm. Do you know with absolute certainty that this project does not need those same safeguards? What happens if these buildings remain empty for years? Have you asked that there be any bonding to request that if a building remains empty for a finite period, that they have to tear it down and restore the land? Have we built severability into the SUPs to ask them to only be open for a specific amount of time? We do see this as a blank check on a grand scale, and I ask you, if this were your own bank account, would you write a blank check on a project that gives you no specifics on how your money would be spent? Are you ready to sign off on a project where you have no assurances other than a remark made by the applicant's architect on January 5th when he said, we don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we're going to make it nice. You cannot evaluate or model the impacts of SUPs when the, sp and when the special uses and their parameters are not known. <clears throat> we have problems with traffic codes that represent the, the traffic figures that you have um, seen here tonight. I've just done a little bit of math here, and each of you has the actual Exhibit 6-1 where I've highlighted some of these figures so that you can see. You'll hear later more about this and how we came to it. Like I said, I thought I was coming in at the end. Daily trips using the light industry code, which we've heard that's what this is all about. This is light industry. This is um, not warehousing. Warehousing is a storage of goods. This project is supposed to take and produce goods and then sell them at a higher profit margin, which is where the county makes money. So using the light industry code, we came up with data of 14,880 trips per day. The Enterprise Shopping Center, which is also on table four, their far right column, uh, table four, 4,944 trips on the shopping center portion. The Village Center, table one at the top, far right, you see, I think it's third down, 16,189 trips. The new trip generation between these two projects is going to be 36,103 trips per day. Existing trips in the manual, which Sharon will talk to you about in a minute, in 2017 showed that traffic through this corridor from uh, 64 to Route 60 was 19,000 trips. So you add all of that up, you get 55,103 trips. And just for comparison's sake, I-64 exit 227 to the New Kent Line going west, the interstate with free-flowing traffic, no stoplights, 49,000 daily trips. We're trying to put in something here that's going to generate 6,000 more trips per day on Route 30. So um, the reason why it is so important that we hear this factor is because we have to get this right. Improper traffic counts have led to the traffic difficulties along Life Road, Moortown Road, and on Monticello Avenue. The extra traffic... We, we heard tonight about um, these other projects, how we're in uh, level of service C. This amount of traffic puts us in level service D and E, which means considerable congestion. Remember that we are, we're only using, with this figure, we are only using 3 million square feet. We're not taking into account any of the growth that's happened through Stonehouse, Whitehall, or anywhere else since 2013, this is using a 2000, I'm sorry, 2017. This is only using the 2017 number with no increase since then. Um, the data that we show is that traffic is gonna be horrific. We haven't even discussed the through traffic on Barnes Road or on Old State Road. Have we looked at putting in things that would make it so painful to come through those corridors, speed bumps, something, that people decide to go around instead? 
We already have semi-trucks using this now. There was one that got stuck in the median um, on the way here, as a matter of fact. Um, we cannot find, if we can't find solutions to this, then maybe this project is just in the wrong location. I'll sum it up with this. The plan is still immature and it is not finished. You, heard, you will hear personal stories about how this plan is going to affect the lives of those who choose to live here and, have raised, and they will raise many unanswered questions. How will this affect the water table? On this end of the county, we, de we depend on that. How will this affect stormwater? Our streams will, could be overrun, turning our gently flowing streams into swamps. This happened when White Hall's runoff killed the trees in, in the back of Temple Hall. What will air quality be like? Could this end up being a West Point paper mill? Probably not, but it could be. We don't know that because we don't know what is being proposed, protected species. We don't know because no one has looked since 2015. Current environmental only looked at one rare orchid. Why would we look for that when our climate is not one that would allow orchids to grow in the wild? We do have eagles here, however, and a lot of them. Did we look for nests? Will this benefit James City County financially? How much will it cost us? Again, we cannot project the cost or the benefits because we don't know who the end user will be. How about light pollution, noise? Why isn't anybody looking at 12 foot berms with, with bushes and, and grass planted on them? Things like that will absorb noise from factories by 70 to 80%. <clears throat> but instead, what we're looking at, where from my driveway, is we're looking at 100 feet of immature planted vegetation that in decades will reach that number, Mr. Tramp quote, quoted. But for now, it's, we're going to see it. What happens to the property values? And why do we hear about how the landowners ought to be able to profit for their land. I agree, if it was my land, I would be looking for a profit too. But we also ought to look at how this is gonna affect the citizens and our uh, way of life and our property values. Because we shouldn't lose our investment when we moved here knowing it was zone, a lot of it was zone A1 and we depended on that. I respectfully argue that if we don't know the end user, we cannot predict, predict the outcomes. This project is in opposition to the 2019 survey your office has conducted. Our citizens reported that they did not want to lose the rural character of this county. It is in opposition with the comprehensive plan where you say that the county will be good stewards of the land. The SUPs are out of control. If, if approved, you're essentially writing a blank check and getting, giving up any control you have in order to have this beautiful master plan. But I want you to keep in, in mind that a master plan is very much like a concept car. They predict what it's going to look like in 2045, but it rarely looks like that when it's built. Um, the EO designation is not necessary. This request for zoning should be denied this evening or at the very least deferred and sent back to the planning commission until every question has an answer. As you get ready to voice your vote tonight, I ask you to ask yourselves, is this rezoning a necessity? If it were a necessity, how come every building in the new, nearby industrial park is not filled? And how come every parcel of land is not purchased? Does this project add convenience to the citizens? How can it do that when it will snarl the traffic, decrease safety, and for all the other reasons I've mentioned? Does it serve to increase the welfare of its citizens? That answer is a resounding no. Is this good zoning practice? How can it be when it violates the reasonable standards that are currently in place? You cannot, if you cannot say yes to even one of these points, this proposal must be denied or at the very least have every single question answered by sending it back 
to the planning staff to get specifics built in that can produce reliable data before approving. We elected you to represent not just James City County as an entity, but to represent its citizens. That is no easy task, we are sure, but we do believe you must know by now that there are questions that are unasked, and my final ask is that you digest the information you hear tonight and do no harm to our beloved James City County. Thank you, Mr. Joseph, Joseph Swannenberg. Joseph Swannenberg. Good evening, board members. Joseph Swannenberg, 3026 The Point Drive. So, what would the word of the year be just these few short weeks into 2022? Misinformation is the first word that comes into my head. There's been a lot of misinformation surrounding this project. So several truths, facts, and realities of this project. It is roughly 325 acres, plus or minus. 195 of which, plus or minus, the majority has been commercially zoned B1 since 1972. It is in the PSA, and buy right development is not a scare tactic, but a very real and a very scary prospect. Let's start in 1972. I wonder how many in this room have been here in James City since 1972. Statistically speaking, only one in five of us were here in 1972. In reality, because of the way things change, it's probably a whole lot less than that. I've been here since 1979. Population was less than 20,000 then. Now it's almost 80,000. A lot of things have changed since then. Since 1972, the majority of this property has been undeveloped commercial land. Another reality is over 80% of the homes currently in James City County did not exist in 1972. Therefore, most everyone in this room lives in a home that was truly rural land in 1972, very possibly farmland. The future of this property was decided and remained unchallenged for over 50 years. For the life of me, I don't understand how a person who lives in a house that was built after 1972 can oppose this measure. Your home site was truly rural land while this property was already zoned commercial. Those in opposition must come to an understanding that this property, the 195 acres, zone B1, and then 60 of which was the part that's farmed, will be developed commercially regardless of what happens here tonight. The question one needs to ask themselves, do you want managed development or do you want Route 17 in York County? I am told that since this entire parcel is inside the PSA, if this proposal is not approved, that residential development is possible on the back 130 acres on Barnes Road. I would personally much rather have a developed product that looks like Stonehouse Commerce Park as opposed to Route 17 or more residential. Approval of this special permit in the master plan will require much more stringent county approval of architecture, traffic management, landscaping, buffering, water conservation, and stormwater protection, all of which are very important, but I cannot say enough about traffic management. Without approval of this SUP and the attached master plan, by right development could result in multiple entrances on Leisure Road and Barnes Road. By right development is no joke. The special use permit and the master plan create a much higher quality of development, which then becomes economic development for the entire county in three ways. First, it will provide for higher paying jobs. Second, the project will help keep real estate taxes level. And third, it can provide funding for the protection of actual real rural lands through perhaps a renewed PDR program. And it also could be a funding mechanism for facilities for the sports tourism market, which I've been hearing about. I remind you that a vote against this application means you support residential development over economic development. Let that sink in. The comprehensive plan is the county Bible for planning and development. 
Every board of supervisors that has had the privilege of voting on a comprehensive plan has approved that plan with this very proposed land use in their respective comp plan. Once again, this is not rural land, it is undeveloped commercial property. So for those of you who oppose the special use permit, be careful for what you ask, you might just get it, such as Route 17, metal buildings, minimal buffers, horrible traffic, as well as more residential. I ask the board to fulfill their elected duties in support of our zoning and planning, in support of our comprehensive plan, which includes land use, economic development, as well as a protection for real rural land, and to vote in favor of this project. Thank you. Richard Timberlake. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the board, thank you for having me tonight. I'm very nervous. It's only the second time I've been up here. Uh, but I have been a resident of the Williamsburg, James City County area for a long time. I moved here in 1957. So I was here in 1972. I've lived in and out of James City County uh, most all of my life. I've lived elsewhere. I spent 10 years in Northern Virginia. I'm sorry, Rick Timberlake. Rick Timberlake, uh, Whiffet Way, Colonial Heritage. I'm sorry, I, I started right in. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent 10 years in Northern Virginia, where I have seen what explosive and unbridled growth has done to the residents as well as to the businesses there. I spent 10 years in Northampton County, where I saw the second poorest county in the state exercise an, ex exercise an attitude towards business that is expressed by the first two letters in the name of the county. By having no business in, in Northampton County, what you see is uh, no tax base, no commercial tax base, so you must rely on farmland uh, for taxes and you must rely on homeowners. So that means that you cannot build good schools, you cannot pay good teachers, you cannot replace police cars when they're wrecked. That's, if you want rural, yeah, move to Northampton County, I'll show you that. James City County has an opportunity here to build something that will really help this county quite a bit. I'm sure there was resistance in 1972 when the Bush family came in here and said they wanted to do something for James City County as well. Look what that brought us. The ability to diversify and employ a very well thought out plan in this area of the county right next to the interstate makes all, repeat, all the sense in the world. You want scare tactics? What, buy, you think buy right is a scare tactic? How about Kelton Station overlooking 64 at exit 227? Is that what you'd like? Uh, the concept of the things that could go wrong if this uh, plan is not adopted, uh, that's what should chill you. Uh, uh, the ability to go forward without a master plan, uh, no, none of the uh, great improvements that I see listed in, in all these comments made tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Timberley. Um, Thomas Lusk. Thomas Lusk, 249 Racefield Drive. Um, I was born and raised here in James City County, born in 1964, been most of, mostly a lifetime resident here. Um, and I live in close proximity to the properties that we're talking about. So I'm one of the people that would be affected by what we're gonna do. Um, first time these properties really came to my attention with any plans from the county were several years ago, probably a couple of comprehensive plans ago, when there was some discussion about it in the comprehensive plan, and I read an article in the Virginia Gazette, which talked about the Hunt Farm and the Hazelwood Farm, how the county had plans for these properties to become economic opportunity zones. So what we're looking at here basically is something that the county's been planning on for at least a decade or more, that these properties were going to be designated for economic opportunities. The property that we're looking at now is probably one of the best pieces of property in the county for an economic opportunity. It's sitting right off of an interstate exit and entrance, and it's sitting right in front of a four lane divided highway. Um, you know, the family has been working with the county for quite a while to draw up this plan. There's been, there's been changes that, that have been made with this conceptual plan that I have in my hand, several changes. 
um, over time, but they've worked in conjunction with the county to come up with a plan that fits what the county wants for this property. These people are private landowners. They don't live on the land anymore. No one's going to farm it anymore. That's just not going to happen. Changes are coming to this county, and this is the type of thing that will give us some control over what happens on these properties. Without this, as a couple of people in front of me have mentioned, um, buy right would give people opportunities to come in and buy this property and do things that are not attractive to the county and don't have the buffers that are in this and don't have, have the setbacks that are here. Um, looking at this plan, it looks like there's, there's one major entrance into this coming off of Leisure Road instead of 20 or 30 driveways coming off of Leisure Road and Barnes Road as well. Um, I think we also have to understand that, you know, nobody's bought the property. Nobody's come before you and said, hey, I'm going to build this. This is the county working together with the Hazelwood family to say this is a plan. It's a conceptual plan for what we would like to see there. This is probably not going to be the finished product. Maybe somebody will come in with, with the idea of this is what I'm going to do. Um, but this is certainly much better than what could happen on that property if we don't approve this. Um, family's going to sell the land. They don't want to farm it. They don't want to live on it. Um, and this fits within what the county's been planning for decades. So I just like to say that I'm here to, to support the family and support the rezoning and the SUP that, that's being asked for here. Um, one of the things that really concerns me is, you know, some of the issues about private land ownership and what happens with people's land when they own it. Um, I own some land pretty close by here. If I decide that I want to do something on that land that's within the law and the county code, I don't want to see 500 people walk in this room and tell me I can't do it. It's a land ownership issue. Um, the new owners of the land are going to have some rights too. And so i just like for y'all to give that to some consideration. Um, I think the Hazelwood family has gone above and beyond in working with the county to try to, to, try to come up with this. Um, they could have already sold the land to somebody who would do something drastically different to this, but they've spent years working with the county to come up with this. And I think we ought to respect their rights as landowners and approve this um, to protect what's going to happen here. Um, We've been looking for econ economic opportunity and develop in this county, and this is probably the best piece of property we have in the county to do it with. Yeah, it's going to change the landscape of the land up there a little bit, but, you know, you're going to ruin my view is not a good reason to say no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plus. Uh Josh Mathias. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so I just wanted to take a minute to kind of draw a contrast to what's being proposed by the applicant and how the residents of the county actually feel and what they think is important. So how do we know what the residents are thinking and which direction they want to head in in the future? Well, some of the other speakers have already referred to it, but the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Survey which was sent to residents during development of the 2045 comp plan. So in regards to services that the county does or can provide, 95% of the respondents feel that efforts to protect and improve the natural environment, including water quality, air quality, and environmentally sensitive areas are very important. So this proposal does really nothing to help accomplish that goal. In fact, quite the opposite is true. This proposal will inevitably contribute to increased water consumption from a frequently parched James City County. Also, the swamp land that runs through the portion zoned A1 is a tributary to the Chickahominy River, so there's a consideration of erosion and just basically runoff. So also, 85% of citizens feel that efforts to protect 
and preserve the county's rural character are very important. Obviously, this proposal, if it were approved and implemented, would be the antithesis of that idea. But what does it really mean to protect rural lands and how's that done? So what protecting rural lands really means is preventing or at least not facilitating the build out of every achievable inch of wooded lands, farmlands, and fields. Protecting rural land should start with surveys such as the one I'm talking about. When this land was adopted as EO, what consideration was given to that? Next on the list of critiques of how the residents feel that the county is doing. When compared to the 85% of residents who think that preserving the rural character is important, the number drops to 69% that think the county is doing a good job. It, disappointingly, 30% of the people surveyed are unsatisfied with efforts the county has implemented to preserve the rural character. So one third of residents of the county think that we're not doing enough to preserve the rural character and that number should, should stick out. On the subject of land use in the county, 78% of us think it's more impor important to preserve farmland than it is to have more development. That doesn't mean preventing the portion of the land that's currently zoned B1 from by right development. It really means not approving the rezoning of the A1 portion. While the applicant keeps saying that the land is already zoned B1, make no mistake, approximately half of the land is agricultural, i.e. rural. Finally, a common theme to this proposal has been the benefit of additional tax revenue that's gonna be generated. The highly speculative and open-ended nature of this proposal makes it really impossible to, to gauge any estimate of any tax revenue that would be generated. Anyway, 54% of residents polled said they would pay higher taxes if it meant less development, which is astounding. So given the results of the survey, it really becomes hard to understand what we have in front of us today. It's even harder to understand the rubber stamp approval process that this proposal has gone through. A main talking point we've heard is that the proposal complies with the comp plan. Since the survey is part of the comp plan, I, has to ask, I have to ask really, does it comply? So tonight you will hear or you have already heard from some supporters of the proposal. I'd argue that these supporters do not represent the interests of the citizens as a whole. And in fact, in some cases, some stand to gain if this proposal is approved. So what I've outlined tonight is really the will of the residents, not developers or speculators. And if the board doesn't listen to the residents on this issue, when will it? Thanks, guys. Ms. Mathias, uh, I apologize for not reminding you at the beginning if you would mind stating your name and address for the record. Josh Mathias, 3428 Colony Mill Road, Toano. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Rangel. To Mr. Rangel. Rick Rangel. Good evening. I remember you. I'm Rick Rangel, 3962 Bournemouth Bend, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. It's on uh, uh, Wellington Estate. Yes, it probably was a farmland at one time back in eons ago, but honorable board members, I just want to point out a couple of things that uh, a, a lot of folks are, are neglecting to, to, to grasp. And, can you, ask, I, can you please put I appreciate Ms. Walsh's career. I am a GIS scientist as well. And, uh, and I'm sure she has probably seen a lot of data uh, throughout the years through developments and things such as that that uh, impacts environment. So yes, you will, you will hear me with the impact twist 
to my to my stuff here. James City County is in a water crisis. 2.83 million gallons cut. That's August 18th, 2019. That was an article. Uh, un unlim ultimately, although the DEQ came in incredibly hard during negotiations, most of the permits were cut down to a figure platable to both the users and agencies. But for four permittees, DEQ set a withdrawal of targets below actual usage that was occurring, which is now forcing tough choices. Three of the users are private enterprises, the International Paper Mill in Franklin, West Rock Paper Mill in West Point, and Colonial Williamsburg. Reduce their water rates, their water usage. The fourth was James City County, where due to geological quirks, the greatest reliance on groundwater of any public water system in the state, they live and die by their groundwater, as Jurgens puts it. There, the state has cut the water authority permit from 8.83 million gallons per day to six, with plans to cut it to 3.8 to 4 million gallons in the next permit cycle. And yet the county, more than any other place in Virginia, is preparing for water shortfalls, facing new restrictions from the State Department of DEQ. James City County has found itself squeezing every drop as it plans for a future water, uh, future where water is neither as cheap as I heard a bill get raised, our bill's gonna get raised, uh, where water is gonna be cheap or readily available, it has been for decades. There was a desale plant that I'm was Mr. 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 Rang, would you mind, Sorry, the, I the microphone will get the, the okay. message out. There was a desale plant Thank you. that was proposed 2003, 2018, 16 or 17, it came to the plate and it was, and it was put on back burner. There were five plants that were gonna be built. One was gonna be on the Chickahominy River and it got delayed. You guys knew that there was gonna be a water issue and now you're continuing to build. I wish to convey the concern of this uh, SUP or the rezoning of any type of I-64 uh, corridor, specifically that, that 320 acre parcel. This county continues to flood manufacture and industrial warehousing industry in the rural, less developed regions of James City County. This Board of Supervisors will be considering the same options yet again in the Stonehouse District, which is what we're doing right now. I was a surveyor who worked at a local engineering firm that laid the groundwork for the one million square foot Walmart distribution center on the other side of the county. While tons of building materials were over the road transported, this structure attracted warehousing, industrial structures, the road network remained too small for the heavy truck traffic of Route 60 that impacted the poorer and only remaining trailer park in the county. Yet it did not, it did not extend local commerce to the region. Big outside money development left the local region with an empty hand. The county didn't get any money out of it. Well, we didn't. The new proposal set for the hearing tonight opens up the, the, this corridor for same transportation truck traffic. Granted, it's near the I-64 interstate, but the highway development ended at 199. So we're gonna still be stuck with four lane traffic on I-64. Mr. Angle, you've reached your time limit. <laughs> Thank you very much, I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for your time. Uh, Janet Moore. Good evening, uh, my name is Janet Moore and I reside at 151 Sterling Manor Drive in Williamsburg, Virginia. I've been following the application for the Enterprise Center with interest, especially as a way of attracting economic development and diversifying James City County's tax base. I think the property has many attributes that, may, that make it a unique asset for the county and feel it is a special opportunity to, to position the property for its designated use and requested zoning of economic opportunity, as there are precious few opportunities like this in the county. 
The parcel is designated as, as economic opportunity on the James City County Comprehensive Plan, and all the land is within the defined public service area. The comprehensive plan has been previously approved by both the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. The application has received the recommendation of the county's planning department, which has extensively reviewed the plan and supporting studies. One of the concerns I often hear about James City County property tax is, is that property taxes are too heavily based on residential property, which places an additional burden on residential property owners. This parcel would help the county di diversify its tax base further and provide more balance. I think the parcel is also exactly the type of property that provides the opportunity to attract the types of industry that are desirable for economic development, namely skilled labor, good paying jobs, capital investment, and positive economic benefit to the county, which support basic services of the citizens. The parcel offers our community the ability for our children and residents to have more job opportunities that pay well offer benefits, affording us the opportunity to work close to home. The parcel is located immediately adjacent to an I-64 interchange. This proximity provides for much shorter trips in and out of the parcel than parcels located much deeper in the county. The parcel is located inside a designated foreign trade zone. These zones are intended to attract industry that import materials and product to the, to the United States to be manufactured assembled, processed, and stored without the imposition of import duties to encourage foreign commerce in the U.S. When you add it all up, I think this is a rare and beneficial opportunity for the county. The strategic location and the many attributes associated with this parcel make perfect sense to approve the application and position it for the very use that the comprehensive plan already recognizes. For all these reasons, I strongly encourage approval by the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, Jay Everson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jay Everson, 6923 Chantry Lane. We have some memory lane, so I'll continue with that. 1989, Judy Newton runs for the Board of Supervisors, pledging to stop the slowdown. Uh, rampant residential growth, which was understandable. We had 20% increase in the population the two years prior. 1993, Bob Magoon runs, and he puts into our political exon a, a phrase that even Mr. Eisenhower has used as in, in the last year. He said, we have 14,000 approved but unimproved lots in James City County. We didn't stop there. He continued by saying, we need to diversify our tax base with business and commercial so that we, to, to use a phrase that Ms. McLennan has used, uh, so we can provide the services that the people need and want. 1997, Mr. Ron Nervin and Powhatan runs along with Mr. McLennan and then Jamestown saying they'll do everything they can to stop rampant residential growth. In the 25 years since then, with the exception of one possible supervisor, Everyone who's been elected to this board has had concerns, angst, or lamented residential growth, including all four of you here and the one on the phone. Um, that brings me to the Hazelwood application. When I looked at this and I saw the A1, I said to myself, that is a potential or probable 30 to 40 more residential units in James City County probably with a community well or community wells that will ultimately be subsidized by the other ratepayers on the service authority. Well, you get the houses. Well, in Bob Magoon's world, you've got the business by right. But well, that, it is unknown to what extent that business that could go by right would be able to compensate for the services that the people in, a, in the A1 would require. But if you vote, that's if you vote no. That's what you could get. If you vote yes, you get zero houses, not one. No possibility of one. And you get a master plan which includes, includes traffic mitigation. No, you know, no uh, entrances except for emergency vehicles on Barnes Road, a tra traffic light at uh, Old Stage Road, 
enhanced, enhanced landscaping, consistent architecture, enhanced buffers, buffers and water conservation. Now, over the last 33 years, since 1989, we've heard all this talk about we're going to do something to control residential growth. Well, this is one time where you can actually say no to residential growth, but yes to this project, which has none. This is not a density question or whether this house should be over here or over there. You could totally exclude it. And the money that this project would generate as business would provide the opportunity, as someone else mentioned, for such services and, and objectives of the county as PDRs. They're expensive. And this is one way you could generate money for that. Because that, money, that land is going to go to development regardless of what you do tonight. So why don't we do something that's for the benefit of the entire county and stops any more additional residential growth? Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Everson. God bless you all. <laughs> Scott May. Good evening, uh, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Scott May. I live at 2624 Meadow Lake Drive in Toano. Um, I live in the Meadow Lake subdivision, which is somewhat adjacent to this property, and we're somewhat downstream of uh, this property. So I'd like to first state that you know, I'm personally not opposed to development, and I support the Hazelwoods' rights to you know, profit from their you know, family's property. I also appreciate the board's uh, service and uh, dedication on this board. However, I do not support this application as proposed due to its lack of specificity regarding the actual end use of this property. I've shared my concerns uh, with you uh, via email uh, previously, so I'm not going to go through all those now, but I will just kind of summarize a few uh, main points. Uh, the Enterprise Center, along with the Meadow Lake subdivision where I live, um, falls within the Dyerskin Creek watershed. And covering over 3 million square feet of soil with concrete, in addition to parking lots, roadways, and sidewalks, is going to have a huge impact to the surrounding environment, especially my neighborhood. We have two streams that go through my property and some of my other neighbors' property in the, uh, in the Meadow Lake. And look no farther than the Saturday edition of the Virginia Gazette, where they talk about a huge gorge that's been created over near William and Mary, because when you have a lot of water running, uh, from a large area to a very small area, there's, there's physical damage. So my wife and I are certainly concerned about uh, physical damage to our property and you know, damage to our neighborhood with this uh, proposed development. Um, <clears throat> my driveway goes right across uh, the dam on the largest lake. So how will this development impact the existing water features in the Meadow Lake subdivision? There's numerous water features in the Meadow Lake subdivision. The ponds and the lake were designed and built back in the 90s, and they certainly weren't designed to handle the amount of additional water that can be expected from a development of this uh, magnitude. How will this development impact the Dyerskin Creek Reservoir? I recently reviewed a 2016 Dyerskin Creek Watershed Report, which I shared with each of you via, via email. And that report concluded that the watershed water quality back in 2016 was marginally acceptable. At the time of this report, the watershed was described as very lightly developed and is mostly rural residential with forested upland and pasture. Water quality is already marginally acceptable, so you have to ask yourself, how will this major industrial center right upstream impact the already current poor water conditions in the watershed? Since specific end uses for this property have not been disclosed, how can this board be expected to vote on a project of this magnitude without more detailed information? Rezoning, along with the excessive special use permits, provides almost a blank check to whomever ends up developing this property. I'm a forensic scientist by profession, and I'm very familiar with the use of scientific method when tackling complex problems. For 25 years, I've gathered data and facts. I've used that information to develop an informed, reasonable opinion. At times, I have to share my opinion in a court of law in an adversarial system where my credibility, competence, and opinions are challenged. I cannot base my opinion on speculation, estimates, or guesses, and I proffer that you too, as members of this distinguished board, 
should approach complex proposals in the same manner with the same level of scrutiny. You should first gather all the facts, evaluate the data, and come to a reasonable informed decision. Unfortunately, for this particular proposal, you do not have sufficient facts or data to reach an informed decision. I understand that this property will ultimately be developed. However, what is the harm in waiting until a specific use is identified and have the board evaluate that specific proposal when that comes forward? Employment figures, traffic estimates, water sewage usage, stormwater management, et cetera, all that can be reasonably assessed once you actually know the end use of that property. So I would respectfully ask that you vote no on the Enterprise Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. May. Robert, Robert uh, uh, Holroyd. I'm sorry, Doug, Doug Holroyd. Greetings, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Doug Holroyd. I live at 103 Marina Point, Williamsburg. It's actually in York County. Complete uh, transparency, I'm also the planning commissioners for District 1 of York County, the upper district that uh, borders on much of JCC. In that role, I watch closely the applications and approvals that come before this board. Uh, for the most part, I remain silent. I can't remain silent on this application. York County residents, similar to JCC residents, have spoken clearly and consistently for a considerable period of time on the need to retain the rural nature of our counties and to protect the limited green space that still exists. York County Board of Supervisors recently denied, by unanimous vote, uh, uh, an, op an opportunity to convert 375 acres of rural residential into a massive housing complex. Uh, it now has over 200 acres of green space, assigned to the by right design. Similarly, the Eager Track just recently approved uh, for Battlefield Trust is another 300 acres that have been converted to conservancy land in York County. York County Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee just last week removed mixed use overlay from all of the properties in York County with the exception of uh, the marquee parcel. The rationale being that the overlay descriptor is simply being used by landowners and by developers to drive up the value of land and to bypass zoning requirements. I would hazard to say that's exactly what we're seeing in this application. Now let's talk about the Hazelwood application. 164 acres immediately adjacent to I-64, zoned A-1. I think that's the issue. B-1, you can build what you want. It's, it's already zoned appropriately for the types of buildings that have been requested, but A-1 is not. I've listened carefully to the eloquent speech of Councillor Trant I have reviewed in depth the Hazelwood Farms LLC proposal and the JCC staff report. The applicant must provide compelling reason for rezoning. Rezoning the two A1 properties uh, from agricultural A1 to EO is simply not covered in their proposal. Staff report suggesting it is zoned EO is inaccurate. 2015 comprehensive plan placed an EO overlay on the Barmsville interchange, but that did not change the current zoning. Staff report does not make an evaluation of this application against current zoning. The applicant has certainly not provided rationale in his application for these A1 properties to be rezoned. He has not provided a fiscal evaluation. He hasn't even provided a clear description of the buildings proposed on this parcel of land, much less the justification for the rezoning. These two A1 properties are separated from the rest of the Hazelwood farm by a very deep ravine. RPA restrictions and setback requirements will not allow warehousing, warehousing or other building proposals from the B1 zone to be linked to A1. They are geographically separated. Why would we want to do anything different? Leave them separated. The, applic <clears throat> the applicant has provided very few details on what will be built. And as others have already pointed out, he said, trust us. <laughs> well, I had a very astute CEO during my career, and he was often often quoted uh, using the phrase, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. I don't see the data. This application is void of anything that would describe what it is you're actually going to build on this land. All too often we've seen that problem. Marquee is a good example of that. Big boxes built on land that was promising to be a great economic future. It didn't turn out. Members of the board, our citizens have spoken clearly about the need to retain the few remaining parcels of agricultural rural land 
uh, within the county. And I quote, the greater, Williamsburg, the greater Williamsburg area is driven by tourism. Many people travel to this historic area to unwind, relax, enjoy life as it was in colonial times, while absorbing the many historic artifacts available through the, the triangle. People find that relaxation as they enter the area. The tree-lined rural vista along I-64 begins the process to unwind the weary traveler seeking a gentler, quieter venue. With the health of this area, the economic drivers of tourism and sheer beauty that unfold for the visitors and residents alike are retained. We're talking about that tree-lined rural vista along I-64 in this application. Your decision is not one of accepting or rejecting. This needs to go back for recycle. You need to spend time, the, the county planning needs to spend time looking at the A1 zoning and understand what it is we want to build there. And by right is not a bad solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert, Robert Kine, Robert Kine. Mr. Kine. No? Um, okay, thank you. Robert, Robert Kine, K-I-N-E. Oh, um, I'll move on to the next person while we're, while we're waiting. Um, uh, Kathy Stewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Kathy Stewart, and I reside at 2937 Forge Road. We, my husband and I, Greg, live on a small farm where we raise grass-fed beef and commercial cut flowers for the local community. We are not against landowners developing their land. When we purchased our land almost a decade ago, it was a pasture. We built a garage, a house, an equipment shed, a chicken coop or two, and a whole lot of fence to contain a few head of cattle. We also set about planting a few hundred shrubs and almost a thousand peonies that will go into full production this year. In other words, we developed our A1 zone general agricultural use land according to the zoning ordinances that apply to A1 general agricultural use land here in James City County. Keeping that in mind, we are not here tonight at this proceeding because the Hazelwood family is asking to develop their land according to its current zoning ordinances. We are here because the family is asked to rezone multiple parcels of land, of which, to some debate, uh, half of it is currently zoned A1 general agricultural use, just like ours, and half is zoned B1 general business use. Because my time is limited, I'm not to, going to focus on the rezoning of the B1, even though it is part of this joint request. For the record, I have no objections to the dozens of buy right development options available on the B1 zone property. I fully support landowners' rights to develop their land according to its applicable zoning ordinances. Neither do I have time to address the dozens of options researched and put into a workable, um, approved 2014 strategy for rural economic development that was designed to assist agricultural landowners in making their land more economically viable. My concern here tonight is the rezoning of the approximately 166 acres of fully forested A1 general agricultural use land. This agricultural land is not being farmed per se, as you would think. It's, it's forested which is also part of being agricultural land, but it's not a vision of land that's being farmed currently. This represents just over 50% of the 320 acre project that will include the approval of unnecessarily premature and permanently attached special use permits that would allow for 3.22 million square foot of warehouse industrial and office use, plus up to 75,000 square feet of commercial use. If you vote yay tonight, just so 
I'm clear that takes 166 acres of agricultural zoned A1 property that's fully forested and upon your signature makes it available for 3.22 million square feet of warehouse, industrial, office, and up to 72,000 square feet of commercial use. That is a big change in character. And this is all located at the entrance to James City County along what I believe the um, uh, comp plan designates as a community character corridor, open agricultural. I believe that's correct. In addition, this proposal references an extremely narrow environmental impact report done over six years ago. It studies one rare orchid and states numerous limitations to the scope of its application. I asked the board to carefully consider this lack of a serious evaluation of the environmental impact of this rezoning before you consider voting yay tonight. And it is my understanding that water concerns have not been evaluated at all. How can we approve an SUP for water and sewer utilities for an unknown, unspecified demand that can't be evaluated? I'm extremely passionate about agriculture, express, especially our local James City County agricultural resources. Once they are gone, they are gone for good. I respectfully request that at this time you each vote nay on this rezoning project due to the lack of an adequately supported and documented compelling reason for doing so. Thank you all for your thoughtful consideration of this matter. Thank you, Mr. Michelle, Michelle Eardley. Hello, my name is Michelle Eardley and I live on Forge Road in Tolano. My husband and I are homeowners on A1 land just trying to go about our lives and get by. We elect our county representatives to watch out for us and to be good stewards of the land in regarding to planning. Therefore, we're relying on you to make good decisions that will benefit the citizens as we carry on with our own jobs and daily lives. I'm coming to you today respectfully to ask you to make a decision about what has been presented to you here today. As it is written, I ask that you deny approval for the master plan, again, as it's written, or that you refer it back to the Planning Commission because the package is just too open-ended. Upper James City County is the gateway into our beautiful, unique, historic community. There's no turning back from the changes to our landscape that are being proposed here. I'm concerned about the potential damage that such a wide open proposal can cause to our community. I do accept the fact that as shown on the map on display, which you can't see, but <laughs> um, you've seen it earlier, um, that half of the 328 acres are already zoned B1 and so our zone for development with around, I've heard maybe around 70 options already in the guidelines for development. I'm okay with that. I'm perfectly okay with the homeowners, the, the, the landowners being able to sell it and, and make a profit. I, I, would, I want them to be able to do that. I just want you all to decide on what is um, a very responsible decision for the community as a whole. So I ask that you strike a healthy balance between possible development and protecting the rural aspects of our community. One of many concerns that I have is the water usage factor of this proposal. The master plan and the SUP requests are left wide open for possible uses that require would require a huge demand for water of unknown proportions. 
Textile plants, for example, require an immense amount of water to produce their products. Considering the landowner's open-ended requests, how could an assessment of water usage and its effect on residents' access to water have been done properly? Surely it's well known that the water that JCC residents tap into is of limited supply, as was mentioned earlier. Private wells take from that same aquifer as the county, and it's unknown how many of us actually use our own wells. There's an, there is already a limit on how much water can be drawn from the aquifer. How will our wells be affected by this development? Will this lead to rationing for everyone because of a drop in our water levels? Will it cause those of us with wells to need to literally dig deeper just to access water? Is this good zoning practice? And is it beneficial to the general welfare of the public when you cannot properly assess how our water supply will be affected? We rely on you, our honorable supervisors, to make wise planning decisions that are good for the county, that are for the good of the county as a whole. Please deny, defer, or refer this application back to the Planning Commission to address the problems presented by me and by other citizens here today. As someone else aptly said, rezoning is not a real estate marketing tool. So please consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask, folks, we're about halfway through this, uh, this stack of, of comment cards, and uh, um, I appreciate the very restrained and, and uh, appropriate way in which people are, are responding, but if I could ask you to hold off on, on applause after each speaker, that would, that would be helpful. Uh, Jen Cumming? Jen, Jen, Jenna, I'm sorry. Good evening, board members. My name is Jenna Cumming. I live at 100 Lakeview Drive off of Forge Road in Toano. Move this up a little bit. I'm kind of tall. <laughs> um, I am so proud to be a homeowner in beautiful rural Upper James City County. Um, I also want to say that I'm proud to have you guys representing me. Um, you guys are listening to a lot of stuff tonight. <laughs> There's people talking and talking and talking. Um, and I thank you for your service to myself and to our citizens, genuinely. I appreciate the time the hours of work and the huge responsibility that falls on you all. I'm coming to you this evening to ask that you would help protect the rural character of our county by creating a balance, as other people have mentioned, between development and protecting our community's character. Um, I emailed some concerns to you all a few weeks ago. Thank you to those of you who responded. Um, it is a stated goal of the county's comprehensive plan um, that you will be good stewards of the land in our county. As was mentioned earlier, um, and you were given percentages, preservation is a high priority as per the survey, and we rely on you to carry that out. Um, an approval of this application will likely have an undesired domino effect that I think we really need to consider. Whatever gets approved for the Hazelwood Farm will be relied upon by other farm or owners as well. This would mean unrestrained growth and overgrowth in the upper county. And we're relying on you to make sure that this does not happen. Once the first area is rezoned, others will follow. The properties adjacent to this property that fall along Route 30 and across from the property are already listed on the JCC economic development page as for sale. One of those properties extends all the way down to Stonehouse Industrial Park. The property across from the Toano Industrial Park is already up for rezoning. Some of the property owners at Anderson's Corner have also put their properties into the PSA. So this means that from Barnes Road into Toano, the domino effect is already set to take place. Um, I really feel like I'm having deja vu from a few years ago with regards to the Oakland development. 
Um, I feel like there's the same people here on both sides that are arguing for um, what they believe is to be right. Um, know that waiting in the immediate wings is 218-acre Taylor Farm that's located at um, Anderson's Corner area in Tawano. That, I'm sure, we will be here, um, if not soon, again. Uh, following essentially the same approach as the Hazelwood farm owners, the other local farm owners have lobbied for their property to be designated an economic opportunity land use area and to be placed in the PSA. It must be anticipated that whatever is approved for the Hazelwood farm will set the example and the president for other farm owners in support of development as well. Thus, the previously identified adverse impacts on tra traffic, water usage, noise, noise, air quality, the environment, all of the things that everyone is listing will be compounded overall um, and continue the permanent loss of the rural character um, in the upper James City County. There's a map on uh, the board and in your packet, and you can see um, the A1 zoned areas of upper James City County in dark green. The Hazelwood property is shown in light green um, near the top and center, and you can see that parcel by parcel, our natural landscape is being rezoned and developed. My question is, when does this end? Once again, I thank you for your service to our community and for your time, and I pray that you will carry out the right decision for our community and our beautiful rural land. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Donald Previsch. Good evening. Um, my name is Donald Previsch. I live at 211 Old Stage Road. Thank you all for your time this evening. Um, I own four acres on Old Stage, and the majority of that acreage is yard, which I, any of my neighbors that are here now can tell you that I keep very well mowed. Um, my driveway is two driveways down from Leisure Road, which borders the Hazelwood Farm. Um, from the edge of my yard, it is less than a football field to the Hazelwood property, and it's only 200 yards from the rocking chair on my front porch. Um, I can look across the field and see the traffic coming off the interstate and crossing over the bridge out on Route 30. This project affects me directly along with the people of Leisure Road as well as the travelers on Old Stage Road. So I hope you can understand why this project is a huge concern for me. I mentioned at the first meeting that uh, when I was 12 years old, I worked at the Shell Station on the corner of Old Stage Road and Route 30, which at the time was Interstate Texaco. That was over 40 years ago. I don't remember Sam Hazelwood, but I'm sure at some point I met him because his house still sits on the opposite corner from the gas station. From the age of five, I have lived in James City County, and the best memories of my childhood took place on Old Stage, Mary Oaks Lane, and Leisure Road, where I spent my summers at the pool at Twin Oaks Campground, which is now Upper County Park. I absolutely love this end of the county. I have several friends that have migrated from the other side of the county and built homes here because they wanted to get out to the country. I'm here this evening because in all the meetings we have, on our own, endless hours of research, we just cannot find a legitimate need for this type of project. Um, I took a drive down the street a half a mile to Stonehouse Commerce Park, and what I discovered were multiple vacancies and land for sale. When you enter the Commerce Park from the back off of Six Mount Zion Road, the first huge building on the left is for lease. Big, empty building. Directly across the street, is a piece of property with a great big for sale sign, for sale. Next to that is a huge building with another big sign, for lease. As you leave the Commerce Park and come out to 30, across the street, huge sign, for sale. At the entrance of the Commerce Park to the right, another huge sign, for sale. It's been there for years out there on Route 30. Since the Commerce Park was built, there have been several large companies that have come and gone, such, John, such as John Deere and Lumber Liquidators. Water and sewer are readily available, but it does not extend down towards this proposed project. With land for sale, large commercial buildings already built, and the ease of access to the interstate, you would think companies would be actively building or occupying the current spaces available there. Scattered all over the county, you can find land for sale, space for rent, lease, or buy but they do not have direct access to exit 227 in James City County. That's supposed to be a big selling part, a big appeal of this project. If I put the master plan for Stonehouse Commerce Park and the Hazelwood project side by side, I see them as being very similar. 
but with the advantage of Stonehouse having established streets, water, sewer, and still having the same easy access to I-64, why is Stonehouse Commerce Park still have so many vacancies and land for sale? So, uh, so why are we being told that exit 227 is a perfect spot for economic development? We have been shown a master plan or basically a concept drawing of what they intend to build. Drawings of concept cars come out every year and they look amazing but almost never get built. And if they do, it's a shell of the initial drawing that is shown to the world. This master plan drawing shows me new streets, traffic circles, ghost buildings, and on what's, what was sprawling farmland and forest. Basically, it's very similar to what's a half a mile up the street. Question. Why is this project more appealing and going to be more successful than Stonehouse Commerce Park? What's the expected tax revenue that all these new businesses will bring to the county? How, is, how much is this project going to cost the taxpayers for infrastructure modifications? How will this project affect the environment? There are so many other questions that cannot be answered accurately because we have no idea what will, we be, what will be built and who the customer will be. I look at the Board of Supervisors to make intelligent and accurate decisions for the citizens of James City County, and I especially look to the representative of my district to make smart decisions for the people that voted for them to represent. There have been several board members that have been gracious with their time and listened to our concerns outside of this building, and we overwhelmingly thank you for it. If you approve this project today, it's based on a feeling and which, of what you think may happen. Feelings do not equal facts. It was only late last year most of the county found out about this project, and many, many more are just recently finding out about it. Between COVID and the Christmas holidays, we have had very little time to get a grip on the massiveness of this project. If approved, you will change the, the county forever, Ms. Previs, as I stated. Thank you very time's much. Experience. Thank you. Robin Morrissey. Robin Morrissey. Um, Maureen Anderson. Thank you. No, I'm afraid not. Um, has, has that letter been sent to us? I would go next. All right. Um, I suppose if there's somebody who, who has not spoken, that would be okay. Uh, would you mind giving your name and address as well as uh, Ms. Anderson's? Yes, my name is Melanie Croft. I lived at 9090 Barnes Road. So I am directly affected by all of this. Uh, and, I'm and going Ms. to read. Ms. Anderson. Yes. So I'm reading this on her behalf. Okay. Her, her address is 7849 Church Lane in Tuano. Thank you. She said, I, Maureen Anderson, am a local farmer and businesswoman, created the Tuano Open Air Market in response to the closing of Williamsburg Farmers Market. Held entirely out of doors, our market was able to meet the needs of both local farmers who needed an outlet for themselves, for their sales, excuse me, and consumers who quickly discovered shortages on store shelves and were apprehensive about public indoor spaces. In the fall of 2020, we moved the operation to the green at Tuano Station at 7849 Richmond Road and currently boasts 25 full-time producer vendors. I have been amazed, especially after the reopening of Williamsburg Farmers Market, at the excitement and support of people from not only James City County, but Virginia Beach, Richmond, and beyond, and they shop regularly with us. As we like to say, there are no supply chain shortages at the farmers market. Our market is living proof of what can be done with green space and I would like to propose that the board consider keeping at least the 166 acres currently zoned A1 as is. Our current on ongoing supply chain issues demonstrate a need for communities to band together to provide for each other's needs locally. 
Are you willing to practice good zoning decisions in order to help meet this need? I came to this board in 2017 with a proposal of how such a space could be used for agritourism education and attracting students of all ages from around the county, excuse me, from around the country, just as Colonial Williamsburg does. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Clement. My name is Stephen Clement, 2477 Forge Road. I've lived on Forge Road for 52 years. And uh, I was a geology professor at William & Mary for 32 years. What concerns me greatly about this project is water uh, and the use of water and the protection of what little water we have. The sedimentary rocks that we depend upon, the Yorktown Formation and other formations, start up around Richmond and where they butt up against the Richmond granite up, up at, at the falls of the James. And so our drinking water mostly is coming from that, those particular sloping formations that are coming from down toward Richmond, down toward Pocosin. And if maybe you remember a few years ago, Salt water was beginning to encroach in Pocosin's water supply. It was getting worse and worse and worse as we used up more fresh water coming in, so the salt water began coming up the aquifer. And that will continue. Uh, so we have to protect our, our, our water supply. Of course, it's being replenished by rain and, and things of that sort, but largely, these projects, like this project that is proposed, probably will be dealing with wells, or thank goodness, the, the housing s system, the, pro the proposed, what, 200 houses or so on, each with a well and a septic system, it couldn't be worse for the water supply of the peninsula. Uh, whether it's, whether it's in by the pipe from, from a big well somewhere or individual little wells. It couldn't be worse for the peninsula. And so, you know, the proposed project here, they don't specify what kind of businesses. We don't know whether they have very toxic chemi chemicals to get rid of. We don't know how much water they're going to need. Um, it sounded as though a couple of things were mentioned just sounded very nasty, uh, and the whole thing just sounds out of place for our very limited water supply. I'm sure probably a good portion of the people here live off of well water, and I know many people I, on Forge Road, many people have had to dig a deeper well or put a pipe further down because the water supply dropped and drops and drops. And it's that way all over the place. So I'm, I don't see any reason at all to uh, accept this proposal with, its, with so little information available, uh, what they plan to do. And of course, we all know one foot in the door, and it starts the whole thing. They get a little bit in, and then you ask for more, and then you bring in a bigger, a bigger uh, project that is going to hurt our environment even more. So I'm very, very proud to live in James City County and been in, as I said, Forge Road forever, and I'd hate to leave it, but uh, we just can't have this uh, polluting our very vital natural resource or the potential of polluting it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gerard uh, Denyon. Good evening. My name is Gerard Denyon. I live at 142 Quaker Meeting House Road. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of uh, concerned, uh, con uh, York, concerned citizens of, of, of uh, York County. Uh, and I'm speaking also on behalf of my daughters and grandchildren who live in James City County. My property happens to abut 
James City County, and of course we draw from the same aquifer as, as folks as, uh, in, in this, uh, this county do. Uh, there's a common expression that we've all heard and many of, us have, have, many of us have used often, and that is, at the risk of stating the obvious. We tend to try to avoid stating the obvious for the obvious reasons. But when we do, it's the obvious that sometimes is overlooked and then becomes, or can become, critical. I've done that many times in my life and have been embarrassed sometimes and found myself at the short end of stick. What's obvious in this gathering here tonight is that this is the epitome of democracy in action. Democracy, representative democracy at the local level. It doesn't get any closer to the people than that. And it's obvious that local government representatives who are closest to the people will be most in touch with their needs and their wishes. And it stands to reason that local representatives will also be most responsive to the will of the people. Now there's a paper written by, uh, I believe, uh, Linda Rice, or at least she put it together, with uh, uh, friends of R rural Toano. I believe you have a, a copy of that. I've read that paper and she's nailed it. She cites chapter and verse about the clearly expressed will of the people in James City County and the efforts to undermine their will in the, main, in the name of greed by a few residents and developers. The logic she used in putting it all together is irrefutable. In a court of moral law, she'd win hands down. This is not a court of moral law where right always uh, triumphs over might. And democracy is an admittedly imperfect mechanism. But at the very core of our democratic republic, there lies a, a single sacred principle, and that is individual liberty. Individual liberty is based on indi individual rights. I trust you'll agree with me that individual rights, um, a citizen rather, a, a democracy can only exist when one individual's rights are the same, equal to every other citizen's rights. When some citizens have greater rights based on their wealth or their political connections, democracy breaks down very, very seriously. As people, we're prone to make mistakes. When we do, we need to admit them, own up to them, and fix them. Mistakes have been made by various elements in James City government over the past years regarding this development. These mistakes, I believe, need to be corrected. And you have an opportunity tonight, I believe, to fix those, or at least begin fixing those mistakes. I would urge you to reject the rezoning application and the special use permit application. Thank you for your consideration tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mitchell Foos. Hello, my name is Mitch Foos. I live at 8850 Mary Oaks Lane. And I have two full pages of brilliant discourse. Unfortunately, all my ideas have been stolen. So <laughs> I'm just going to wing it and uh, talk about my experience and what I've learned the last week in spending time canvassing the neighborhoods. I made it a point to go door to door to door to door in my neighborhood and in nearby neighborhoods talking with the people who live here. And almost unanimously, everyone is against the rezoning and the special use permits. We've chosen to live in a rural environment because it's our chosen way of life. And there's really not a whole lot of rural environments left in James City County. And so I'm just begging you, please represent the people who are going to be impacted by this project and denying the special use permits and the rezoning. It needs to get sent back to the Planning Commission and reimagined into something that's actually going to be a blessing for the community and not a curse. Um, I won't take any more of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Foose. Um, can I? <laughs> uh, Darcy Tucker. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, um, I'm Darcy Tucker. I'm at 218 Skimino Road, Williamsburg. 
Um, I am in York County, and I'm here on behalf of the board of the Conserve York County Foundation. We are a new 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to smart growth in York and the historic triangle. Um, we believe in compliance with the established comprehensive plans, co cooperation between the jurisdictions within the historic triangle, and the repurposing of empty properties while protecting woods and farmland. We believe that residents should have a larger say in the future of their own communities than developers who won't live with the results of their work, and that elected officials represent the people who elected them, not developers. And while I'm a, uh, currently a resident of York County, I've lived in both James City County and the city of Williamsburg. This is a region, as you know, with borders so intertwined that in a trip across town, one goes from one jurisdiction to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and so development decisions in each jurisdiction um, affect the residents of the others. Um, as Mr. Trant said, Tawano is the gateway to James City County. It's also the gateway to our historic triangle. And all of us in the region will be affected by the increased traffic on I-64 and by the effect on the water table, among other things. Rural land in that region has value. It draws tourists here. And tourism is one of the main stays of our economy in this region. It creates jobs thereby. It provides natural habitat, mental health benefits to the residents. It protects the Chesapeake Bay. And many of the residents um, who you're hearing from tonight made the largest investments of their lives when they bought their homes in Tawano. They chose that area because of its rural nature, and this proposed development would forever debase the quality of life that they have in that area through traffic, noise, light, etc. In the past two years, residents of the historic triangle have suddenly awakened to the fact that our rural land is being systematically rezoned to allow the destruction of woods and farmland while vast swaths of existing commercial space lie vacant. And tonight's example is Hazelwood Farms. Let's be clear, this application is about increasing the monetary value of this property, presumably, so that it can be sold. And Mr. Trant said that the plans that they have put before you would assure architectural standards, traffic patterns, et cetera. But if they sell that land, how will those design standards and traffic standards be enforced? Uh, what's being done is rezoning, not um, the approval of those design elements. A nearly identical trust us scenario was sold to the York County Board of Supervisors in 2006 for the Marquis Shopping Center at 199 and 64. The same promises, but 15 years later, the commercial elements have fled. They're being replaced by high density, traffic clogging residential development while taxpayers are left holding the bill. Trust us, they said. Well, it's true that owners do have the right to use their property according to its current zoning. That is absolutely true. Nobody is entitled to a rezoning simply because they decide it would be more convenient for them. And as has been said, rezoning should not happen unless um, it aligns with the comprehensive plan. And this proposal as written does not align with the comprehensive plan for all the reasons stated. Rezoning, as you know, is a major decision. Once property is rezoned, it virtually can't be undone. It's almost never undone. The decision to assign this property A1 zoning resulted from decades of review, thousands of hours of citizen engagement, and multiple comprehensive planning efforts. A decision to rezone from A1 requires more than empty promises free from accountability. It requires a compelling benefit to the community, taking into account environmental, traffic, financial, and citizen concerns. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the applicant has not made a compelling case to rezone, nor have they made a compelling case to be the recipient of blank checks passing the risk on to the residents and taxpayers of James City County. So as have so many others this evening, I ask you to either deny or send this application back to the Planning Commission so that all of the questions that have been raised can be answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sharon Oakley. Good evening. My name is Sharon Oakley, and I live at 18555 uh, Route 30 
uh, has various names, New Kent Highway, uh, Stage Road. And I have been studying the traffic issues on this corridor for several years now. So I'm going to be laser focused on the 944 number proffer that we've been hearing about so, so frequently in this process. I fully understand that the planning staff report <coughs> discusses Kimberly Hoyner and Associates review and that VDOT has approved it. It's important to note that VDOT approving a traffic impact analysis is focused on ensuring that the purported impacts are within their guidelines, but VDOT does not look at the input land use codes to verify their appropriateness with the land use plans. The staff planning report states that this proffer is in place, that the Enterprise Center will not exceed 944 peak PM hour trips based on the ITE trip gen manual at the time of each site plan approval for the development of the property. Peak hour trips will be calculated and submitted with each development plan for the property." End quote. However, the plan that they are asking for approval of tonight means that these future site plans and their theoretical traffic impacts will only be seen and approved by the staff with no notice to the public and no oversight by the community, the planning commission, or this board. And Brief digression, which will be the rest of my time, to illustrate why this is so concerning. The 944 number does not math. <laughs> um, so the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual lies out hundreds of codes, 13 of which are specific to industrial uses, including warehouse, light, industrial, etc. Each code identifies an estimated number of daily trips per thousand square feet of space, as well as a ratio for peak AM and PM traffic hours. There is a wide variation in these estimates, a data center, very low traffic, an Amazon warehouse, high traffic. When you do the math backwards, starting with 944 as a peak PM hour proffer, there are almost no uses that fit. You cannot have 3 million square feet and match an IT land use code. <laughs> There's only maybe one, and that's a few and far between. The traffic impact analysis used code 150, which is specifically for long-term warehousing only. Nowhere were any of the codes for industrial parks or light industrial use used. So if we look at those codes and what that traffic generates, where do we end up? Long-term warehousing generates 1.74 trips per thousand square feet times 3 million square feet, 5,220 trips a day, roughly what is in the traffic impact analysis. Interestingly, this is the lowest number possible. Light industrial generates 4.96 daily trips per thousand square feet, times 3 million square feet is 14,880 trips a day. A high cube warehouse, such as the Walmart Distribution Center on Route 60, generates 8.1 trips per thousand square feet, times 3 million square feet is over 24,000 trips a day. If we use just the mean, just the industrial section of the pros project, could generate well in excess of 15,000 trips, not the 4,659 stated in Exhibit 6-1 of the traffic impact analysis. Looking at general light industry code 110 in the ITE, the peak PM traffic would be 1,890 vehicles an hour, roughly one car every two seconds. This is well over double the 944 they are proffering, which will only be enforced by the staff. No slight to our current staff, we have no idea who the staff will be here in five to 10 years as these plans are being approved. I haven't even gone into all of the other parts of this plan and all of the additional traffic those generate. In conclusion, while this PM peak hour proffer sounds nice, there have been other proffers in the past in this county that have gone unenforced and cost the county both financially and in quality of life for the residents. Please deny or defer this rezoning until further independent studies can be done and stronger enforcement measures put in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dave Osman. Hello, Dave Osmond. Uh, two addresses, 8904 Thomas X Court and 101 Leisure Road, uh, Tawana, Virginia. Um, my wife and I moved here 30 years ago uh, from Chesapeake. We, uh, as we moved uh, from Chesapeake, we were looking for a more rural place to live. And we started in Hampton. There was too much going on there. Moved up to Lee Hall and finally settled on James City County. It's beautiful, it's rural, and we want to keep it that way. Um, we built our house in 1999 in Meadow Lakes. Uh, we then built an adjacent property, or bought an adjacent property on 101 Leisure Road, which is directly across from the uh, land that we're talking about. Um, 
I think that the main thing, are, or my main concerns, are getting to what's already been brought up, uh, the traffic concerns, the water quality concerns, the light pollution, and also the noise pollution. Um, you know, there's, there's just some things there that just need to be really looked at, uh, re-evaluated, gone back to the Planning Commission. Um, and, and also, I think the main thing here, if you really ask yourself, are these four conditions met on the rezoning, uh, is it a pub public necessity? It is not. Uh, is there a convenience involved? There is not. Is there a general welfare not for the James City County residents? And is it a good zoning practice? Well, it's already zoned B1 and A1. Let's just leave it as is. B1 is fine. A1 is the agricultural side of it. It protects that land, that wooded area, um, and just leave it the way it is. Uh, it does not need to be uh, rezoned to ec economic opportunity. Uh, so I ask that you do reject uh, the proposal tonight, uh, or at least send it back to the Planning Commission for uh, more study. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura Christian. Laura Christian, uh, Donna Tierney, Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Donna Tierney. I reside at 3014 Forge Road. Um, I am reading a letter that was written by Sarah Nelson, who resides at 218 Louise Lane in Tuano. Thank you. I am nearly a lifelong resident of Williamsburg JCC and have resided in the Tuano area for the last 16 years. As a mother of two, the wife of a small business owner and a healthcare professional who treats pediatric patients, I am very concerned about the potential health, environmental, and other risks of a new industrial park in our immediate area. I live off of Old Stage Road and own an additional land nearby on Mount Laurel. So these developments directly impact my family and my investments. My husband's business is also just down Route 60 from the proposed development. After reviewing the site proposal, my concerns include, but are not limited to, increased noise, traffic, air, and well water pollution, uh, undue strain on our local and already understaffed and overworked services such as waste disposal, storage, and processing, water usage and processing, transportation needs, energy usage, and maintenance, among others. Destruction of natural areas that provide valuable resources, habitats, and maintain the beauty and value of our area, impact on housing and land values also. I am concerned with the impact on our Tawano small businesses. There are many small and or family-owned businesses in Norwich, Tawano, and Lenexa that would suffer as a result of this development. In addition, I have noticed with many of the industrial development sites around town over the past decade, the intent is to fill them with desirable and popular businesses. However, many large spaces are now vacant and often remain so for many years as unneeded and unfrequented businesses go under and relocate. Would it be more prudent to try to fill in the gaps around town and more needed resources rather than un, uh, upending an entire community with more stores and unappealing industrial parks? I have also reviewed your proposal and found that justification for many of the mitigated points suggests reasonable 50-foot uh, easements, 100-foot barriers to preserve neighboring areas. Huh? What? Unfortunately, this is not the only problem that I noticed with your mitigated areas of concern, and most of the solutions seems highly simplified. Please reconsider the industrial and economic development of this area. If that is not entirely possible, an alternative and more amenable use of this area would be preferred. Such, uh, such a site could be for adult vocational education, retraining community agricultural initiatives, or sites for small and local businesses that can preserve as much of the green space and existing resources as possible. Please maintain the beauty and character of, of our part of town. 
you would be destroying much of the draw that is bringing people to this area and certainly causing more harm than good. Thank you for your consideration. And this is from Sarah Nelson, who is a speech and language, uh, language pathologist here in town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amy Foos. Good evening, Amy Foose, 8850 Mary Oaks Lane. Um, I'm going to be reading a letter from John Lockwood of the New Kent Board of Supervisors who couldn't be here tonight. Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the James City County Board of Supervisors, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening, although I may not be here in person. While I can appreciate all the work the Hazelwood family and their team have done to date, I am still very concerned that the traffic situation will be worsened, not improved. This is not a problem for, this is not just a problem for the residents of James City County, but also for the residents of New Kent County that use this corridor on a daily basis. It would appear that the traffic engineers opted for the trip generation baseline for warehousing when calculating trip generation for the Enterprise Center. This trip generation designation is one of the lowest possible codes for calculating trip generation for industrial uses. Since we have no idea what types of businesses will utilize the sites available, I am concerned that the trip count projections offered are grossly understated. There have been mentions at previous meetings that a Walmart or Amazon type fulfillment center could be one of the potential uses. If that were to be the case, the trip generations are definitely understated. That doesn't even take into account the added traffic for the new homes already approved in Stonehouse, the already approved Wendy's, and the already approved Village Center, along with the current daily traffic load. I am concerned that the approximately one mile corridor from Fieldstone Parkway to Old Stage Road will become the next Lightfoot Road traffic debacle. I cannot think of a one mile stretch of road on this end of the county that has four traffic lights as is proposed. Not to mention the dangerous backups that will occur when there is a problem on I-64, which seems to be a more frequent problem each year. I hope that the James City County Board of Supervisors will take a pause and have an independent traffic study conducted before moving forward with this proposal you will only get this one chance to get it right. Sincerely, John Lockwood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Karen uh, Rollins. Karen Rollins. I live at 4481 Palatine Crossing in Williamsburg. That's James City County. And I just learned about this proposal late last week. And Instantly, I thought, this is wrong, totally wrong for Williamsburg. I mean, I live here, as I think a lot of people do. I chose to live here. I didn't always live here. Because it's pretty, and we have a lot of natural land and wildlife. And I think when even tourists come, not only do they come for the touristy things, they like the prettiness. And have you ever driven into a town, and suddenly there's lots of big trucks and then you f maybe somehow learn there's a big warehouse, huge warehouse, huge manufacturing facility. That, to me, is ugly blight. I personally do not want that in Williamsburg. I don't care how you dress it up and say you can make it look pretty. A warehouse is still a warehouse. Manufacturing facility is still a manufacturing facility. And I can think of a lot of other ways to economically develop that would not take so much habitat away from wildlife and not incur trucks coming in and out at all times of the day and perhaps polluting, using up our water resources, polluting chemicals into the air. I mean, and this weekend when I was walking my dogs in my neighborhood, I tried to stop every neighbor I could because I make the whole circuit. And to a person, they were shocked about this and thought, oh, no, we, we can't let that happen. And I have friends all over Williamsburg, um, Queens Lake, you know, Lightfoot, Ford's Colony, 
and I've contacted them, and I wish more of them were here. Some people had to leave, but they're against this too. Ask the citizens if they want this. I don't think most citizens of Williamsburg want it. And I would hope we can be creative enough to come up with other economic development plans that will play into the beauty and the tourist. I have some ideas in my head. Anyway, I think I've said enough. Please vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you. I have. I have another card for um, uh, Mr. Osmond. Um, there's not a, a junior or senior, is there? <laughs> is this just a duplicate? Okay, thank you. Great. <laughs> uh, Sharon Dennis. Okay. Well, then that is the last of the cards. Uh, oh, Mr. Kine. Oh. oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Brock uh, Kegai? No, Regai, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Regai? I'm, I'm Brock Regai from uh, uh, so I'm Briar Lane down in Lightfoot, uh, 123 Briar Lane, Williamsburg, Virginia. I've worked in, um, in the, this, this region in the environmental field for about 20 years two years and seen a lot of uh, impacts from um, development, developed properties. So uh, I, I have to admit, I don't know much about the, the current situation, and, um, but I do know that the, I think that if, we in, if you accept the uh, proposed rezoning, that the watershed below this property would have greater uh, probability of being impacted in a uh, mo in a more adverse way than uh, the regular zoning and and or special permit. So I, my only comment is really just to kind of maybe take some more time about looking at that kind of the differences between the current zoning probability for impacts versus the uh, proposed um, zoning and have some a good idea of what that difference might be and a, a way to try to just mitigate sure that the lower watershed and wetlands surrounding the area are protected. Um, so I guess my comment would just be to uh, maybe prolong the, the or not, re not reject it fully, but maybe just research a little bit more and try to figure out and say, do the best we can for the streams and wetlands below it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rega. And that, I believe, is the last uh, speaker card, and so I will close the public hearing. Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, could, uh, could we take a, a, a five-minute We've been at it for three hours, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We will we'll take a recess. <laughs>
order. First, let me just um, uh, express, uh, on behalf of the board, uh, appreciation, appreciation for uh, the respectful way in which uh, you all have uh, uh, spoken and listened tonight. Uh, we know it's been a long evening and, and appreciate the uh, detailed comments uh, and uh, your attention to, to everything that was going on. Um, we are going to now go into an opportunity for members of the board to um, raise any issues or questions that they might have uh, uh, of staff or of the applicant. And uh, I'll just ask who would like to begin that process. I'll begin if you don't. Okay. Try okay. Um Let me start with a couple of questions for the applicant, if I can, Mr. Trent. Your um, This, this, this development, re refresh my memory, public, public or private roads? It would be a, uh, a combination of public roads. Okay. The, uh, the, the, if you're talking about the entrance to the project, that would be off of Old Stage Road. That's a public road that would be rebuilt essentially from the intersection at Route 30 to Leisure Road. And that, that part now. How about the the internal roads, the one, ones that come into it? That is that all going to be private roads? The there would be private drive aisles, as you might imagine, yeah. inside the shopping, inside the commercial center. But the uh, spine road that would go through the industrial park would be built as a public road. Okay, that, so that would be a, a VDOT accepted road. <clears throat> um, the second question I had for you was. There are areas where that spine road crosses uh, wetlands. Um, and I'm curious as to um, what the plan is, or, uh, and maybe, maybe I'll defer part of this to staff, but I'll, I'll let you answer first, um, how those connections will be done. Will, it be, will, they, will they be built as bridges, or is there um, a plan to make the earthen dam, you know, and do it that way. Uh, I mean, we've seen both approaches on, on things that come before us, but that's not spelled out. Can you give me any greater uh, um, information about how those connections would be over the wetlands? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> for, for most development projects, as I, I know you're aware, in Ford's Colony, where you live, the road networks, uh, they're private there, uh, cross wetland uh, uh, and ravine systems in order to access developable areas. So it, it's a pretty common impact associated with developments, um, certainly larger developments, you know, that are 300 acres. Some of the most uh, flat and, um, and developable land f fronting on the interstate, you know, adjacent to the interstate is, uh, is in that back section where it might be suitable for some of the very large economic development users and meet some of the specific site selection criteria that uh, VEDP uh, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership wrestles with it. It's hard to find those those sites. So, uh, yes, to access those, there would be wetland impacts. Um, it, it, I don't know that I've been affiliated with a zoning project that had done the um, the road design that typically comes later. So, um, uh, it would be unique to have done a road design uh, f for a project that hasn't been approved through the zoning process yet. Um, the, what I do know is in order to impact wetlands, um, there's a pretty significant mitigation cost associated with that. So if your impacts are over a certain tenth of an acre, I believe it is, you have to mitigate those impacts. And depending on the type of wetlands, which gets worked out through the core and the DEQ review process, uh, depending on the type of wetlands, what the ratio of mitigation is, um, I believe it's two to one typically two to one, and it can be greater depending on the character of the wetlands. So um, so if you're impacting an acre of wetlands for a bridge crossing, you would need to purchase or create two new acres of, um, of, of wetland area to either preserve from a mitigation bank that's created wetlands. Um, anyway, cut to the chase. Th that is very expensive, that wetland mitigation. So there's a real incentive on the part of the developer uh, to minimize those impacts. And so the answer to your question is it will be the style of crossing, whether it's a, a 
bridge structure or culvert structure or an earthen structure that has the least environmental impact because that's going to drive down the cost. And then my last question for you guys, uh, clearly the understanding here is that if this gets approved, um, the, uh, the Hazelwoods then have a product that they, they are not planning on developing themselves uh, as, as, a, as the owner to do the actual construction or selling or whatever, that it would be sold off to someone to take care of, of that aspect of marketing the, the property to the various buyers. Is that correct? Um, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, I, that's entirely correct. Let me just explain what, okay. what the Hazelwood's um, you know, perspective is on the project and how they would be inclined to proceed. And, and if I've left something out or not answered your question, please uh, correct me. So the Hazelwoods, uh, and part of what has motivated them to pursue this application now is they do have real estate experience. They grew up in Sam Hazelwood's house. And for those of you who don't know Sam, he was a, a pretty significant uh, real estate entrepreneur, knew a lot about real estate and development, and, and he instilled that in his children just by them being around him. Um, they have, each of them have uh, pursued careers that involve real estate. Debbie uh, Hazelwood Drudge in, in real estate sales, Larry in site work and development. So they get real estate development at a level, a lot of landowners in their same position, a lot of farmers that are, you know, at the end of their career and not able to, you know, continue farming or not. They they do understand real estate development. Um, they would, their idea of how to uh, pursue the development of this property, the disposition of this property would be through, yes, through marketing it, like most projects. You know, for example, the, um, the Newtown project was owned by the Casey family, a number of whom were ministers and, uh, and businessmen, not developers. Um, but they partnered with people through the marketing and sale of the property that had that type of experience um, to ensure that the, uh, the vision of the project through the design guidelines and proffers are fulfilled. And that's sort of how the Hazelwoods would desire to proceed. They do not intend to actually build a warehouse on the property. But they recognize that in order to attract the, the types of users that uh, they've, they've proposed in the project, that they may have to develop some infrastructure and start the project going. Remember the Casey's in, in Newtown uh, had it for sale for a long time and really struggled. I was one of the first tenants in, in, their, in the building. Ultimately, they had to spend their own money, build some of the initial roads and infrastructure, built the first building, the SunTrust building, now Truist building, where we took the third floor. Um, that was, uh, they had to make that investment to get, and then after that, Newtown came alive. So Hazelwoods are, are prepared to do that as a part of the, the development project. Does that answer? That answers my question. Thank you, sir. I've got a couple. Um, I know in just after I got on the board in 2014, the Hazelwoods came to this board. <clears throat> it's made up a little different than it is now, but came to this board and and basically brought this, not a plan for, but their idea of what they wanted to do. And we want to work with staff, and we want to spend time with staff. We've heard a lot tonight that we just knew a few months ago. Well, you know, the, the, it was in a public forum that they brought this forward and said, this is, what do we need to do? How can we work? What can we do with this land? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, this is not something I've heard the, the 60, 40, 50, 50, and this is in, this is out. We're including that, but we're not including this. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm seeing is closer to 60, 40. Um, they're asking for a master plan on this project, on this land, and um, similar, almost in a way like Bush Gardens, but they came in and said, we want to develop this, we want to do this, we want to put this in place. And it's amazing that, you know, a lot of people don't think planning is very important. And it's a key component of planning and knowing what we're gonna get rather than let it go helter-skelter and get whatever comes about. We'll sell this piece of land, they put whatever they want on it, they can add this, they can do that. 
we've asked for this through the county more than one time for developers or anybody else coming into the county that follow our comp plan and staff's recommendations. I mean, staff's recommending this. Um, it's in line with the comp plan. It's, um, you know, we're putting together a master plan so we better know what goes in this area rather than just helter skelter, whatever goes in. They could come back to us in, in a separate time, even if we sp split this and ask for a rezoning on the A1 and get a rezoning on the A1 and, and change it. And then you, now you've got two different components instead of a master plan over the whole piece of land. Um, comp plan, you know, I heard about comp plan in 2015 was in there. Um, and they came to us in 14 and asked about what they could do with that land. Um, if there's any there's there's other statements I'm gonna make, but just see if there's anything else for you right now. No, that's all I have, Tim, for you right now. And, and I appreciate all the hard work that they've done up to this point and working with our staff. But the rest of my comments are not related to you. So when I was remiss in um, my remarks earlier and not acknowledging the work that staff did, I do this type of work all across Virginia, but certainly southeast Virginia. And I, the professional staff in James City County is is up there with the best of them. And in terms of and look, and I mean that in in terms of protecting the county's interests, um, they they are as uh, as difficult, you know, in in bringing the developers to to bear and and to extracting concessions and and to molding an application. As, uh, as any I work with, and, and they're very professional, um, but they're, they're, they're um, just very good stewards of the public trust, I, I would say, in my thank you. opinion. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Trent. Um, I, most of my questions are for staff, but I do have just a question um, for you regarding if this application were to be denied this evening, I'm sure that you've discussed that possibility with your clients. Um, are you at liberty to give us some idea about what would be next steps as far as the property goes, both for that matter? Yes, ma'am. Um, and yes, you are correct. We, we have discussed the you know that un, uh, unfortunate outcome, and the the short answer is that they we would immediately proceed with a buy right. A development plan that would entail a uh, a boundary line adjustment uh, that that's by right to reconfigure the um, the B1 parcels. There's three of them um, to better position uh, the two two of the parcels for better size and location for out parcels, and then uh, the the third would be a residual parcel that would um, probably be proposed for a minor subdivision. Um, that would it, that would be that's the B1 side that would be proposed. Um, you know, those th those changes would be made to, to then market the property for development. And on the A1 side, it, they, they would be proposing um, a buy right subdivision. There's three, three acre lots. Have they been, um, has there been interest shown in the property? There has. I have received a number of calls um, from very credible um, economic development users. I mean, ones that we would like to see. As as I know, the Hazelwoods have seen more and others. But, but I personally have. Um, I'd like to see them come to fruition. You know, they're they're those are um, hard to attract. But w we seem to be in a cycle where there's an interest. Uh, speaking with you know, speaking with um, economic development director for the port, for example, is is called to to be interested in seeing this this come to fruition so that. Um, it could add to the inventory and support the port development. Thank you. Um, can I bump in? Sure. Um, I know Jim's on it now, but um, TPO and PDC, you know, and, and do an evaluation of sites in our area. James City County is very limited, and we're competing across Hampton Roads, and they're looking for site ready sites, not that's a neat piece of woods over there, 
Suffolk has that problem. We got 400 and some acres that is a nice piece of woods, but has nothing that they can do on it right now until they go through this process. And um, and I've been pushing James City County and now Jim is of our sites and what we have. Maybe, maybe it's not 100 acres, maybe it's a 50 acre or 25 acre site, but it's hard to compete with the other jurisdictions around us when we're limited on what sites we do have economically to, to push things forward. Just two cents there for Yes, sir. Ms. Sadler, do you have some questions? Yeah, for just for Mr. Trent, this one question. Um, I believe in my conversations with you in the past, I could be wrong. I've got so much information here. It's, it's wild. Um, I believe in the past that the, um, especially the A1 part has been timbered. Um, it, by right, can that A1 section and the B1 section be timbered if the rezoning didn't take place? Yes, ma'am. It, it, uh, it, it, that timber is, you know, would be managed for, for uh, harvest and, and sale in, in, in accordance with the, the uh, timber management plan that they have in place. Yes, ma'am. All right, and with that then, um, with the um, master plan, I believe I read that some of the existing trees and vegetation would be left in place for buffering? That is correct. Uh, under the proposed master plan, the, um, the, the buffers that are proposed where they are natural are required to remain undisturbed if they have na mature natural vegetation in them. And, and am I correct? And I believe um, in one of our conversations, I heard that the um, this land will no longer be farmed. That's correct. The the, the termination of farming is is not uh, you know a date certain. The the farmer that uh, I believe lives in New Kent that's continued to farm the property um, threatens annually to to retire, but has not done so yet. Um, we're hoping he will continue at least until we can get uh, you know, our, our plan in place. So if, if he retires, then there's no plan to bring other farmers in? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. May I ask a follow up? Sure, sure please uh, do. Thank you. Um, so there's been talk and, and we've received several emails about using that space for agritourism. Uh, <clears throat> farmer's market, um, classroom, uh, just varies. Do the property owners have any interest in pursuing anything like that? Um, fair question. Uh, the um, the suitability of that property for agritourism, I think, is... Um, is low compared to farmland in tr that's truly in the rural lands. In other words, this is inside the PSA, adjacent to an interstate interchange, and uh, and, and designated economic opportunity in the, the county's comprehensive land use plan in Zone B1. Um, it, if you are trying to dispose of uh, of that property in the most you know economically uh, beneficial way that to to reflect the stewardship responsibility they have to their their family and, and to their children um, it, it would be um, it, it, would, it would be a very uh, unwise financial decision to to sell the property uh, for agritourism or to lease it for agritourism um, it would be more valuable for the uses that we've proposed through our development plan um, and that you know I think my humble opinion, I think, you know, that as somebody uh, said in their comments that I, I do think that preserving James City County's rural lands is, is a very important initiative that is spelled out in the comp plan. Um, this is undeveloped, uh, largely business designated property. And, um, and I think it can provide, you know, located at an interstate interchange, um, I think it can be a source of tax revenue for true um, preservation efforts. It could help support, um, you know, the economics of this project could help support, you know, a bond issuance, for example, for PDR funds and those types of projects. Um, so where 
agritourism could be subsidized and uh, and better located in in areas that are you know more suitable to uh, the preservation of of agriculture than at an interstate interchange. Thank you, uh, Mr. Trent. Can I can I ask you a question about um, the um, request that you have in uh, for basically um, each of the land bay or most of the major land bays um, uh, would have a pretty wide range of, of um, potential uses, uh, and I wonder. Again, I, I've, I've asked this this before. Um, what would you imagine, or what would your clients imagine, uh, this site looking like uh, down the road, a, a decade and a half or so? Um, is it going to be uh, a place where that we would expect to see uh, distribution warehouses? Is it a place where we we would expect to see? Uh, Office campuses? Is it a place where we'd expect to see light manufacturing? Um, you know, that's part of what, I, what, what I, uh, I've been trying to, to wrap my head around in terms of this application. Um, what would I be looking at um, in the not too distant future? Trees. No, if I'm in the park. Oh, if you come in the park. Well, um, I'd, I'd actually come in. Right. Yes, okay, you come in. Uh, so uh, the, the answer is trees if, if you're outside the park. Um, uh -huh. And I think the design guidelines, and John Hopkins here to, to speak more to that about uh, the vision, if you wish it. But, no, but I'm, um, not, I'm not talking about the design guidelines. The design guidelines, you know, Mr. Mr. Hopkins is a great architect. He, he does a wonderful job in, in uh, designing buildings that look very attractive. What are those buildings going to be, though? Sure. Um, that's what I'm yeah, really And I guess I, 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 it's all a matter of perspective, but I would respectfully disagree that um, there's, you know, sort of a broad range of uses permitted in the land base. Um, first of all, the uses in those land base are limited by the EO ordinance, right? So um, we can only do what's permitted. And if you look in uh, the list of permitted uses in the EO ordinance, uh, and I don't have it in front of me, but um, it is not a robust and exhaustive list. It's fairly circumscribed among uh, office and industrial uses. And our hope would be that we attract a mix of, of those. Um, and so w what you ask, when you ask what would the park look like, I think we showed some pictures of different buildings and how we would expect them to populate each of those land bays over time. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm, I can tell by your face that I'm not answering your question. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so, so yeah, I, uh, so here's, here's my concern. I mean, you're right that there are limitations on what you can do in the EO zone, but you're also asking for permission to jump over the regulatory um, uh, evaluation of what you're proposing when the, the EOs would ask you to provide an SUP uh, request. Uh, and uh, so I'm trying to figure out, so I've got to try to figure out something about, you know, um, is this going to be a facility that is going to be economically a net positive for the county in the direct and indirect sense? And the direct sense being something that, for instance, provides machinery and tools that, uh, that are taxed uh, by the county uh, for their value, which tends to be a, a real net plus for, for the community and may provide some, some light manufacturing that helps to deal with the supply chain's reliance on overseas manufacturing at this point? Uh, or is it going to be um, a uh, corporate campus that in all likelihood is going to be an office building, probably a multi-story office building with a large number of employees who work at, at uh, computers that probably are not really going to produce anything in the way of machine and tools taxes uh, because of their privileged uh, status, uh, and will require, I would argue, uh, population acceleration because we're a county with a as of December, a 2.5% unemployment rate. And, there's, and certainly it's not the case that I would say uh, we don't want to offer better opportunities for people to advance themselves economically. Uh, but the question is, are we going to be creating a park that is going to have to rely on additional population being generated for the area, which will produce residential growth, not in this parcel, but elsewhere, 
who will need schools and uh, additional park and recreation facilities and the like. Uh, so that so that's why I'm kind of you know, that, that's why I want to have a sense of what the vision is, uh, because without that, it's hard for me to guess what the real financial benefit versus cost would be of this development, what its impact on the community more broadly would be. No, I understand uh, better what, what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that my answer will ultimately be satisfactory uh, to yeah, you. I guess but, we can both guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I will uh, do my best to Thank at you. least tell you the truth, which is uh, all that I can, right. can do. Um, you know, we would all love uh, to see the park populated with manufacturing uh, uses. I mean, the, those, that's right now at least, that is, uh, you know, the, the lottery ticket in economic development, right? I mean, that provides, as you say, good, good employment, uh, high wages typically, um, and, and also uh, has the potential to produce uh, ancillary taxes besides just the real estate tax, but machine and tool tax, for example. Um, and, and we're as contrasted with an office use, as, as you point out, I mean, not um, as as an uh, user and occupant of one of your county's offices. Um, I, uh, I and, and a, a frequenter of the uh, the commercial establishments around it. Uh, I, I would uh, dispute whether there's a, a, an indirect or, uh, economic benefit, or, or as you suggest, potentially potential an economic negative with office uses, I think those can be very economically attractive um, and help support a more diverse um, economy. So uh, I- Fair enough, we, I, I, mean, yeah, I, I know we yeah, can disagree so, on these concerns. I'm just trying to get us, right. I, I hope you understand what my concern here is. It's not, it, it's, it's not so much just you know, that, that we may have different ways of looking at some of these uses, it's just that it's hard for me to envision exactly what the uses would be. What What is your priority? What is it that, that uh, uh, is going to come in here? And, and what kind of protection does the county have against an imbalance uh, in the kind of uh, uh, developments that occur as the pro project goes on? Understood. And just, I mean, this isn't baked into any um, binding requirement, but just candidly what, what what we have said all along we intend to do if we were fortunate to have this project be approved it would be immediately to get with Chris Johnson the county's economic development uh, officer and and to make a trip to Richmond uh, to VEDP and to find out exactly what we need to do to uh, align our marketing efforts to and, and what we need to do to position the property from infrastructure standpoint to attract you know, the, the users that the county is looking for and that VEDP uh, ha, has to, to, you know, on their list of, of prospects. So th that's how we, we, we would intend to proceed. The tighter you circumscribe the uses, which provides greater certainty, I, I understand, um, the more uh, the more difficult it is to, to find those end users. Yeah, I, th I think the, the real, so, so I approach it from, from my angle, what I'm saying is, the more that we, in advance, open the doors beyond what would normally be available, um, the less uh, opportunity we have to evaluate the effect of what's uh, what's going on in the project as it develops. But uh, let, and those ask? are really three. I think Mike, Mike three. You know, those uses just to speak to them. There's textile manufacturing. Um, I, I think one of the speakers. Uh, talked a little bit about maybe Mr. Polster about textile manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, that is listed as a specially permitted use. I, I think it's an antiquated element of the zoning ordinance when EO was developed. You know those you know uses for industrial uses that were by right and, and specially permitted were sort of pulled over from other sections of the ordinance, which date back to the probably the 70s when the ordinance mm -hmm. came into effect. Um, it, it is a much cleaner and, and uh, more acceptable environmentally industry now. All the impacts that would you know make it a specially permitted you know use are. Uh, are, are no longer present in, in my view. Their, their impacts are identical to other manufacturing uses that are by right. Um, the other is machinery, heavy machinery, um, uh, uh, 
service and repair, heavy machinery um, sales, you know, a, a Carter Cat uh, that we have down in um, the Green Mountain Industrial Park or a Lee Bear potentially to, to add to that uh, offering in James City County. Those are the types of, of specialty, so when you're saying, hey, we're, we're stepping over the line looking for more than that would be permitted in the ordinance, I mean, we, we can put, you know, real specificity on what those are. I think it's those three, uh, at least in the, in the industrial uh, section of the park, and, and I would humbly submit they would be uses that we'd all like to see in the county that would produce the types of revenues that, that you're looking for that, you know, that are more attractive to you than, than my, uh, my office uh, use in Newtown. Um, the, the only other thing I would say is, you know, we, for some of those uses, uh, like the heavy machinery um, equipment and sales, you know, those do, in theory, have impacts. You know, we, do you, do you want to look at that? How is that position on the property? But it'll be invisible from the, the outside of the park. You know, it, it, the, the use would be oriented in, on our spine road and, and buffered from view outside the park. So a lot of those, you know, impacts that you're concerned if that were to be located on B1 property um, uh, or uh, EO property on, say, Route 30 are not present in this project. That's how we mitigated the, the impacts that you're worried about. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wyson, can I, uh, I ask you just a, a question or two about about some one of the one of the um, concerns I heard raised uh, several times were uh, uh, about uh, the recency or lack thereof of some of the um, materials that were relied on. Would you like? Would you comment on uh, natural resource um, uh, impacts and uh, on water uh, sure. in particular? What what, what uh, materials we relied on? Yeah. So for any legislative process, the um, a water and sewer impact study has to be submitted as well as the relevant natural resource information. And as part of the legislative review, planning staff did check to make sure that that information was provided. And we are sure to in include the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division to review that material as well as JCSA to review the relevant material. And for this application, um, they've met all the submittal requirements for that and Stormwater and JCSA have signed off on what's been submitted. And, and the um, uh, natural resources examination um, essentially was focused on just the world pagonia, uh, I assume, is it? I believe that was included as an appendix to the CIS. I, I think the applicant might be able to speak more clearly to that. Okay. Um, the ordinance says that if there's endangered species, those have to be shown as part of the assessment. And based on the report, I believe there weren't any endangered species on site that were recognized. Um, so. Happy but, and and the, the, the when was the inventory done? I believe the inventory was done in 2015 and was included as part of the application. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay. Hey, hey Thomas, um, question on on traffic. You know, we're hearing different reports. One is, is going to be so much traffic. The interstate is going to be a better way to go than down Route 60. Um, can can you explain or or Maybe my expert can tell me what we're trying to, you know, because we get a report up here that says instead of 5,000, there's 15,000. I mean, that's three times as much. And, you know, when I backed it up and did this and did that, I came up with. So can you speak a little bit about that? or? I would certainly defer to the uh, traffic yes, consultant sir. to and explain the nitty-gritty. Because they're, they're, it sounds like, they're worried that instead of the 5,600 or so that's going to be out there, I think it was, they're looking at 15,000 and some change. Okay, uh, Dexter Williams, 2319 Sorry. Latham Place, DRW Consultants. I did the traffic study. For Hazelwood Farms, that includes the Village Center as well. That was all done together. Um, <clears throat> the way the traffic study is structured, uh, first of all, we counted what's there, added some growth to that. We also included all the traffic for Stonehouse. But that's in there. That's in there. Because they were saying there's, that's not in there. Well, it's, it is. Okay, great. And we included Moss Creek. Okay, all and right. that wasn't supposed to be in there, uh, but so, it is. So that was our baseline. And then we began to look at it from the point of view, what are the incremental road improvements we can create to support how much development we can have in each one of the, the sections, Village Center, and this section. Um, and 
essentially it was a trade-off between cost of road improvements and getting more trips as opposed to being reasonable about what you think you can afford and balancing that out. Just got to make some judgments about how far you want to go. There are some more extravagant, expensive road improvements that could be made. Uh, what we've gone with is basically a signalized intersection at Route 30 and Old State really controls what you can move in and out of this development. It's all got, almost all of it's got to go through there. Right. So that's the control point for this, this development. We looked at that intersection from the point of view of what, what's practical to put in place. We have to rebuild all of Old Stage Road. There's, there's no u utility to that road whatsoever. Uh, and then when we get the intersection of uh, Route 30, what else do we need? And when we added in all the traffic for build out of the Stonehouse Commercial Park, we had a very heavy volume moving up 30 to the interstate in the, F in the PM. The PM peak hour was the controlling factor. That's typical. So looking at the capacity of what we could put there, including a third lane on Route 30 northbound, in addition to our turn lanes at the intersection, and rebuilding Old Stage Road to six lanes wide at Route 30, necking down to four lanes at the first roundabout, then necking down to two lanes to the roundabout that goes into the Spine Road. That system supported a certain amount of trips. That's the 944 number you're talking about. That, okay. That's been mentioned before, and as the, one of the ladies mentioned, yes, we used um, we used the uh, uh, warehouse trip generation because it is the smallest. Because any greater uh, trip generation rates is going to reduce that square footage, so we're capped by trips, and we backed into it based on what we thought was reasonable for disruption of the neighborhood, for building roads, making improvements, uh, for what's realistic to market to somebody, you put into such a complicated road net where no, nobody understands it, uh, that's not gonna help market the property. So we came up with the, the 944s, the PM peak hour trip capture. Uh, and that, as, as we shift from warehouse to light industrial, those square footages go down. You go down, uh, switch to office. I don't know about office. Office market's about dead as it can be right now. <laughs> that really pushes the, the square footages down. So it's a trade-off. And so um, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a, a distinct possibility that the entire property won't be developed because of that trip cap. But that trip cap is fixed, and each developer has to address that. Uh, as far as what's going to happen, on this property, probably the first developer in has got to do everything on Old Stage Road. It doesn't work any other way. You got to you got to build that realignment all at once. We have to have roundabouts from the get go. The only way to do it is to build all that at once. So that's that's how I envision that this is going to evolve. Uh, and it's the it, the challenge will be to have enough development on the front end to support that much of the investment. Okay. But there's a, there's a cap on this, just like on Village Center. Right. Okay. How long have you been doing this? I uh, started consulting in 1983. I okay. worked for Chesterfield County eight years before that. You've been at 47 much, years. You, you pretty much know what you're doing on that. I've been through a bunch of 20-year plans. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? I, I'm going to ask staff a follow-up on that, on the traffic question. Thank you. Thank you. So there was a... I, I hate to I hate to use the word accusation, but that an accusation that staff would, you know, once this is approved, if it is approved, and this traffic comes to be, there's absolutely no, it, it's just going to go. The there's going to be as many trips as as possible. So, what mechanism, if any, is there in place to assure that doesn't happen? So, based on the materials here, they would be legally required when a site plan comes in to submit a study showing the amount of trips that would go along with that site plan. So we would review that as part of the site plan review and then keep trap, track excuse me, of the number of trips total on the Hazelwood property. And that's the way we make sure it never goes over the 944. And what if you're not here? The next person that gets it, are they going to say, well, oof, no one's going to pay any attention, so I'm going to do, I'm going to allow this much. That would not happen. It's included as part of the case file 
It's essentially part of the zoning. Um, we actually have a similar approach in Stonehouse where those proffers have different triggers for units and we're successfully tracking that, uh, which Mr. Polster alluded to earlier. So there's no chance that um, that would happen. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then can, we have can I ask a, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask a track. No, go ahead, me. ask, go ahead. I can I, ask Mr. Trant in a minute. So, um, so thank you. So somebody had mentioned um, in a conversation that, um, that it's the develop, they, they were just saying, this is the developer's traffic plan, but could, would you confirm for me that we've got quite a few layers that have been reviewed by um, different people? In other words, we've got that checked off on the traffic. Um, it's my understanding that um, the county um, checked off on it, reviewed it and checked it off. And then Kimley Horn, they're a third party cons engineering consulting firm, is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. They reviewed the plan as well. Okay, and then VDOT did as well. So we've got three layers of approvals that have come through to support this. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, and then by right, if they do, since we're on traffic, um, by right, does that stoplight go in at the Shell station, or is that just that's part of the SUP? Is that correct? That would be part of the proffered. Um, commi commitments as part of the rezoning. Okay, so if they build to buy right over there, and I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm looking at all the affordable housing um, areas that we have up in the Norge, um, Croker, Talent, you know, people coming down, we've got quite a few. If, if, if this is going to provide jobs for folks, um, mm -hmm. and if they were to come up 60 and then Route 30 and then turn left to go into a buy right business park, there would be no light to um, to offer assistance to get in. Is that correct? Correct. A, a light would not be required as part of the buy right review. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's see. I'm lo I'm sorry. I, I'm so disjointed. I've been taking notes all night, so I've got them scribb scribbled all over the place here. Uh, I think that's the last of the traffic questions I have for now. All right. I have a few more. For later on once we go to another topic thank you i just wanted to follow up mr trant a question mr um mclennan asked you about the um possible uses and so i just <laughs> for complete transparency this conversation has been going on for a long time no one's reached out to say i mean i know you might not be able to give specific companies but give us some idea about what um somebody that might be some sort of thing that might be interested in it in coming here. And then to the other question that's been raised several times this evening regarding Stonehouse, um, what's more attractive about coming to where you're going to be as to, though I have to say, I, I go through Stonehouse Industrial Park once a week. Um, and it there there is, I think COVID did, do a number on some of the buildings in there, but there are buildings in there that are quite busy um, and and occupied. But what what is going to bring somebody to where you are versus where they are? Sure. Um, and, and just to to speak to your first question first, um, you know, one one of the the more significant interests expressed has been in. Um, I would say light manufacturing uh, and and also warehousing and and fulfillment um, related to to port activity. Those are the the two primary inquiries that we have gotten over all all others. Okay. I, I mean, you know, just to be candid, pushing us to uh, to try to you know begin real estate uh, contract negotiations, which which we have uh, declined until we were able to get through this process. Okay. Um, the, um, your second question, the Stonehouse Commerce Park, uh, and I can't speak to day-to-day to -day availability right. of, of space for sale or lease, but just in terms of d developed property versus undeveloped property, there's really only one uh, parcel left for development in the Stonehouse Commerce Park. Um, as, as you enter the Commerce Park, uh, it's on the right. 
Uh, it's the property that fronts along uh, Route 30. It's at the corner of Route 30 and, um, and, and uh, the Grange Parkway. Uh, the, the rest of the property is either in some sort of an environmental protection, the remainder of the property on the right before you go into the interstate is, has a conservation easement on it. Um, the remain, the uh, other develop, uh, parcel for development or susceptible to development on the left is actually acquired by the county uh, and, and, um, and, and is owned, I believe, by the county or the EDA. Um, and, and I think it has, uh, is, is, has designs for support of uh, Navian. Um, so that uh, there's really only that one parcel left. That parcel that is uh, on the right in the Stemock Commerce Park is um, has some it, it has a, a strange shape to it and and some topography uh, challenges. It's not a large flat um, rectangular shaped piece of property which supports uh, the the larger manufacturing and warehousing uses that we're hoping uh, will will locate in our park. So. Um, I guess my answer to your question is I think inventory is much lower than, than it appears and um, the, the sites that we would have available with the Hazelwood property are larger sites which as Mr. Hippel was speaking uh, to earlier in, in the economic development circles which, which I, I don't claim to have uh, intimate knowledge of but their uh, properties are ranked by sizes and, and you have prospects and they you know some need you know small 200,000 square feet um, you know, flex space where they can office and warehousing. Others need large, you know, flat areas for a million square feet. And this would provide uh, an inventory of those larger sites that I don't think is, is well represented in the county's inventory or really in the, in the region's inventory. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? I, I had a question, uh, one more uh, question, set of questions for staff, but I'm wondering if maybe Mr. Holt if you can answer these for me. Thank Mr. Holt. I've, I've been bugging him all day yeah, and with last-minute questions, which I, I, I don't like to ambush him with uh, new questions at the, at the board, so I've tried to get them to him, but I, I do want to go over some of them. Um, one of the things we discussed, and you just want to make sure that the citizens understand, is that this is a rezoning from... B1 and uh, A1 to EO, and that there is a list of permitted uses into the EO, and then there are a, a list of special uses under the EO, of which quite a few have been asked for with SUPs in, in this one. But essentially, once this is approved, um, that any of those, any of those uh, uses could be built by right under the EO in the land base in here. That there, there's nothing, there's nothing prescribing what could be done, uh, as long as it's within the, that con confines of the permitted uses of that EO, EO ordinance. Correct. Yes, and as long as those use categories that are labeled on the individual land base matched up to the proposed use. Okay. So, so that that, that does limit it somewhat. You have. Right. Land use categories, so that there are some categories that are not mentioned on the on the land base that they would not be allowed to use those by right. Okay. Right. Um, and do you recall right offhand what those three categories are? I think one was commercial, one was industrial. Um, ask Mr. Weissong if he could bring me the use category list. I have most of it memorized, not all of it yet. Yeah. Commercial industrial, I think, were two of them, but I wasn't sure what the third one was. Yes. Well, so certainly for the three SUP uses from the EO list, Mr. Trant touched on those earlier um, with the heavy machinery and the textile and... My to-do list is put all this stuff in one part of the ordinance because right now it is <laughs> spread from here to yonder. And so Adam and I will be back with that request much, much later. Okay. Well, I, the reason I asked, I've got, I've got a copy of the thing I was working on earlier today. And, I, I, it, you know, I know that there's, there's only certain cate use categories, and I couldn't remember exactly what was Correct. On the and some of those, plan. so, like, for instance, on, on this master plan, 
you, you know, the commercial core really is limited to that land bay there at the intersection of, of Route 30 and, and Old Stage okay, Road. So commer commercial is only, that, that's the only place they could put commercial uses, is that correct? Correct, up in that sort of urban core piece, yeah, and that, then that, the that rest are designated for there, the okay. industrial and the warehouse and some of the okay, office the, uses. Okay, the rest are industrial, and I think uh, civic, you know, so industrial uses are the balance of them then. Okay, so basically you got one land bay that would be commercial, and the rest of them will all be strictly the uses that are under the industrial and any of the other categories that have by right uses, you can't, you couldn't do it because the master plan would prescribe it. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. You, that, help, that helps me clear that up because that was, when I went through the ordinance, trying to relate that to what the, um, the maps and everything were saying was one thing. Um, can you touch real briefly on when this thing comes back to be built uh, and how we do the bridging of the wetlands, how the staff is involved in that and, and the process it would go through about uh, how that, what kind of bridge and everything, kind of how that would be determined. Yeah, so, you know, again, um, I think the applicant team spoke earlier, so the specifics of that design um, have not been figured out yet that should a rezoning and should a master plan be approved, those are the types of engineering level details that typically follow at site plan stage. Okay you know, again, whether depending on the actual topography and the actual limits of the wetlands and the actual limits of the RPA buffers, there are a lot of those engineering decisions that take place both from a cost perspective as well as an impact to the resource perspective. They're always balanced out. And certainly when those site plans come in, anything that all anything at all that, that impacts those environmentally sensitive areas, our stormwater resource protection team reviews that ensure that that's consistent with the requirements of the county code and the larger objectives of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance. And again, typically, it's like a lot of things. Usually there are very, very small impacts that staff can approve administratively. Usually anything larger than that, that's where you're gonna get, you know, sort of wrapped in into your, your Ches Bay board and your wetlands board for some of those pieces. And again, you know, you get in, I don't, jurisdictional wetlands? You know, could even be Army Corps of Engineers and some of those larger state agencies as well. So, okay, Army Corps and DEQ at the state level. Okay, um, I have two other questions. I'll, I'll just try to be very brief. Um, when we have a lot of citizens talk to us about rural lands, technically, uh, the the definition, if I understood it from the comp plan of rural lands, is is those uh, A1 uh, outside the PSA. We have A1 and R8 and other less intensely uses inside the P PSA. Does staff normally refer to those as rural lands? Rural lands on the comp plan are typically all of those areas outside the primary service area. Okay. On this one, you have the piece of A1 because it used to not be inside the PSA, but then that was changed as was part changed. of a previous comp okay. plan amendment. All right, and then the last thing is, what is uh, just a ballpark figure? What is the uh, a likely impervious cover um, um, percentage of a piece of property that you would see in like maybe residential or commercial or whatever? What, what, what range, because I remember we, we talked about this, the watershed plans. Right. And if memory serves me correctly, when we get up around 10% impervious cover, you start getting to where there are serious impacts. When you get around 15 or 18%, it's real serious. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, because of the varying nature of industrial, um, don't have any sort of rules of thumb. I would defer to the applicant team okay. on that. I think they've developed industrial and could probably answer that better. I did want to come back to you earlier. Some of those earlier use classifications yeah. um, I found buried in our ordinance. Again, I really want to fix that for the <laughs> mental health of everybody who works in this ordinance every single day. So, you know, categorically, you've got areas that are designated F, which is going to be your wholesale and warehouse uses. Categorically G, which are your office uses. Categorically H, which are your light industrial uses, um, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I'll add, I'll, I'll do one step further. Again, as far as the use list in our ordinance, remember our ordinance is exclusionary in nature. So if it's not listed, you can't do it. Okay. It's not, if it's kind of close, if it kind of feels like this, staff can't approve it at the how, staff how do How do you, those categories you just gave me, F, G, and H, where, 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 are, that, where are you getting that from? from 
Um, so up near the front of the ordinance talks about submittal requirements for legislative uh, application, okay. section 2423, the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. And probably two pages over than that, subsection two, uh, you start getting uh, the requirements that must be included as part of any binding master plan, and there's a table okay. after that. And so again, a lot of things that aren't applicable to this, you start out with single family, multifamily apartments, you kind of go down the list. Okay. And again, where you start to hit the E, F, and G labels um, are those non-residential uses. And those categorically are the uses that are bound to those specific land base as identified on the binding okay. master plan. And how does that relate to this uh, use list? Because the use list lists commercial, a whole bunch of commercial, and it lists as industrial. And then it has utility, civic, open, residential, and that's it. So those are sort of ready reference categories. It's not a one for one. Another one of those formatting things I really want to fix. It might have been a good idea at the time, but it's not really a one for one relationship okay. to those categories. When you kind of get in that use table, it's really just for a ready reference to kind of give you a quick place to start looking for something. Okay. Um, that does not necessarily mean everything under that commercial heading is a commercial use. You still have to look at that use. You still have to look at how that use is defined in 24-2 okay. um, and go from there. It's just really sort of a, a reference okay. header. You've confused me thoroughly, but thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna fix it. If I don't do anything else, we wanna fix this ordinance. <laughs> can I ask a quest few questions of Mr. Holt while you're up there, please? Sure. Um, could you please address um, some of the concerns that people have about um, light and noise and um, the BMPs, how, how, how that works with the stormwater, and then while you're in that category, maybe explain how DEQ regulates air quality and those sorts of things. Um, yes, I think I can speak to most of that. So certainly for the lighting, um, there has been for many, many years requirements in the zoning ordinance, regardless of whether something is developed as part of a legislative process or whether something is developed by right as part of the administrative process, the ordinance has in there requirements for pretty restrictive lighting. You cannot have any light glare outside the property lines, and they're the basis for our lighting standards for both freestanding lighting as well as really any outdoor lighting, any building mounted, are sort of based in the, in the dark sky principles. Everything, all the light fixtures have to be within directed downwards. They have to be with in full, what are called full cutoff lenses. It's almost like a shoebox type design. You only get those things. Uh, pointing down, of course, there are exceptions in there for, you know, lighting flagpoles and those types of things. But for all of that, there are also height limits. Um, I believe as part of the proposed SUP conditions, we're proposing a, uh, the, a shorter height restriction on the light poles than are otherwise required. But all of those are in the base ordinance. And again, should this application be approved, at whatever point applications come in, uh, at the engineering level for development, that lighting plan has to be provided and that level of review happens. Um, in terms of noise, um, you know, again, we've got the county's noise ordinance that's been in a place that applies countywide. Um, um, there is nothing additional in the proposed SUP conditions or the proffers that are specific to noise. Um, for the stormwater master plan, I'm going to ask my colleague, Mr. Weissong, to join me. I think he's got a uh, short write-up. Again, try to have all that memorized. But Let me ask a quick follow-up. Yes. In regards to the light pollution, if this is not approved and there is residential um, put in that A1, what are the restrictions on, on light there? With, in so, regards to residential development. So residential subdivisions that are developed under the subdivision ordinance do not have to adhere to those requirements. Okay, thank you. Again, it's only for non-residential developments that are developed per the site plan ordinance. Okay. But our lighting ordinance does not apply to single family detached homes. Um, Mr. Wesson, can you Is give that us why a few years ago there could, there was the, I had an issue with some lights that were across the streets and, okay, thank you. We need to fix that too, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I can jump in for the stormwater requirements. The applicant has submitted a master plan for the property that does include the proposed facility layout for the development of the site. And this has been reviewed by the county's stormwater division. 
Uh, accompanying this layout, the applicant has submitted a narrative and needs analysis for the stormwater management, which does meet the general criteria um, that the county looks at. In addition to fulfilling the master plan and submittal requirements, the applicant has also proffered, which is to legally guarantee that additional nutrient management plans for each land bay will be submitted and approved prior to any development occurring. And furthermore, the county is proposing a number of special use conditions that do apply to the development of the entire site and are intended to help with stormwater mitigation. For example, condition number 20, master stormwater management plan does require a detailed master plan to be approved for the property uh, prior to approval of any development on the site. And this has, I, I'm not a stormwater engineer, but it does have, uh, based on stormwater division's input, um, a higher standard of facilities that do have to be put in to make sure that uh, impacts are mitigated. And that's something that would also be reviewed as part of the engineered plan review process. And what if there was a buy right? What, would they have the same type of um, storm, what would be our stormwater um, policy then with, in regards? They would have lesser standards. They would certainly have to follow county code and the applicable state requirements. But with the SUP conditions for this project, we do have the chance to require a higher standard. We wouldn't have the chance to do that if it were by right. Okay, thank you. And for, for by right, they'd still have to meet the requirements of the county stormwater ordinance and the county's Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance, much like any um, private development countywide. But because this is a legislative process, there are these conditions that staff added in to require it for that higher standard. Okay. Um, Ms. Sadler, for your point, for the air quality, that's handled at the state level. That's not a, anything that James City County does. Um, is, it pretty, is, it, is it pretty rigorous? Uh, it depends on whether a, an air quality permit is required from the state or not. And I'm sorry, I, just, I don't have the information with me tonight to sort of know what those uses or triggers or thresholds are that's and how okay. that applies to specific types of industrial uses. Um, Based All right, and then we, we had talked about, um, and I don't know if that was covered in the stormwater portion, but the environmental reviews for the project in response to a lot of the questions that citizens had. Yes, and so certainly, as Mr. Weissong just mentioned, those are, the, those are the items specific to stormwater runoff, and there was an earlier question, too. Um, while there is some information that must be submitted about the rare, threatened, and endangered species. You know, the information required at the master plan level um, does not require a full new inventory. That's really just sort of a, an inventory of record. Um, you may remember a couple of years ago, the board amended the zoning ordinance that when site plans come in, even by right sub, uh, site plans, uh, there is a requirement for a natural resources inventory to be required as well as archeological studies. And so those are applicable regardless. And then um, I had a few more questions if I could in regard to the rural character and the corridor. And I know this is undeveloped business land, but could you, um, it, could you explain how some of that is mitigated within your, because I read it in the staff report, but I think it would be helpful for, um, for all of us to hear how that's been addressed in terms of um, perhaps buffering or anything, any point, any rural character points and um, that could be addressed with that. Sure, you know, so, so the idea is, so I'm gonna separate a little bit, if you will, sort of preserving the rural character versus preserving community character. Um, you know, certainly we talked about before areas outside the primary service area and those areas designated rural lands on the comprehensive plan future land use map are, are those where those those rural principles ap apply um, certainly as we talked about this property was brought inside the primary service area it's designated for economic opportunity on the comprehensive plan future land use map so certainly with by right development you've got requirements in the ordinance for buffering along roadways um, we've noted earlier as part of this SUP Staff has proposed enhanced landscaping and buffering from Route 30, um, from Barnes Road, and also from Leisure Road, certainly preserving the tree canopy where it already exists and where it's thin 
or non-existent, that development of those properties um, add uh, needed landscaping uh, to a standard higher than the minimum required in the zoning ordinance. I think some of the conditions er mentioned earlier were was um, prohibiting any new roadway access to Barnes Road, prohibiting any new road access to Leisure Road, um, you know, limitations on the lighting above and beyond um, the minimum required in the county ordinance, application of the design guidelines, um, you know, certainly for the community character element, all of those are included. Um, we've got additional setbacks for those EO specially permitted uses. I think we've got a minimum of a 1,000 foot setback off of Barnes Road for those EO SUP uses. Um, planting of street trees uh, along the Spine Road in accordance with the county street tree policy. Um, just to name some. Can I just ask a question about, about <laughs> all of this, which is, is essentially, um, we could have uh, um, wanted, we could have put those conditions in um, without the guarantee of the approval of SUPs down the line. Is that right? Um, I'm I mean, in, 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 as a condition of the rezoning itself. Rezoning items can only be proffered, only be voluntarily proffered. Well, correct. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, isn't that what we're doing in, in a lot of these cases anyway? At least with the SUP, there are staff proposed conditions, and we can, uh, we can propose those uh, to be added on to any, any consideration of the application versus items that could only be voluntarily proffered by the applicant. So a little more uh, uh, sort of staff control on those, if you will, um, and uh, stated more affirmatively than those being brought to the table by the applicant. Sure, I'd, I'd follow up, but I'm not sure Ms. Sadler was finished. You don't, um, Sue? Well, I would, so thank you. I just, I did, since we were talking about the rural part, I just wanted to make sure since um, uh, there seems to be confusion as to whether some of this is actually following the comprehensive plan. I, I've got some of the um, comprehensive plan pages in front of me and under the category of rural lands protection, it reads, the areas outside the PSA are in large part designated as rural lands on the future land use map. Land preservation is of the utmost importance. And would you please um, explain um, what we're actually looking at in terms of rural land preservation, some of the tools that, that we're um, hopefully getting ready to implement here soon. So, and some of them are already in practice, but just so that um, everyone understands that, that w we do value rural lands and we're the ones that are outside the PSA is, is technically, technically rural lands. And I was just hoping you could cover maybe some of those tools that, that we're looking at to actually do some of that preservation. Sure, certainly. So both existing and some that are, um, that the board has directed staff to look at. So certainly for areas outside the primary service area, you know, certainly uh, the board's familiar. You all have had conversations here recently about the existing open space program, about the county's existing purchase of development rights program. You know, those are certainly two programs that have been a, a around for a while and, you know, the need to put some, uh, uh, to look to see what ability there is to, to add some additional funding to that. And you'll certainly remember at the board's December board meeting um, there was an initiating resolution that the board staff uh, that the board passed directing staff to look at additional um, additional preservation measures along some of our most scenic roadways including Forge Road and that could be a, a myriad of things including additional setbacks and other limitations to better preserve some of those vistas in that sense of rural community Staff had, you know, again, that was a, that was an adopted resolution to direct staff to do that, and that'll be um, part and parcel to some of the first discussions we have with the board about updating the the zoning ordinance in the A1 district. Any other questions? Uh, no, I don't have. Do oh, you have a question? I did. Is it, are you finished, Ms. Sadler? Um, I'm I'm going to ask Jason to come up in a minute, but you go ahead. Okay, I just hope that. Either one could, and there's been some talk about toxic 
chemicals, um, which I we would, I'm assuming we would not allow, but could we address that? Sure, so certainly you have in your SUP conditions, um, Thomas, help me figure out which page I'm looking at here, again, just so I'm not trying to recite it from memory, and about a spill prevention. Oh, here we go. So, you know, uh, in the long list of SUP conditions, um, we have, say, for example, uh, under 22C, um, you know, certainly, um, uh, say, specific to the manufacturing and processing of textiles, um, for outdoor areas, there's a requirement for a spill prevention control and countermeasures plan, um, essentially says prior to the issuance of any land disturbing permit, a spill prevention and control and countermeasures plan shall be reviewed and approved by the Director of Stormwater Resources Protection, detailing and addressing any chemical handling, including but not limiting to oil, diesel, dyes, and gasoline. So this is, a, again, because it's an SUP condition, this is a little bit of an additive step um, as part of that. Again, we've worked through these types of similar conditions on other uh, industrial developments and sites that we've had in the county. I think we've used these um, down at a switching station. We've used some of them um, by extension on um, really anything that has like gasoline uh, type things. We usually include the fire marshal in that review. Um, so this is separate and apart from and on top of those requirements that are already in place under the Virginia Uniform Statewide Building Code, very specific to how buildings and containment systems and drainage systems must be designed uh, for the physical structure. And again, that's separate and apart from any um, wastewater discharge, not stormwater discharge, but wastewater discharge. Those are managed at the regional level by the Hampton Road Sanitation District. So any industrial use, you know, you come in and get your, your, your water into the building from JCSA, anything from an industrial context that leaves the building needs the approval of HRSD because ultimately that's where those effluents go. And so again, that's, that's another sort of stringent regional process for process wastewater or anything um, that leaves the building through the sanitary sewer system. Thank you. May I, may I come back to one thing? To I, I found your table, and I've got the categories. And what I'm trying to figure out is it says that for certain land bays, it's FGH&I, which are wholesale and warehouse, office, light industrial, and institutional, OK? So if I'm, I want to develop that land bay, and I go to this list of use list, it gives me commercial uses, uh, and I have industrial uses. Um, office is one of the commercial uses. Uh, I, I don't see how can I tell from those four categories which of these buy right uses that I can put into that bay and which I cannot because it's, it, it doesn't seem to be any clear, clear connection to me. That's why you have to look at the individual use and what's being proposed and how that individual use is defined. You can't really categorize it based on the EO table. Okay. So. Because again, all of the, all of the buy right uses and, and SUP uses are listed in that table, but you have to look at whatever the individual proposed use is to make sure it's consistent with those area designations. Okay. So for example, if, if I wanted to um, come in and do under that commercial up there, um, right at the top of the list is automo automobile rental and automobile repair and service. Is there, is there, can I do it or can't? I mean, how, how do I know? I have to ask you and you have to make a determination as to whether that fits? Correct. So if it's like a car rental place, like an Avis or Hertz, that's clearly going to be more of a commercial use. Mm -hmm. If it's more like the um, one referenced earlier, like the Carter Cat, more if it's more of a heavy industrial, mm -hmm. um, and it's not going to be a commercial use, it'll be the industrial well, yeah, use. Yeah, no, I, I can figure that. But I mean, when I'm looking at commercial, there's a whole list of commercial here, but then the, um, it's obvious to me then that there are some of these that... Um, might or might not be allowed 
So I'm not sure. It sort of brings into question in my mind the validity of, of, of the list itself here because that's the first thing I went to to take a look at. And I, I had no idea that, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like your FGH and I coordinate. So I, I see your problem of like trying to fix the, <laughs> the table. Yes, because it's uh, not intuitive, right? And it should not. be intuitive. It should be exactly like you say. Anybody should be able to pick up this ordinance yeah. and make for that one for one comparison. That doesn't exist because this, this ordinance has been piecemealed over the years. And the years. Okay. it'd be great to fix that. We right. really want to fix that. All for right. Just that example. Thank you. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry to keep flogging the dead horse. No, that's okay. It, this, uh, this has made it interesting. I did have some follow ups with Mr. Purse, if I could please, regarding, some, regarding economic development. Thanks, thanks, Jason. First of all, could you please explain for everyone how this comp plan process works in that it's a publicly driven document with engagement and participation? Sure, so the comp plan process is a long process. It's not one um, that we undertake lightly. I know uh, the board had previously approved the methodology. I think the methodology for this one was um, at least 18 months um, as a number of the public commenters had stated, um, you know, we do surveys, we do outreach uh, community meetings where we uh, uh, get input as we go along through the process so we can tweak and fine tune the language in there. Um, and there are a number of stops with the Board of Supervisors uh, as, it, as well as the Planning Commission through that, through that process. Okay, and then so, um, you know, I heard several times tonight that this is not part of the comprehensive plan, but it, it, we have it's multifaceted. I mean, it covers a vast um, array of things that we have to consider in a locality. And I was going to ask you if you would explain how this application follows the recommendation of diversification of our economy as recommended by the comp plan. And then I was just going to read a few pieces out of the comp plan and just make sure I'm tracking and connecting the dots, if that's okay. Sure. So in terms of diversification of the economy, um, I think every year when we uh, enter into the budget process, you know, we want to make sure we have a good understanding of, of the revenues for the county, um, paying particular attention to uh, property taxes, right? Um, you know, you, you don't want to be in a situation where uh, you're over-reliant on one sec sector, sector of the economy for those for those revenues, right? Um, you know, particularly in the past couple of years, I think we've seen a hit to the retail uh, industry, particularly because of uh, COVID, and then we also saw some tur tourism downturn. Uh, so having other types of industry that we are able to gain revenue from uh, is vitally important for a local government. Um, I think, you know, James City County's sort of prided ourselves on our ability in the region uh, with, some our, with some of the other uh, uh, comparisons to other local jurisdictions around us that we do have a really strong uh, economic base on the industrial side, right? Um, Anheuser-Busch uh, being one of the larger ones, but also some of the ancillary uh, uh, companies as well, Ball Metal, Owens, Illinois, uh, provide some of those, uh, the cans and the bottles for those uses. Uh, but we've talked a lot about Stonehouse Commerce Park. Avid Medical is one of the top 10 taxpayers in the county. Um, so we, we, we want to make sure that we have uh, a, num a number of different avenues where we're receiving some of those revenues. All right. And if, if you could bear with me for just a minute, because I do have several sections of this, because, again, I just want to make sure that I'm connecting the dots. So I'm reading from our comp plan under the Office of Economic Development. And... Um, and it states, the mission of James City County's OED is to foster the development and expansion of a diversified and healthy base of primary business and industry that will better balance the tax base, to your point, increase job opportunities, and enhance both the quality and standard of living in James City County. Um, and then it says that OED works to accomplish this mission through its efforts to increase commercial tax revenue attract improved job opportunities for the county citizens and enhance the quality of life for local residents. Um, to accomplish this, OED's course, core efforts are focused um, on business retention, expansion, attraction, and creation. And then the next category is land suitability that I wanted to make sure this applied as well. 
So it says, one of the key factors in developing a sound economic development strategy is determining the suitability of land for specific development types. The three key factors from a planning perspective that are used to determine suitability are the adequacy of public infrastructure to support the proposal, the property's land use designation, the zoning uh, district for the parcel, the adequacy of infrastructure is aided greatly by the proposal being located inside the primary service area or the PSA. And furthermore, the county's analysis of the non-residential capacity within the PSA is a helpful reference when considering the impact and capacity of the proposal within the PSA, while the county strategy for rural economic development is a helpful reference for considering proposals outside the PSA. Am I tracking? Uh, yeah, that, I was, tracking that was a mouthful. So far? Okay, <laughs> uh, I, I got a couple, but I do have a couple more mouthfuls. I just wanna make sure while I'm reading this stuff, I, I just wanna make sure I'm on the right page here. And then under the, um, the community guidance for the public engagement, it says one of the public engagement things identified during this comprehensive plan update, now this is the current one that we just voted on, um, that most directly relates to this chapter is, quote, respondents support economic development that results in recruitment of businesses with higher paying jobs as one of the way of making the community more economically resilient and appealing to the younger professionals. While tourism is a major economic driver in the county, it should be balanced with other employment industries. During the polling portion of the summit, an online polling that continued weeks after, 88% of the respondents said it was somewhat or very important for the county to do more to expand the local economy by attracting higher paying jobs. And then participants were also provided an opportunity to share their quote, big ideas. Some responses supported specific efforts to attract businesses varying from large tech companies to small local businesses. Some commenters requested that the county and office of OED um, put more focus on diversifying the tax base by seeking out businesses that offer full-time jobs with higher pay and benefits. And some respondents reflected a clear understanding that tourism is a driving force behind our economy and call for more diverse revenue streams less affected by economic, economic downturns. And then um, of the of the scenario planning, it's talking about reducing commuting times by locating homes, businesses, and supportive uses in closer proximity within the PSA and encourage localized job development to create higher paying jobs in James City County, create better jobs to housing balance and reduce the need for cross country commute, cross county commuting to other job locations or in commuting for workers that cannot afford to live here. So am I still, am I still um, hitting? I'm about to lose my voice here. Yeah, I guess what the only thing I'd like to, to say to add to that, you know, those obviously are uh, stated more eloquently than I'd be able to state at the podium. Um, I think we've talked about a couple of the items uh, in there specifically um, with respect to this uh, specific development in, in terms of uh, the opportunity to have higher paying jobs, uh, right? Not necessarily just the retail jobs, but having some of those industrial, uh, light industrial jobs that, that have higher wages and, and benefits and things like that. And then I think Mr. Hipple had talked about how we compete uh, regionally, right? Um, the county has to put our best foot forward in terms of uh, the sites that we have available uh, when we're trying to compete with the, the Suffolk's and the Chesapeake's and the Virginia beaches, having a site uh, that's, that's large and flat and undeveloped uh, to, to be able to accommodate some of these pad sites help, helps us compete for those types of jobs. So if we're still looking in this section in the comp plan, it's talking about um, uh, businesses and industries with certain area, within certain areas of the county, including opportunity zones, foreign trade zones, and tourism zones, and then promote desirable economic growth in designated industrial and commercial areas through provision of water and sewer infrastructure consistent with the comp plan. So the SUP would bring in that water and sewer for that part of it, right? 
Yes, and, and I think Mr. Trant had mentioned that VEDP has a very specific list of requirements for how you get put on th those lists. Uh, it all has to do with transportation, water and sewer availability, and, and all of those things that we reference in the comprehensive plan. Okay, and then the, the last part, I mean, I could read, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to condense it here. Continue to monitor the available capacity for non-residential development within the county's PSA and utilize this information when considering land use designation changes as part of the comp plan update process. And that's what we did. Well, that's what they did in 2015. And then we voted on again in this past October when the comp plans passed, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I'm connecting all the dots um, to we, make um, sure. Uh, Ms. Sadler and, and, and board members, I'm sorry. Um, we've been um, considering this for, for quite a while now, and I, I would like to just see if there are any questions that people feel have not been addressed at this point so that we can move on to a, a decision. No, I, I would like to um, bring a motion forward, but I have a few things I want to say before I bring oh, them right, up. Right, right. And I don't mean to cut that off. I just want to make no. sure that we've answered any, any questions that people have yeah, first. It's not questions, it's just more statements. So. That, and that's fine. I, and I, that, I, I'm, the, I'm the same. I've got my questions answered, okay. but I have some comments I'd like to make. Ms. Larson, you had any, any questions? Nope. Okay. Mr. Okay. Mr. Heisner. Okay. okay. Um, first, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I was pulled back a little bit by York County coming into the meeting and voicing an opinion on James City County. And I'm, everybody has a right to bring something in, but we try to stay in our own lanes. And we could have gone against Kelton Station that, that has basically ruined Lightfoot and getting through Lightfoot, but we stayed in our own lane. Um, so I was very surprised at that. I was very surprised, being, especially being on a planning commission. I mean, if we sent some of our planning commissions over to your county to tell them how we think they should do their county, I don't think it would go over very well. Um, New Kent as well, supervisors. Some of us supervisors went over New Kent and told them, this is the way I think you need to run New Kent. I don't think that would go along very smoothly either. So I was, I was very surprised at the two counties that are our neighbors that we've worked very close with are now trying to be in the middle of James City County business. So that's, that's kind of put me off a little. Um, and, an, and I do, there was a statement on this board making decisions on wealth or status or how well someone knew somebody. Well, I can tell you that doesn't happen. Doesn't happen to me, and I can guarantee these board members are looking at the best interests of James City County not if somebody comes up and, oh, they're wealthy, so let's give them this. I don't care if they're wealthy. I don't care if they're poor. If they've got a good thing that helps the community, I'm going to look at it. Um, staff, there were some comments tonight, and it may not be the ones that are sitting in this room, maybe some that already left, about our staff. And, you know, they may leave. They do a poor job. They're not, they're not looking into it. They don't look into it enough. I can tell you one thing. I'm proud to say we have some of the best staff, not only the state, but the United States, I believe. Our staff work very hard, and they will drill a client in the ground. I've had projects in front of this staff and have caught, I won't say that, but caught heck getting it anywhere around the staff. They're always looking at everything. They make sure they cross their um, T's, dot their I's. They're, they're very good at what they do. There's this, I've had a lot of people call me about this online stuff that's going on and they need to do this and need to do that. If you heard what they're saying about I, I don't, people will say what they're going to say. But it's amazing that you can get a whole lot more done with kindness than you'll ever do stabs and picks. And those people that are stabbing and picking and one coming from a supervisor that once sat up here, it's a shame. Because he knows how things go in James City County. He knows the rules and regulations. He knows what you can and can't do. So if you follow that down the road, you're going to go down a rabbit hole. I would suggest, and I heard a lot of comments, keeping the farmland, keeping this. I would suggest that 
any of the farmlands that we have, <clears throat> that this group work together with those farmers and those landowners and see if we can come up with something different. See if you can, before it ever gets into the planning stage or the thought stage, whatever, may, some of y'all I'm sure have great ideas as far as, hey, we could do this, we could do that, we can help do this, we can put them in position here. Maybe we start that and start going, what, what can we do to help the others? Because the farmers are dying in James City County. It's, it's a shame because I helped a lot of the farmers around here and baled hay and, and pick corn and everything else and pick strawberries and, and those farms are not here anymore. They're dying. So what can we do as citizens? And where have you been before that you saw something work that would help these farmers out? That would help them do something different with their land? And maybe that's the way we can keep hold of some of these rural lands that, you know, in the primary service area, I can see it going. But there's a lot of farmlands outside of that that this group can take the energy that y'all have, which is great, and put it towards, okay, we can save this one or this one or this one, or figure out there's a lot of smart people in this room. Y'all have a lot going for you. And we can use your help as far as we can't come up with all the decisions, how we can save all this rural land. We're trying to put money away to, to, to buy purchase development rights to save the rural lands. We love the rural lands. We understand where you're coming from. Can't save them all, but how can y'all help us to come up with ways to help the ones that are out there and maybe make it better and, and make it productive for James City County and make some productive problems? And um, I, I, there's no doubt that I've told them many a person, I love Ford Road. I don't live on Ford Road, but I love Ford Road. I love the way it looks. I love the way it feels. I want to protect it. I want to make sure it's here 50 years from now and somebody drives down Ford Road and looks at it and says, wow. But there's potential. And there's people looking right now at development down in some of these areas. And, you know, maybe there's something, someone out here has some good thoughts and good opinions that can help us. And that's what we need more than anything. So if y'all can come together and help us on these other things, that would be great for helping the board, helping the community. And um, hats off to all your energy and all your, you know, what you've tried to do and what you're doing and, and where you're going. There's other things that we need help on as well. Um, my motion is to go ahead for approval on Number one, the ordinance, and number two, the resolution. Okay, thank you. We have a motion, and we'll continue the discussion now. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Any, who would like to? No, you let you finished us up last time, okay. so. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I want to disclose that I, I met with Mr. Trant, Mr. Hazelwood, and Mr. Marston on January 31st and had a good, good, good discussion. You know, learned a lot. I appreciate that opportunity. Um, I want to thank the Hazelwoods for all the work they've put into this. Um, I would really like to thank all of our speakers who came out tonight. Uh, painful as it may seem to be, it's helpful. Um, and especially the email. I was able to, a cryptic answer to met most of them, but uh, I know most of you probably wanted a more in-depth answer, but we had quite a few. Um, let me take a look at how this thing would, what I'm going to look at, and I'm going to look at it from what is, what, what is in the best interest of the citizens of James City County. This comes to us with a recommendation that says it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. It's inside the PSA. The land's designated for uh, economic opportunity. There's the aspect of it being the for, uh, foreign trade zone, which is attractive, and it's been uh, predominantly zoned as a B1 for a uh, uh, considerable length of time. Staff recommends approval. Planning Commission, on a little more of a split vote, recommended approval, four to two. And the uh, two more egregious things that were in there have been taken out, the uh, presidential component and the truck terminal. So those are all of the positives, I would say. Um, some of the aspects that uh, we've talked about that I look at, uh, traffic, um, the pros uh, with the improvements, all but one inter impact and intersection will continue at level of service C or better, which is what we want. 
Uh, the problem area is Barnes Road and Route 30, which goes down to a, a level of service D or F with no, no mitigation proposed. And essentially, the Route 30 between I-64 and I, uh, US-60 traffic increases from about 20 to about 32,000 in 2045. So traffic is really going to be an issue up there. The economic impact is probably the most important thing that we're looking at in how this could benefit the citizens of James City County. Being sold as uh, uh, something to help us diversify our economy, help our tax base, uh, and have benefits for everybody across the, the, uh, the board. So that should be a positive impact. The question is, we really don't know what's going to be built. So we don't know the end users. And as a result, we don't know what the economic impact will be. It could be modest. It could be great. We don't know. Citizen comment. Uh, at the Planning Commission, we had 16 citizens spoke against and five in favor. My email that I've received uh, as of this afternoon was about 38 against and 11 for. Tonight, uh, my tally was 6 for and 21 against. A lot of people are against this for reasons that I think are very valid to them, but I have to look at it from a point of view of is this, in fact, rural lands? And it really isn't. I mean, it, it's, it'd be work, wonderful to preserve it, but it, it should probably get developed. My concern is how and what we get out of it. Um, one place I will take exception with what staff said in their report, I don't think, although it's well screened, I don't think it's compatible with the existing character of the surrounding areas. And the report said it was. Um, there's a potential for some damage to the Diaskin Water Creek watershed. Um, the impact of uh, Barnes Road and Route 30 and the uncertain economic benefit to the end users. Those are the concerns that I have. So when I took a look at this, I said, everybody's worried about what can be developed on B1 by right. So I thought this afternoon, all right, let's take a look at what happens with these applications. I've been on this board off and on since 2005, and I've noticed one thing with great regularity. About 50% of the things we approve either don't get built or get, come back to us for a modification. There are two, three bites at the apple. When something like this is approved, it will eventually be sold. The Hazelwood family will get the money that uh, for, they want. Hopefully the plan they want to set in place is, is, is there, but somebody else is going to probably do the bulk of the, the, the development. We don't know who that will be, and we don't know what, what will happen there. So I wanted to look at it and see what could be developed by right, and that's why I'm, the reason for all of my questions, because I went through this thing this afternoon with a fine-tooth comb. I sat down and I said, most of our industrial parks are zoned M2. General Industrial District. So I wanted to compare the by right uses in the M2 and the economic opportunity. And I went through and butted them up side by side. And essentially, there are 99 uses listed in this document for economic opportunity. 78 of them are permitted by right, 21 require an SUP. When I compared those two, and I eliminated the ones that were common to both of them. In other words, the same use is on both, both as, as you can build by right. I came up with a list of 35 uses that would be allowed by right in an EO zone that would not be allowed in an M2, a normal uh, uh, industrial park. I could read the list, but I don't, I, I don't want to go through it because it's, it's a long list. But there are some things I would like to highlight. That one area up front, which has mostly commercial, has some things that, according to this, and you know, I may be proven wrong by when I talk to staff, uh, that could be built up there. Um, and the ones that sort of struck me right in the eye are hotels, motels, tourist homes, and convention centers, public billiard parlors, arcades, pool rooms, bowling alleys, dance halls, and other indoor centers of amusement. I write. It's under commercial. Mr. Holt might debate that with me if I, if I wanted to come in and do it. Um, and then there was one other that uh, sort of struck me. Vehicle and trailer sales and service. So 
somebody who owns this 10 years from now could come back in and say, I want to develop this by right, and this, I want to put this use up there. We don't know what's going to be on these land use bays. We don't find out until they come and propose it to us. The industrial side is a little better. That's the bulk of the land, thanks. But there was one that sort of got my attention, manufactured home or home, uh, home, mobile home sales. Um, so car lots and home sales and stuff. We don't know what the taxes are going to be generated from this. We don't know what the impact is going to be for our citizens. And it's that uncertainty that is the problem for me. Um, if we approve this, what are we, quote, buying for our citizens? We're getting the certainty that something will be developed, and the uncertainty is that we don't know what it may be, and that the pre-approved check uh, uh, SUPs create, as we've heard often this evening, a blank check for the developer, and it essentially lessens our ability to mitigate unforeseen adverse impacts on behalf of our citizens. Now, I'm hoping that we will get a desirable businesses. I'm hoping that we'll get a diversified tax base out of this for our, our, our citizens, but, I, I, but I, don't, I don't see that we have any real assurance that that's what will happen. There are a lot of, lot of concerns. One of the big things I, that I asked a question about was this is 3.2 million, 3 million square feet, 328 acres. And 328 acres is about 14.3 million square feet. So if you divide that out, you get a um, impervious cover of, of 3.2 million square feet of about 22%. That's a lot higher than anything I've ever seen. I don't know. We may have that in some of our other industrial parks. Uh, and that, that doesn't even consider, I know some of it may be lost because you have vertical stacking of the square footage in higher buildings, but some of it's going to be gained because you've got to have parking lots. So there's some, there's some real, real aspects that I, I think are, are, are troubling. Uh, and I, I have to look at it from a very pragmatic point of view. I, uh, I've wrestled with it. There are some real pros and some real cons. And I just haven't, I'm having a hard time deciding the right way to go. I want to thank everybody for their input this evening. I want to thank everybody for coming, up, coming out as well. Um, I have great empathy for many of the points that you brought up. In conversations with me, many of you have brought up my own advocacy when I lived out in Mirror Lakes area, um, part of which brought me to the school board and to this board as well. Um, I, I, however, am, I put a little bit more eggs in the basket of the fear of the buy right. When I ask staff specifically questions about stormwater um, mitigation and different things that they have put into the SUP that hopefully will ensure a much better development, that is where I come on the side of because I need to, what we've done in the past in this county, in my humble opinion, hasn't worked. Just hoping that there won't be by right development doesn't work for me. And then if you do get by right development there, you've got your, I know it doesn't seem like it, but in my opinion, you will be in a worse place than you are now with all of the work that's been done. Um, you know, this just got sprung on us. It's been it's been a negative that the that the Hazelwood family has been working since 2014 or earlier to try to come up with something that would work with this county and the amount of time that staff has put in. I I don't see that as a negative. I, maybe I'm missing something, but to me, the fact that they have worked to and I'm sure they you know I haven't asked this question, but I'm sure they haven't gotten everything that they've wanted and that they've had to negotiate with staff um, in order to get us to where we are today. Um, I, I, excuse me, I should also, I've, I talked with um, a group that Ms. Prevish put together um, that also included the um, uh, Forge Road, and I also met with Mr. Marston, Mr. Trant, and Ms. Hazelwood. I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. Um, 
but I have poured hours into this, which I know all of you have. Um, but it does come down to this piece of property has been B1 since the 70s. This, this was going to happen. This was on a comp plan that we all just approved not that long ago. And nobody up here went to move it out uh, or to change the use. And so, um, you know, you're right. There's not a 100% guarantee, but I have to, um, what I, this, the work that I've seen from staff and the work that I've seen from the applicant, I have to hope that there is going to be um, a product that we that will serve all the citizenry well. I have to t say also for just a moment, um, I very much appreciate, and, and as Mr. Hippel himself said, everyone has a right to weigh in on what's happening. But I'm a bit taken back by the fact that York County has come out. There's been absolutely no um, communication from York County about what's happening to us at Lightfoot, um, but yet we, we have had input on what's going to happen to us at a place where there is an interstate, where we're making traffic improvements, um, that none of which was done in Lightfoot, none of which there's a plan to do. So I'm a, I'm a bit taken back about that, I have to admit. Um, and I certainly, you know, I've always tried to be very respectful and not weigh in on um, my neighbors, but I'll certainly have to keep that in mind um, as I move forward. Um, but, but if the vote does not go um, in the, the direction that, um, that the citizenry that came out to speak tonight um, expects wants it to go, I guess is a, is a good way to say it. Um, it's not because people weren't heard. It's just that it, there is, there are other, we have to take everything into consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sadler? Yeah, I'm trying to go through my uh, notes here. I've been taking them all night. I've been trying to whittle them down a little bit. So um, again, um, I'd like to thank everyone who came out tonight everyone who's reached out by phone. I've had some great conversations um, and um, talked with a, a lot of people, all the emails. I appreciate Ms. Larson letting me jump in on the, the Zoom call um, that she participated in with some of the citizens. Um, and I, I, and I've, I've talked to people on both sides of this issue. So, and, and also I'd like to thank Mr. Holt and Mr. Purse and Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Johnson, I know y'all are going to be glad not to have talked to me after tonight, but they've spent tons of hours just answering my questions alone. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Trant, who's answered many, many questions as well. I don't take decisions lightly. I don't take this one lightly. I've done a lot of research. I've done my homework, and I've tried to be as thorough as I can with the information provided. And uh, forgive me if I get a little repetitive, like I say, I'm going through and marking through stuff as I go. And I, I did take a lot of notes, but I hope everyone um, understands the importance of some of the, the definitions that we've used tonight regarding land use and planning tools that we utilize as it pertains to our ordinances and zoning and our comp plan to name a few of these. There are guidelines in place to help us determine how the county is planned for based on all of the above. It's not just a roll of the dice. And as a reminder, our comp plan process is public, has public engagement and participation. Then after the process is complete, we look at the zoning and ordinances and we're, we try to bring all those layers into compliance with the comp plan to achieve our long-term goals that the public's asked for. And these are long, a lot of, you know, what we do with our comp plan, it's a long range um, plan. So just as a reminder, this, again, as some of you have uh, reiterated, the, the Hazelwood property is inside of the PSA, and that is our line of demarcation to, to look at growth and, de and development. Um, so first and foremost, it's been zoned B1 for 50 years, and it's not designated as rural. It's in fact undeveloped business property inside the PSA. 
Um, it's going to be developed. I've been assured that it's going to be developed by right or with the master plan. It's no longer going to be farmed and the family is ready to retire and move on with their father's desire for a well-planned commerce area. And the, the question becomes for us, you know, what's it going to look like? And um, again, you know, as staff is covered, we're looking at rural lands outside of the PSA to uh, revitalize some of the tools that we have and utilize the ones that we have in place because we know rural lands are important to citizens, they're important to us too. But we've got to realize that this property is technically not rural. Um, they do have the right, and I appreciate the citizens pointing out that the Hazelwoods have the right to develop their own property uh, based on the, the zoning provided. And by right, right now, they can with very minimal requirements. And I've, again, I'm sure they have made, they can utilize zoning for storehouse storage facilities and warehouses and mini storage. We can have a car lot right there on the, on the corner, auto repair, building supplies, lumber yards, microbreweries. That's only to name a few. And that by right, that comes with zero traffic controls or architectural reviews or landscaping or buffering and it's very minimal setbacks. Um, and it, it would increase the ag it would increase the access points off of all stage road onto their property and they would have access from leisure road and then Barnes road access would not be cut off. If this is, if this is rezoned, that access to Barnes road and leisure road is removed. Um, they, the, the Hazelwoods have given up some of their property rights in this application and are being neighborly by having removed the apartments and the truck terminal. And I think a lot of the rumor mill got started that there was gonna be a truck stop there. And I've been assured that there was never gonna be a truck stop as was reported apparently on social media. Um, if this privately funded plan is approved with SUPs, there will be a master plan to include water and sewer with water conservation. You don't get water conservation with wells and septic. Um, You'll have the traffic management and all the other improvements in the lighting requirements that they talked about earlier. Um, I'm looking through my scratch through notes here. Um, we have a great deal of concern about residential being built. We've heard for years, it's in the comp plan. People want to see residential growth slow down. And this accommodates that. It takes all of the residential piece out of it. And by doing so, it also takes some of the burden off of potential um, school requirements that we would have. Um, it, this master plan is going to reduce our reliance on residential taxes. It will diversify our economy. And I, I believe these SUP um, um, manufacturing and light industrial areas, that's where you're gonna get your higher paying jobs. I mean, I had a, I ha I've had several people comment to me, just one the other day who said, I don't understand what the problem is with this because for years I've been, this is what this lady told me, I've been, I've been wanting higher payer jobs here in my area and I don't wanna have to re rely on fast food and retail for work. I want decent jobs. So I think, I, I think those SUP areas would help provide some of that. Um, and again, Mr. Polster brought up the foreign trade zones. It's a huge incentive for certain businesses to locate in these foreign trade zones. And even by right development can take advantage of the tax structure and making the property even by right very appealing and marketable. There, it's gonna be developed. So um, it, regarding the SUPs have been some suggestions by some that the Hazelwoods do the, they, they would do the bare minimum to achieve the SUP timeline restriction. But I, I, I can tell you that I firmly believe that these property owners would not have invested the enormous amount of private money and time, their own money and time to create a master plan it, uh, for a well-planned corridor in a commerce area only to not follow through and let it lapse. That just makes zero sense to me. Um, I'm not sure there'd be any issues with these SUPs. They're subject to strict guidelines and proffers and they're, they're, they're enormously restrictive. We may not know if 
For example, if it's a Wendy's or a Chick-fil-A coming in, that's not our job is to determine that. We just, we vote on that use. We vote on whether that use is permitted right there. Um, and then again, by right, again, you have none of the, um, the controls in place with landscaping. That's one of my biggest concerns. I've heard people say, I don't want this to look like Route 17 in, in York County, but um, these, this master plan, I think from what I have studied would help prevent it from looking like Route 17 with metal buildings and metal roofs lined up against the corridor there. There's no more controls substantively that we could get in the future than we have right now with the master plan, the design guidelines, the proper proffers and the SUP conditions. And um, as, as I think somebody mentioned tonight, but I, I've heard it from our board before, we are always approving a land use, not a brand. You know, when chain, when P and the argument of that people might, they might have to come back to us. They might have to come back for more approvals if they want to change something. I don't think that that's a negative. I quite frankly find that um, very appealing that if somebody wants to change something, that's what we're here for, to hear what they have to say, to look at the changes, and then we could make adjustments accordingly. We can support it or not. But I find coming back to us is a um, gives us more control and more restrictions. Um, in order for us to have, as uh, I think Mr. Polster brought up, uh, the maximum opportunity for economic development for the through the Virginia oh, I'm getting tongue tied Virginia Economic Development Partnership, they rank the sites for development, and it's of the utmost important importance. If we're going to have our higher paying jobs, the SUPs need to be in place for these opportunities to be shovel ready. If they're not in place, we get overlooked. And then we end up with other things. Um, there's greater uncertainty and less protection for the county with buy right development right now than with the restrictive SUPs in place. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to skip over. Oh, in listening to the, the, <clears throat> the Zoom presentation the other week, some of the citizens, that was very helpful and I appreciate them sharing their thoughts and concerns. It was stated that their mission was not to prevent all development, but work for responsible development. And I think this master plan does just that. It takes that all those access points off, um, those those side roads, and brings us into um, into compliance with our comprehensive plan. We're getting we would get rid of the use of community wells, and um, and let's see. All right, let's see. I'm going through my list. And again, there was never going to be a truck stop. Uh, and I would hope in the future, I would just hope, and to Mr. Hipple's point, you know, there's a well-organized um, group that want to protect the rural lands. I just hope that people will use social media, if they're going to do it, to use it with accurate information, because there was apparently a lot of inaccurate information that was posted. And I, I just hope Folks will do their due diligence in researching and reporting it accurately because that only causes angst and confusion within the community. That's that's not um, it's it's just not necessarily necessary. And unfortunately, I think maybe some people's opinions were formed based on some of this inaccurate information. And I I, I find that disturbing. I mean, I don't make decisions based off of social media posts, um, quite frankly. I utilize our comp plan, our staff reports, minutes from previous meetings, planning commission reports and discussions, ordinances, zoning information, economic development tools, preservation tools. And while I understand some folks aren't gonna be happy, that aren't happy with this application, I would hope that their opinion is based on facts and not on social media. Um, in my effort to be as accurate as I could about this, this process, I went back many years and I started digging through the, the plans and the things that we have, that, that have brought us to the point where we are now. And it was, as somebody stated, it was 1972 that the majority of this property was placed into B1 zoning. 
And for reference, I was still in high school then, if that gives you any indication of what we're looking at here. In the mid-1980s, Mary, Mary Oaks was developed. That was farmland. In the 1990s, Meadow Lake was developed. It was also farmland. Then you jump to the 2009 comp plan process, which involves citizens and staff and planning commission before, it, that, before that happens before it comes to us. So it was at the 2008 work session prior to that, that the board discussion began regarding the boundary line for the Hazelwoods property as it pertains to the PSA, which is one of the tools that we use. Part of it was moved back then. And some, so some of the changes started to take place. Then a discussion began on economic opportunity zones. And at that meeting, staff stated that the benefit of EO zones strengthened the fact that the property becomes instantly recognizable there was heightened awareness of the opportunity, fine-tuned the elements of industrial and mixed use. It attuned it to the objectives of the EDA and Office of Economic Development, <clears throat> which, why, which by the way, um, those were some of the items that hopefully I read correctly this evening. So then more discussion followed at that following regular meeting and it was noted um, regarding the comp plan that there were extraordinary strides, some reading minutes, uh, made to address citizen concerns regarding growth management. There was extensive citizen involvement. The comment was made that the addition of the EO zone was a result of citizens' requests for economic vitality and diversification. Another board member stated <clears throat> that the current growth rate at the time was not sustainable. He commented that the EO zone should be applied to land only inside the PSA. This application accomplishes both. It takes the residential out and it's all inside the PSA. Another member stated he understood the rate of residential growth was too high as the citizens had stated, but that it was important to think how the county would sustain itself economically. Again, this plan helps accomplish both. The former representative of the Stonehouse District at the time, again, this is in 09, stated that the EO zone was an option for the future, noting the difficulties and the viability of farming. And then the 2009 comp plan passed. Now, this was long before Ms. Larson. Ms. Ms. Sadler, I, I, I hate to-, to um... I, I, I've got just a couple more things that okay. I need to say. This, okay. is my, this is my district, sir, and I wanted everyone to realize that I'm being as thorough as I can with my decision. So thank you. And then with the EO zone, the comp plan, the next step was the ordinance you know, in uh, 11, that passed. And, um, and then we fast forward to 2015. And then one of the public, public commentators was Mr. Larry Hazelwood. He thanked the planning commission for assistance on the Hazelwood farm, noted his father's vision for the farm and his pride in the county. He expressed concern about the future of the county, stressed tax revenue generated as people were shifting from farming to development. Then the Stonehouse rep at the time, in 15, commented regarding the Hazelwood property and the comp plan. Again, the public process. He stated the EO was a logical choice for the piece of property. It enhanced what's across the street at Stonehouse, gave Mr. Seymour, economic development guy at the time, extra land we were looking for and the EDA had spoken about for years. He stated it was a centralized location and certainly made sense with access to the interstate with four lane divided roads, airports, the ports, and it gives us what we're looking for, gives us an opportunity here. He stated he was supportive of the project and that the PSA expansion was safe to move ahead as with an industrial piece of property. Then the vote was taken for the northern part, which is in front of Stonehouse right now, and uh, as approved by the Planning Commission, it passed unanimously. Then the motion was made by the previous representative of, of my district to move the southern piece, which is what we're talking about tonight, into the EO designation as approved by the Planning Commission. It passed unanimously for the entire piece of property. Then another motion um, for the EO zone requirement to be, um, because it's, it has to be in the PSA, the motion was made for the PSA to be expanded, that passed. So it was placed in the uh, comp plan back in 15 uh, with the, the EO and the PSA movement. It, that comp plan passed unanimously. I think this family has done this the correct way through many years of county process in public, through many publicly affirming votes, which enabled them to proceed. 
And then this past year, we com uh, completed our comp plan process, which again is public, with public participation. It passed by the board unanimously with the land use designation of EO and the PSA in place for this property. So um, even with the, and with the vote in 21 in October, I think it's significant for us to remember that both applications were on file at the time, had received their public hearings before the Planning Commission prior to our vote on the recent comp plan. So if there were any issues, I think someone on the board mentioned that this evening, we should have brought that up then. So, uh, and, and to um, just to, as a FYI, I did um, clarify, to, I spoke with Mr. Crop the other night on the planning commission, I called him. I wanted to know his perception of the community meetings that they held. And he, he did want me to, he said, I could share this, that the, uh, Mr. Tran and the Hazelwoods did a great job with their presentation. They answered questions and they shared what the plan was gonna be. And I know that they held the community meetings and, um, Due to COVID, I think they had to restrict how many people were in there. Um, but again, I think um, the less legislative obstacles and steps required with the SUPs provides predictability and more shovel ready um, for, the, to be, for the site to be more shovel ready, the greater ability for James City County to compete with other localities. And so um, again, there's some citizen comments I've heard from a lot of people on both sides, but in terms of representing our citizens, I'd like to finish up by saying that um, I would hope and pray that people understand that our job in representing them is to vet and read and analyze all aspects of an application, all the while balancing the public's input and the public's perception based on the info that they have as to what an application entails. I have spent months on this, um, this application. I do, again, I do not take it uh, lightly. And just as a personal note to, to finish up, um, and on a much smaller scale, but it, it is personal. When, I brought, when we bought our lot in Stonehouse to build our house 20 years ago, I knew based on researching the surrounding area that it was zoned for business and that someday change would probably occur and it would look different. And I also bought, on a personal note, the middle of three wooded lots and I've enjoyed woods on both sides until now. Someone just bought the lot next door and it's currently, somebody's currently building their home. We'll soon have a nice couple living next door and we welcome them. But in, in reference to compare, I, I didn't when they started cutting down the trees, I didn't call my HOA and complain that the property owner who has the right to build there is changing my view and changing the look of the neighborhood. They have the right to build their home there based on our HOA guidelines and our master plan development because that's what it's zoned and designated for. And I know change can be difficult at times, but I feel confident that the Hazelwood family who has owned this property for decades, probably long before most of us were even here and paying all of the taxes and all of the insurance on it for as long as they pop possibly could have gone through the, the public process and they have the community's best interest at heart. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sadler. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief uh, tonight. Um, uh, I think that, uh, no, yeah. Um, I, I first just want to thank um, everybody involved. I, I will say that I, I met with the, uh, the Hazelwoods team uh, and appreciated uh, their sharing information. Uh, you know, I know in this instance we're uh, in different positions, but that's. Uh, uh, but it was certainly um, uh, much appreciated uh, that they solicited my um, input and and uh, an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, I very much appreciated the opportunity to speak with uh, some of those uh, who um, were concerned about the proposal uh, in a Zoom meeting uh, and appreciated uh, hearing more about that perspective. I will say that I um, saw an enormous amount of material and I apologize to those who I haven't been able to respond to by uh, um, to acknowledge their emails. Uh, uh, there have been so many of them uh, and uh, uh, I've um, been sort of distracted by some other things as well, but I, I really do appreciate uh, the, the many and varied opinions that were expressed to me, concerns of one kind or another, uh, letters of support uh, for the proposal and so forth. 
Um, you know, and and as far as folks tonight, uh, thank you for your for your um, very uh, considerate uh, uh, behavior and and uh, uh, reasoned uh, discussions. Uh, like s several of the people who spoke, I would love for this property to remain in agriculture. I, my heart kind of jumped up a little bit when Mr. Trant suggested that the A1 property might continue to be a forest and and uh, uh, would uh, go under their uh, timbering plan uh, once again. Um, but uh, I know that this property is going to be developed. And, and uh, uh, while I agree with Rich Kropp from the Planning Commission who wished that uh, the proposal had uh, uh, done more to actively seek out uh, ways to reflect the work of the Rural Economic uh, Study Committee, um, uh, if the owners weren't really interested in that and if they couldn't find something that, w that made sense there, uh, then that wasn't going to go ahead. And I recognize that uh, uh, um, the landowners have to be uh, involved and interested in doing something like that, and it's it's just not uh, uh, where their where their minds are on on this particular matter. Um, uh, as far as the comp plan is concerned, I voted for this comp plan. I didn't vote for the last one, and part of the reason I didn't because it was because I didn't like some of the things that were being um, rezoned. Uh, but in this case, and like in all of them, you know, I, I bet every single one of us on the board, all of whom voted for the comp plan. Uh, had something in that comp plan that they didn't like. Uh, but the balance overall was such that uh, uh, it was better to support an improved comp plan over what we had previously. Uh, that certainly was the case in my instance. And I'm not saying that, that I don't think that this is a piece of uh, property that, uh, that will be developed or that I would support uh, in, in terms of development. Uh, my concern has always been that while I think the staff has done a masterful job in putting together protections, given the fact that they have uh, um, a proposal which is uh, essentially uh, removing the opportunities for subsequent uh, evaluation in the legislative process by uh, uh, considering SUPs and the like, uh, that they have done their very, very best to impose uh, conditions or uh, extract uh, concessions that uh, I think have improved the, the, uh, this project. Um, but the bottom line for me is that this is still a black box. Um, my concern has, has been, as it was with their earlier proposal for the um, uh, market, uh, the village center, uh, was, is basically that uh, this legislative process is where you get to express your opinions. This is the opportunity for citizens to weigh in on what they think is happening around them. And while property owners absolutely have the right to do what they uh, wish with their property within the bounds of our laws and ordinances and, and uh, plans, uh, uh, it is also important to remember that they do not have the right uh, to develop property in ways that have terrible adverse impacts on citizens. And if citizens feel that there's going to be an adverse impact, they have every right to expect the opportunity to comment and to try to influence that decision. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, I've been sitting here for a number of hours now, uh, and uh, like, uh, like you, I've been uh, seeing this uh, agenda in front of me. And I'm looking at four public hearings. And in the first public hearing, we saw two pieces of property that were covered by a, uh, a master plan uh, that uh, came to us tonight because for, those, uh, for, for the uh, treatment of those two pieces of property, they had to come back to get a proffer amendment in order to not have to do uh, um, an annual uh, payment to, to uh, uh, ensure that uh, they're going to get their traffic study done uh, if they ever do decide to develop the other parcel. Uh, the second uh, public hearing was uh, for a convenience store on one parcel of land where an important commercial uh, enterprise was going to be placed. But it's one convenience store of, you know, 7,000, 10,000 square feet. Uh, uh, it is not 328 acres. The third public hearing was for one parcel of land to be divided into two so that a, a mother could give land to her son to build a home uh, where the average of the two pieces of property still were over three acres uh, in, a, in a rural area. And so, uh, you know, and then the fourth is the Hazelwood Farms. And, when, and as I look at them, I just think, you know, in each of these other cases, we're saying to people, you've got to come in and get that legislative approval. And that's what I would want with this pro project. Not to say, no, you can't do it. 
Not to say I don't uh, ever want to see development happen here. I recognize it's going to happen. I think everybody on this board recognizes it's going to happen. But what I want to see is the opportunity for us to see how that proposal is playing out, whether it is in fact a net positive or negative, whether there are adjustments that need to be made, and where there are uh, situations where we haven't had a clear picture in, in advance, we know what the what this story is today. So uh, I'm not going to favor this proposal. It doesn't mean I wouldn't have supported a proposal, which is what the comp plan suggested we would do. It means that I don't support this notion of short-circuiting the opportunity for citizens to have input. And so that's uh, uh, my statement tonight. Thank you. Uh, we have a, we have a, um, a motion on the floor uh, for Mr. Hiffel to approve uh, the two items. Mr. Kinsman, would you just say, uh, weigh in on the question of whether we should do these separately or, or together? Uh, they can be done in one vote as long as it's clear that the one vote is both to approve the ordinance and the resolution. Okay, thank you. That's what I asked. Okay. Uh, Mr. S Stevens, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? A. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? No. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, and let's take a brief uh, break uh, just to let folks, uh, I think people are probably anxious to get home. They've got a little ride in front of them.
and uh, we now um, will have a, a closed session. If, uh, if you get motion to go, actually, we have uh, what? request and directives oh, and report of the county administrator before I'm closed session. I, I'm, I was looking. I'm up willing on, to skip it. I was looking on this one here, and uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's go to the um, board request and directives. Um, I'll make it quick. I had uh, January 19th, I spoke to the Kiwanis group about what's going on in James City County, interesting group uh, at breakfast. Um, and then uh, in January 27th, February 2nd and 3rd, uh, I went with uh, Mr. Reinheimer and we went to uh, listen to proposals to the Williamsburg Health Foundation about requests for information for integrated health care. Um, and so we will be getting more information on what they decide afterwards, but it was a very interesting pro process. And I will just briefly mention that uh, March 29th, Vietnam Veterans Day, we will be having a ceremony uh, at Veterans Park. Uh, the uh, Parks and Rec is helping us put it on. Uh, we got help from the Department of uh, Veterans Services as well as local chapter of the Vietnam Veterans. So we'll be putting more information out to the public uh, about uh, attending that. So that's all I got. Thank you. All right, I just have one thing. I attended Tommy Hitchens' funeral today and um, very well attended and very, very good funeral. And I gave the family condolences from this board and let them know that we're going to miss Tommy a lot. And, you know, we loved his input on, you know, all the things that he had to do with James City County. So that's all I have, sir. Thank you very much. Uh I'll make it very brief. Uh, last Thursday, I attended the Baco Legislative um, meeting, uh, and Sep, I, uh, our chair was there, and Mr. Stevens, and um, Mr. Kinsman, and they made uh, visits to our legislators that I did not get to go to because I had a VACO board meeting. And then um, the next day, Mr. Stevens and I presented at the VACO chair. Um, it's uh, part of that program. And then just urge my fellow board members to please, um, when if you get a VACO capital alert, there's a lot going on right now. Um, anytime there's a new administration, there's a lot going on and there's changes that can happen. Um, and as we know, the, um, the new governor um, had made a campaign uh, promise about his uh, grocery tax and wanting to cut the grocery tax. Um, but I do urge um, citizens to, um, to look into what that means for your localities um, because we get a great deal of funding through the grocery tax for education and for roads. And so um, currently VACO, which is the Virginia Association of Counties, is asking the General Assembly to please hold harmless localities um, from a grocery tax elimination um, because the bottom line is that we will have to get that revenue from somewhere if we lose that revenue. So you may not pay it at the grocery store, um, but you, you will have to pay it at your count. I mean, we just won't, we won't make it without it. Um, so anyway, and I just would urge you to to respond and um, I would urge the, the if there's anyone left viewing um, I would urge them to um, just to just to look a little look into it and I understand that Baco uh, has taken the position that they, they, they've not, not taken a position on uh, the elimination of the grocery tax nope. but have taken a position that the remaining amount of sales tax uh, should then be adjusted so that the state share d uh, drops down and the, s the uh, locality and school uh, shares go up uh, proportionally in order to uh, keep the uh, amounts uh, uh, yep. equivalent. And the, and the state, state's doing okay right now, so uh -huh. hopefully they'll pay some bills that they, they have due <laughs> right. to the localities, as a right. matter of fact. Right, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, let me just quickly, uh, yeah, and as Ms. Uh, Ms. Larson indicate, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Sadler, do you have anything? I just wanted to offer my condolences to um, the Hitchens family. Tommy was a valued member of our AFD committee, and he will be greatly missed. So our condolences to them. Thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll join in, in that uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens was a, a very passionate about uh, land preservation and, and trying to preserve uh, 
the rural atmosphere in the county, and, and I know he was very active in promoting those ideas, and uh, his advocacy will be missed. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we lost another um, citizen, uh, Lee Williams, uh, yes. uh, yeah. who has uh, had a long and distinguished career. Uh, he was for many years a lobbyist for the Virginia Gasoline Retailers Association uh, in Richmond, but he also uh, locally was a very uh, talented and sought after <laughs> auctioneer yeah. uh, for charitable organizations, especially CDR and, and others, uh, who he helped tremendously uh, by uh, getting people embarrassed enough to make bids on yeah. almost everything <laughs> you could imagine. Uh, Lee was a tremendous uh, uh, personality and uh, he'll certainly be missed as well. Uh, at the, the um, local government day in, in Richmond, uh, also had a meeting of the Coalition of High Growth Communities, which uh, uh, is uh, working to uh, figure out ways to um, uh, determine uh, innovative uh, approaches to affordable housing uh, and to share ideas that are going on in the various localities uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, and with that, I will ask uh, Mr. Stevens, do you have uh, a report? No report this evening, sir. No report, okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to go ahead and ask that we go into closed session for consideration of personnel matter, the appointments of individuals to county boards and or commissions pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia for appointment of Chesapeake Bay Board and Wetlands Board, appointment of Colonial Behavior Health Board, and the appointment of Planning Commission. Okay, motion uh, is made. Uh, Ms. Stevens, you call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Well, motion carries.
I can't see you. Chair, I certify that we only spoke. Bit, oh, close, sorry. Close back in a motion to look for a, a motion to uh, certify uh, that we were in uh, our closed session. I, I, yes, and I certify that we only spoke about those matters that we said that we would. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, you call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Carries. Okay. I'd like to bring forward uh, appointments for the Colonial Behavioral Health Board. Uh, Ms. Joanna Ripley and Ms. Danielle Wells. Okay, we have a motion to uh, approve uh, two members of the uh, Colonial Behavioral Health Board. Ms. Yes, sir. Ms. Ripley is through uh, June 30th, 2022, oh, sorry. and Ms. Wells is through 6 30, 2024. What he said. That'll be part of the motion. Okay, uh, would you please call the roll? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Oh, she carries. I would like to bring forward um, the name of uh, Stephen Rogers to fill the Berkeley District Planning Commission appointment. That would be effective immediately and expiring on January 31st, 2025. Mr. Uh, Mr. Scott, would you uh, call the roll, please? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlynn? Aye. Okay. Uh, any other business come before us? Motion for adjournment Motion until 1 p.m. on February 22nd, 2022 for a business meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hipple. Yes, sir. Stevens, call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Motion. Meeting adjourned. Stretch it another 10 minutes to make it six hours even. <laughs>